Well, welcome back. I'm Lindsay Pogue, author of The Darkest Winter. You are about to listen to part two of Elle and Jackson's adventure. Now, if you have not listened to part one yet, I implore you, there's a link below in the description. Make sure you go back and you start with part one. It is a long audiobook, so it has been broken into two parts. Okay? Don't forget to like and subscribe. And without further ado, enjoy the rest of the show. 36. L. April 12th. The scent of balsam and earth filled my nostrils. My head was pounding like a kick drum in a heavy metal band, and my limbs felt too heavy to move. I remembered the caribou, and my eyes flew open as I gasped. Shh, shh, a man hummed beside me. The world was a blur that made little sense, but I wasn't in an aluminum grave like I'd expected. No more cold air, no more kink in my neck. I was in a bed in a warm room. I blinked again, my heartbeat drumming as a male form stood up from his perch beside me. My breath caught in my throat as an all-too-familiar silhouette came to stand beside me. I tried to shout. Ooh! My throat burned, and I nearly choked. Who are you? Shh. The man pressed lightly against my shoulders, easing me back down. Your body needs rest, he said a little gruffly. I shook my head, regretting it instantly, and my hand flew to my temple. A shooting pain ricocheted through my chest, and I cringed. Ow. Easy, he said. You need to take it easy. His dialect was one I'd heard before, a mix of soft and hard consonants, like the old fisherman who always sat on the dock, smiling at me as I disembarked the cruise ship back home. I blinked up at him, watching his fuzzy form take shape. You probably have a concussion. He had dark, wrinkly skin, a pinched mouth, and shaggy gray hair around his ears. Bo, Thea. They're all right, miss. Another man with a fur cap startled me as he moved in the doorway behind him. My wife is making them burbot stew next door. Next door? I blinked at him, trying to piece together the forgotten moments. You were standing outside the window, I tried to remember. I was hanging upside down in the driver's seat, and he came to get me out. Where's Sophie? Everyone is fine. A little banged up, but it looks like you got the worst of it. Even the soft firelight seemed too bright, and I closed my eyes, willing the throbbing to go away. There was a herd of caribou in the road. I know, miss, he said as he stepped further inside. One of them didn't make it, but the others took off. I'm headed out to track them now. Track them? Why? I peeled my eyes open again and noticed he had a rifle in his hand. There's no sense in letting good meat go to waste. Caribou. After everything else, I hit a fucking caribou? We'd almost died. Again. Unbidden, tears burned the back of my eyes. The kids, I said. I need to see them. Of course, the hunter said, and the floorboards protested as he turned to leave. I'll send them in. There was a gentleness in his voice that made the tears form faster. Who are you people? I asked with a tremulous breath. I stared between the old man and the hunter at the door. I'm Dell, the hunter said. This man here is my father-in-law, Took. We heard the accident as we were packing up to go out ice fishing. We brought you back to our place on Mintasta Lake, just outside the village. They were at the Baskin, natives to the land and subsistence homesteaders, which accounted for the moon totem around the old man's neck. They could have heard us if they'd wanted. Instead, I was in a warm bed with a fire burning in the stove and incense in the air. Thank you, I heard myself say, though my voice seemed far away. I wiped the moisture from my eyes 
registering how strange my hands felt. Then horror shot through me. I stared at my naked fingers. Where are my gloves? I croaked. I need my gloves. Miss. I gripped the blankets between my fingers, ignoring the ache in my wrist. Where are they? I grimaced as a sharp pain shot through me. I would get up if I had to, and the old man knew it. His eyes widened, and he leaned over to a small table against the wall and handed them to me. I pulled them over my fingers. You don't understand, I said in a rush. You don't understand. I ignored the pain in my side and my chest, in every tiny movement. Please, I pleaded, barely able to keep myself together. What if they weren't kind? What if this was all a ploy I couldn't make sense of in my fuzzy state? What if the kids weren't really okay? I need to see Sophie. It was the only way I could be sure she and the kids were safe, that these people were trustworthy, before I lost the last shred of control I had left to hysteria. I'll get her, Del said, more apprehensive than kind this time. With a final exhale, he disappeared out the door. Can I continue then? What? I looked at Took. I need you to look at me, he said, grumpier than before. I did as he asked and followed a barrage of requests. Look to the left and to the right. Let me know if you feel nauseous or dizzy. Take a deep breath. And when I winced, Took nodded and leaned back in his rickety old rocking chair. It's as I suspected. What is? You have a bruised rib. Or maybe it's cracked, and a strained arm, too, by the look of it. I don't think it's broken, though. And you likely have a concussion. I didn't argue with him. My chest, my arm, my face and head. They all ached. May I touch you? He asked. There was a sass in his voice I appreciated. Even if he was irritated, he was at least being rational. I need to wrap your wrist before you make it worse. He practically glared at me, and I felt my cheeks redden. I peered down at the quilt clenched in my hands and let go. I nodded. Now, he said evenly, can I fold your glove down so I can finish with your wrist? He was beyond exasperated with me. Uh, yeah, sure. With rough but steady fingers, he folded the hem of the glove down and rubbed a salve around my wrist. It was mentholated and cool against my skin and smelled of dirt. What is that? I asked. Birch sap, to help with the swelling, he said, wrapping a bandage around it. I peered around the small cabin, the size of my room back in Slana. There was only a single window covered with a gray and black fur. Light from the wood-burning stove flickered against the walls, and a candle burned in an old coffee tin on the table beside the bed. I wanted to believe these were good, honest people who wanted to help me, but a whisper in the back of my mind kept saying, what if? Took sat back in his chair, putting the lid on the salve. I flashed him a sheepish, tentative smile. Thank you. He nodded, but watched me with shrewd gray eyes. He was as leery of me as I was of him. I probably seemed psychotic after my outburst with the gloves. It was for his own good, though. Can you tell me how long I was asleep? My head was too muddled to tell. A couple hours. He poured me a copper cup of water and set it on the side table. You should rest. He got up and stretched his back, clutching the salve in his hand, then went to the door and stepped out. Daylight filtered inside, cold air came with it, and I welcomed the reprieve. Then Took closed the door, shutting me inside again. Leaning back against the feather-stuffed pillow, I took a deep breath and peered around the small wood cabin, devoid of any frivolities. The only thing that hung on the wall was a realistic sketch of an owl. A walking stick was propped up next to a patchwork leather jacket hanging on a hook by the door 
and snow boots were discarded beneath it. The only other furniture was the small table, which had the candle and the cup of water. The table could fit no more than a book, and a trunk sat at the foot of the bed, resting on a pine wood frame. A quilt and blankets of fur were draped over me. As carefully as I could, I peeled one of them off with a shaky arm. The cabin was well insulated, I'd give them that. And the longer I laid there, listening to the roar of the fire, the heavier my eyelids became. I pressed my fingers to my side and then to my chest, wincing as I tried to figure out where it hurt the most. My chest and my side, my head. Everywhere, I decided. The door creaked, slowly at first, and my eyes flew open. Sophie poked her head in, and when she saw me, she smiled and opened the door wider for Thea and Bo to come in. I exhaled every ounce of tension in my body at the sight of their smiling faces. You're awake, Thea chirped, and she skipped over. She had a butterfly bandage on her left cheek. You, I winced, moving too quickly to sit up in bed. Sophie reached for Thea's arm before she got too close. Del said to be careful, she reminded her. Regretfully, Thea stopped short of jumping up on the bed. Oh, I'm okay, just a little tired, I told them, overjoyed. The scratches and bumps on their faces could have been so much worse. I absorbed the side of Bo and Thea, both in one piece, then looked at Sophie. Each of their expressions were soft with affection, not fear, and my eyes filled with tears. I covered my face and shook my head. How was it possible that things had gone from bad to worse in a matter of hours? I can't believe that happened, I said, voice trembling. It's okay, Sophie said, sitting on the edge of the bed. We're okay. The car screwed, Bo added, and I huffed a quick laugh. Thea glared at him. That's a bad word. Bo rolled his eyes. Whatever. If they were bickering, they really were okay, and I nestled a little deeper into the bed. Jade is really nice, Thea said. She's making lunch, and we can stay here as long as we want. I glanced at Sophie. Are you certain? She tilted her head and tucked her hair behind her ear. Yes, I'm certain. They're all very nice. Took is funny. He is just like my grandpa. Thea said. He makes funny duck noises. Bo rolled his eyes. He doesn't look like Grandpa. Grandpa is an Inuit. Yeah, huh? No, he's not. You're such a liar. Okay, you guys, Sophie interrupted, and she shooed them away from the bed. Let's let Elle get some rest, okay? I can't rest, I said, wincing as I flung the rest of the covers back. We need to figure out how we'll get back on the road. Jackson and Alex. Elle, please, we'll figure it out, but you can't fix this right now. You look like you're going to pass out. My pain tolerance was high, but between my head and the fact it hurt to breathe, I knew she was probably right. Alex and Jackson won't be heading back until tomorrow anyway. They won't know anything that's happened. You have time to rest. Each breath was a sharp twinge, and I knew the pain meant one thing. I was useless for now, and I had to trust Sophie's judgment. Okay, I said. I'll try. Sophie stood up to leave. L, Bo said, excited. They have a real bow and arrow. Dell said he might teach me to use it if you say it's okay. Guys, come on, Sophie ordered. We'll deal with that later. Elle needs to sleep. We'll bring her some soup when it's ready. That would be great. Thank you. I had no appetite, but I welcomed any excuse for them to come back and reassure me they were okay. The kids turned on their heels, the knitted ball at the top of Thea's beanie shaking with each step as they made their way to the door. Sophie turned back to look at me. We'll be back to check on you in a little while. 
I nodded, beyond grateful for her. Then, the three of them were out the door, clicking it shut behind them. I stared up at the birchwood ceiling as the light from the stove flickered across it. How long did a busted rib take to heal? With my luck, months. After I got some sleep, I would walk back to the Explorer and get the satellite phone. I would call Jackson, they would find us, and we'd figure it out together. With that comforting thought, my eyelids drooped lower, and I fell back to sleep. 37. Jackson. April 12th. The sun sank behind the mountains and the sky grew darker as we settled in for the final stretch back to Slana. The trip was successful with no run-ins to speak of. In the scheme of things, the hungry dog didn't count. We'd gotten what we needed and were out faster than I'd expected, which meant we'd return to Elle and the kids a day early. The trees passed outside the window, dark shadows in the inky sky. Jackson, Alex said. He'd been quiet for the past couple hours. Hmm. I glanced in the rearview mirror to find a stretch of snow and nothing more. Have you felt weird since you had the fever? I glanced at him. I'd felt a whole mess of things since the virus. Just about everything is weird these days. Alex stared out the passenger window, quieter than usual. What's on your mind, kid? He shrugged, though it was obvious it was weighing on him. I haven't said anything because I don't actually know what it is, but sometimes I wonder if something is wrong with me. It felt like we were heading into a discussion I was ill-equipped to handle, but I had little choice. With a quirked eyebrow, I looked over at him. What do you mean? Sometimes, when I'm around Sophie, I feel strange things. Wait, aren't you old enough to know about boys and girls and what? No, I mean, yes, I am. He shook his head. I'm not talking about sex. I silently thanked Mother Nature that puberty hit before 18. It's a charge. It's kind of indescribable, I guess. I've gotten it around L, too, a couple times. It's different around both of them, but the same, too. A charge? What, like static? I switched the headlights on as the road grew darker in the failing light. He shook his head. It's fucking weird. Like I said, it's not all the time, but it makes me feel powerful and full of energy. Like I need to do something with it. Like what? I don't know. He crossed his arms over his chest and leaned against the window. I sound crazy. Alex, I'm not sure what... I leaned forward looking out at a large, dark mass on the highway ahead. Alex braced the dash. What is that? It looks like a trailer and... Dread washed over me. That's the Explorer. I sped up only to damn near slam on the brakes as we came up to the overturned car in the trailer. What happened? Alex shouted, jumping out of the truck. I grabbed my rifle and jumped out after him, running to the busted windshield and the crunched metal. Icy fear shot through me, and I gripped my gun so tightly the foregrip creaked in my hands. A few boxes and bins scattered the ground. The snack box with Thea's smiley face sticker was dumped all over the road. I stepped over the trailer hitch and hurried to the driver's side. The door was open, and drag marks overlapped footprints in the snow. The Explorer was empty. Where are they? Alex ran his hand over his head and peered around the dark road and the surrounding forest. What the hell were they doing out here? My mind spun as I tried to understand. It was too early in spring to pull the trailer. Elle knew that, yet she'd packed everything and headed northwest. Alex stood a toppled gas can up. They had extra fuel. Do you think they were going to the meeting spot? Yes, but something happened. I peered around at the wreckage, and now they were gone, and there were traces of blood in the snow where I stood. Elle! I shouted, glancing into the tree line. She could have dragged herself into hiding or the kids. L, Jackson, Alex hissed from the front of the car. I shined my flashlight down at the caribou tracks. There were several, and there was blood. A lot of blood. The pieces began to fall together. It was what happened after the accident that worried me. 
I spotted snowmobile tracks a few yards out, barely illuminated by the Tacoma's headlights, and my gut twisted. She hadn't loaded the snowmobiles, and the tracks were fresh. Alex, we have to find them. I said low and calm. Get your gun. 38. L. April 12th. When I woke, it took a split second to remember where I was. But the instant I tried to move, it all came rushing back. The room was as it had been before. Only this time, my boots and snow coat were at the foot of the bed, along with my gun in my hip holster. I lifted myself from the bed with my good arm, though it felt just as banged up as the other. I grumbled to my feet, wincing and irritated that I'd gotten myself into this mess, but eventually I was sitting up, trying not to breathe too quickly and too deeply, knowing it would hurt. Standing, I reached into my back pocket, and I let out a breath of relief as I pulled out my sister's note. It was folded in half, but still there. The sound of silence will set you free. In the silence, there I'll be. Though I'd read it a dozen times, chills raked over my skin as I read the second sentence. In the silence, there I'll be. Though I knew it was impossible, it seemed as if Jenny had known the end was coming. That maybe, in some way, we'd find our way back to each other somehow. It was eerie to imagine her curled up on her couch riding it while death loomed in the future. It was a future in which the world was silent, and all I had left of her were these words, making her more present in my life dead than she ever was alive. I didn't have the bandwidth to think about it. Jenny's riddle would have to wait. Painstakingly, I pulled my boots on over my socks, forgoing the laces since my wrist was still tight. Though Took had been right and sleep had made my mind a bit clearer, my chest was killing me. I winced with each movement and prayed bark salve wasn't his only remedy. I knew subsistence living meant removal from society, forgoing the daily conveniences of modern day. But did that include absolutely everything? I clipped on my hip holster, saw a clean thermal shirt, but stayed in my dirty clothes, torn sleeve and all. The sooner I could be functional again, the better, but clean clothes seemed too ambitious just yet. Forgoing my jacket, since I didn't need it anyway, I eyed a large folded cloth on the side table that would come in handy if I remembered what Jackson had taught me. I had a sneaking suspicion my generous hosts didn't have painkillers readily available, and the pain could use a little numbing. I took the cloth and made my way to the door. Grateful my sprain and hurt rib were on the same side, so I was partially operational. Shockingly, the tingle in the tips of my fingers hadn't returned since Lana, but I told myself it didn't matter. I had plenty of problems to figure out without adding Sophie's superpower theory to the mix. The crisp evening air hit my face, sending chills over my skin as I stepped outside. It felt refreshing after being cooped up inside, and I welcomed it in my lungs. Using the porch rail, I lowered myself down to sit on the step as slowly as possible, careful not to make any sudden movements. I reached my good arm out and scooped up a handful of snow to wrap into an ice pack. The idea had been well thought out in my head, but I could feel the sweat beating on my brow as I tried to fare the smarting pain that followed. A dog yipped at the edge of the homestead, and I looked up to find I was being watched. A husky sat on the roof of his doghouse, his white and black splotched head tilted to the left. I'd like to see you try it, I muttered, pressing the cold pack against my side. I felt instant relief, though I wasn't sure how long the ice would keep against my skin. Letting the cold seep into my side, I peered up at the night sky. The moon was nearly full, lighting the path between the cabin I was in and the larger main cabin. Took and Dell had their own little compound here, an acre or so at least. What looked like an outhouse was set further into the trees, and a couple of weather-worn sheds created a semicircle around the perimeter. Pines and spruces sprinkled the property in between, 
and a truck was parked under an awning to my left. As I trudged my way to the bigger cabin, I passed piles of wood stacked against the sides of each building, protected by more awnings that looked like they could use a little maintenance, but served their purpose all the same. A narrow, aluminum-sided structure was nestled between the two outbuildings, and I could imagine the racks of meat hanging inside. In fact, I could smell them. There were no fences to speak of, but I assumed the dogs served as their security guard. I'd never met anyone who lived on the land the way these people clearly did, and as apprehensive as I was about it, it was comforting in a way, too. I stopped at the porch where, the Ranskins, was carved over the cabin door. Pots and pans clanged inside amidst the tittle-tattle of the kids. With a tummy full of butterflies, I lifted my hand, prepared to knock, but hesitated. Knocking seemed strange knowing the kids were inside. Slowly, I turned the handle and opened the wood door. Heat immediately pressed against my face, dense in the confines of the house, and the savory scent of food filled my nostrils. Mix it with potatoes. Everything is better with potatoes. They absorb so much flavor. An older woman, probably in her fifties, with white hair knotted at the back of her neck, stood beside Sophie. The kitchen was just a nook in the far corner of the cabin, barely large enough for two people, but Jade didn't seem to mind sharing. They stirred their respective pots at the two-burner wood stove, conversing easily with their backs to me. They looked like they belonged there together, grandmother and granddaughter. There were two shelves with plates, cups, and cooking utensils. Some of them looked metal, but they were mostly wood. Alex is the one that likes to cook the most, Sophie told her. I glanced up at the darkened loft above, then at the table where Bo and Took sat tying knots into a thin rope, then at Thea, curled up on what looked like a futon, small and functional for a mid-sized cabin, flipping through the pages of a sketchbook twice as large as her lap. A large, soft-looking fur draped the back of the sofa, part of it covering Thea's little legs. She noticed me first from her perch on the couch. You're awake! As everyone looked over, I closed the door behind me. L, Sophie said, and the older woman's eyes opened wide. Oh, dear me, I thought you were Del come back. She laughed nervously and hurried over, wiping her hands off on the corner of her dirty, cream-colored apron. L, dear, it's nice to officially meet you. The smile in her eyes was warm and welcoming, and I tried not to stare at the vertical lines tattooed from beneath her lip down to her chin. I'm Jade, and this is my father, Took. We've met, he grumbled. Don't mind him, Jade said, waving his gruffness away. He's harmless. I nodded, Sensory overload, making it difficult to focus while the noise and scents registered. It's nice to meet you. I smiled to be polite, but I couldn't help but wonder why they were being so kind. Either they hadn't come across any crazy people, or they simply didn't care, and both were equally curious. We're having dinner! Thea clapped the sketchbook shut and scooted it to the side. Dinner, huh? I tried to smile but my gaze got away from me, sweeping the rest of the room like I might find more answers. Books were stacked beside the couch, snowshoes and walking sticks mounted on the walls. Baskets hung from hooks on the ceiling, using every space so that the place was practically full. And then I realized five faces were appraising me. It's just about ready, Jade said. You must be starving. Why don't you grab yourself a seat at the table there? My dad will help you. Dad, get Elle a chair, would you? Just move that laundry to the loft for now. I'll worry about it later. Uh, thank you very much, but we really should be on our way. Nonsense, where will you go? It's dark, and Del told me about the car. She sighed regretfully. Besides, she said, wiping her brow with the back of her hand. You still need rest, and Sophie has made enough potato soup to feed an army. Jade smiled, winking at Sophie, 
like they'd known each other for years. I glanced around at the kids, settled and entertained like they were visiting their grandparents for the evening. You've already done so much. I don't want to overstay our welcome. After dinner... Oh, it's no trouble at all. The truth is, we don't get visitors, and my son moved into town a couple years back. He comes around only a few times a year, though Del sees him regularly during the spring. That's a long way of saying, I enjoy the company. She finished, her smile broad and reassuring. Oh, okay, I said dumbly. It was like I'd walked into the wilderness family, and I was only a viewer. L, come see the new knot I'm learning, Bo waved me over. Look! He held it up. This one's hard. It looks really hard. What's it called? It's a car. He looked at Took. Karik Bend. Karik Bend, Bo echoed, chest out and proud. It's a cargo net, sort of like the one you made. It's better than the one I made, I muttered. It will be really useful. You'll have to show me later. I don't know if I can but I'll try. Let's clean this up before Jade has a conniption, Took mumbled, gathering the thin rope into his hand. Bo frowned. A what? Took glanced from Jade, who was oblivious to his mutterings, then back to Bo. Nothing. So, Took was ornery, and not just with me. I liked it. Look! Thea grunted as she lifted the sketchbook, it teetered in her hands as she strained to hold it out to me. Wow, I breathed and noticed a large J at the bottom of the sketch. Jade did them, Thea explained. She stretched her legs out, barely able to rest her feet on a giant tree stump that served as the coffee table. No feet, I whispered with a frantic glance toward Jade. Thea looked sheepishly at Jade, who was busy unstacking bowls for Sophie and let her feet fall. Dinner's ready, Jade announced. Everyone grab a seat at the table. Sophie and I can take the couch. I claimed the chair took set out for me and anxiously waited for a steaming bowl of potato and leek soup. I could see the root ends discarded in a basket on the floor by the sink. I'd never had it before, but my mouth watered for it all the same. I hadn't realized how hungry I was. Did everyone wash their hands? Jade draped a rag over her shoulder. Yes, Bo, Thea, and Took said in unison. Oh, I said, glancing at my gloved fingers. I didn't. Jade waved my concern away and grabbed a ladle from the utensil bin. You didn't have a compost fight today, like some people. She waved the spoon at Took. What, he grumbled. It was for the kids. They had fun. Mm, sure. Despite her reprimand, she seemed happy to have all of us around, which made it feel like we were less of an inconvenience as I took some time to figure things out. Dad, Jade said, handing Sophie the ladle to finish dishing up the soup. She walked over to the window and peered out at the dark sky. Del should have been back by now. Will you see if he's out in the shed and bring him in for dinner? Don't let anyone take my seat, Took told Bo, and he slid out of his wooden chair with a grunt and reached for his jacket on an iron hook by the door. I won't. Cold air fanned through the room as Took opened and then shut the door. Jade sat a bowl of soup in front of me. My husband gets so caught up dressing the meat after hunting, he loses track of time. Always. He'd likely be out there all night, the best cut strong and hung up before morning. The caribou, I remembered. Dell had gone to salvage the meat. Did he find them then? I asked. One died, Sophie said, setting a stack of napkins to the table. He went for the others, though. She inched my bowl closer to me. Don't be scared, she said with a sly grin. Yeah, yeah, I didn't help with it, so it's edible. I knew the shtick. With feigned annoyance, I shook my head at her. You like to cook? Jade asked me, and I nearly laughed. I like to, but apparently I shouldn't, I told her. 
Jade's smile widened as she set another bowl on the table for Took. It only takes a little practice, she said. Shutting my eyes, I inhaled the scent of onion and pepper and every other good thing inside. It smells amazing. Sophie set a bowl in front of Bo, and he leaned closer to smell it. Is it fish again? It's potatoes and leeks, Sophie told him. And yes, there's fish, so hush. She nudged his shoulder with a warning glare and walked back over to the stove. Finally, after soup was served and water glasses were filled, Sophie sat down on the futon with her soup. It smells okay, Sophie said, clearly surprised and a little relieved. It's heavenly, I told her, swallowing my first bite. It left a garlicky singe on my tongue. Hot, but heavenly. It's dad's favorite, Jade said, and pulled her apron off over her head, though he'd never admit it. Jade walked over to the window, peering out at the darkness. What about you, Jade? I asked. Are you going to eat? Yes, but I'll wait for dad and Del to come in. She waved for me to eat. Go on, no sense in it getting cold. Though I felt bad eating without her, I was too ravenous to argue and took another bite. I could see why the kids were so at ease here. Jade made it easy to relax and feel welcome. So much so, I momentarily forgot the guys would be looking for us come tomorrow morning. As I sat there, examining every part of their modest home, I envied their little piece of wilderness. I knew it was endless work, but it was theirs. Jade rubbed her arms and pulled the drapes closed. I think it's time to replace the window. She smiled and finally sat down on the futon by Sophie. As much as we try to live on our own, I'm getting too old to be cold all the time. She smiled, a kindness exuding from her that made me feel like I'd known her longer than mere minutes. I swallowed another spoonful of soup and shut my eyes. Well, Bo, you're my greatest critic. Tell me, how do you like it? Jade asked, sidling up next to him. Her eyes widened at his half-empty bowl. It's good, I guess, he said. Jade rumpled his hair and chuckled. Good, then. Now Sophie can make it for you. If I can remember. Sophie glanced at me. Maybe I should have been writing this down. Jade waved her uncertainty away. I'll get you the recipe before you leave. Sarah, Jet's wife, that's my son. She caught on quick, though. You might not even need it. Last I heard, she'd even spruced it up, and it's one of Jet's favorite dinners. Where did you say they lived? I asked. Delta Junction. It's a few hours away. She sighed. I know it's not far, but when you don't get out much, it seems like the other side of the country. She sat on the couch and crossed her legs. He moved there probably five years ago now. He met Sarah in town, and they fell in love. She's a good girl, and they have a lot of things in common, but subsistence living isn't one. Her father's got a welding shop in Junction, so that's where they settled. She stared down at her fingers, turning the band around and around on her finger. She clearly missed her son, and like Jackson survived his wife and child, I couldn't imagine how hard it must have been for Jade to lose Jet. She cleared her throat. He doesn't get out here much to see us anymore. I swallowed another spoonful and licked my lips. So he survived then? Dell took Jade and their son? While it was beyond fortunate for her, it seemed startlingly unfair in the scheme of things when I thought about all four kids and the parents they'd lost. Jade's brow furrowed. I'm sorry? He survived the outbreak, I clarified. You said he doesn't get out here much anymore. But the lines in Jade's brow furrowed deeper, transforming her entire face from one of openness to desperate concern. I'm not sure I know what you're talking about. I looked at Sophie, who seemed as confused as I was. From the virus outbreak, Sophie said. I shook my head. We'd just assumed. Assumed what? Jade said. Her question teetered the sharp edge of panic. 
I told her about the men at the house, that we were attacked, Sophie said, frantic. Her eyes shimmered and her cheeks reddened. But I didn't bother to mention what they were capable of or how. And why would she have? It seemed impossible that Jade didn't know about the outbreak. I swallowed a thick, suddenly nauseating mouthful of soup, uncertain what to say next. Last December, I started as calmly as I could. The H1N1-12 virus that ravaged the lower 48 before it made its way here? People got very sick. Faintly, in a thought I pushed as far away as I possibly could, I began to worry Jade was crazy, and I'd made a dire mistake in letting us stay here. We've all lost our families, I told her, measuring her every move as her eyes searched our faces. Jade's uncertainty hardened, her gaze darting between the kids and me. Is this a cruel joke? She rasped, and there was no mistaking the distress in her voice. She wasn't crazy. She was clueless. My heart hammered with uncertainty, and I paled. We would never joke about this. I dropped my spoon into my bowl and faced her fully. We were all sick, I told her, hoping that something might register in the gray depths of her eyes. We all lost our families. We were strangers four months ago. Jade scooted to the edge of the futon, searching our faces for the truth. Bo and Thea, all of us, stared at her, just as perplexed as she was. You don't get visitors, I breathed. It was a realization I couldn't believe I hadn't thought about until now. Being holed up here all winter, they had no reason to go anywhere. Incredibly, they didn't know about the virus at all, and miraculously, they'd never been infected. With no television and no visitors, how could they have known? My mind ticked through the possibilities of what that meant exactly. How many others like them were there? What did that mean for their physiology? And how did that play into Sophie's theory? Most importantly, were we contagious to them? I nearly choked on the thought and the dread whitening Jade's face was enough to send everything I'd consumed back up again. There was a more delicate way to explain what had happened, but it was too late. Jade, I rasped, when was the last time you saw your son? Her brow lifted and her eyes widened. What? She stood up as the panic set in. Her chest rose and fell, and she clasped her hand around the base of her throat, like she was trying to hold back a scream. I could imagine the lump moving up her throat and the racing of her heart in her ears as she felt the weight of my words and thought of her son. It was how I'd felt when I thought I would die. It was how I'd felt when I thought my sister would die. It was how I'd felt many times since. She hurried to the door and reached for her jacket. Dell! she shouted, flinging it open. She stopped on the porch, unmoving. Jade! I lunged to my feet, pain biting through me, but it didn't matter. If I'd given her a heart attack, I could never forgive myself. Wincing, I hurried out the door after her. Jade, I'm so sorry! Dell stood in his coat with his rifle in one hand, pulling a sled loaded with frozen meat behind him, like he was only just coming home. Where the hell were you? Took complained as he came out of the shed across the yard, stomping his way across the snow. I thought maybe you'd snuck off for a cigar without me. An engine rumbled in the woods behind us, and I turned around to see the snowplow, jostling back and forth as the Tacoma rolled to a stop beside the cabin. I think I found your friends, Dell said, meeting my gaze. I should say they found me. 39. Jackson, April 12th. Dell had told us Ellen and the kids would be here, and while I strangely thought I could trust him, I needed to if we had any hope of finding them, I was reluctant. Crazy people went to great measures to get what they wanted. They'd proven that time after time. Somehow, I thought Dell was different, though, and the instant I saw the smoke from the cabin chimney, 
I instinctively knew he was. Alex jumped out of the truck before I'd brought it to a stop outside the settlement. I reached for the door handle as an older woman hurried, almost frantic from the porch, to Dell. When I noticed Elle standing just outside the doorway, it gave me pause. Dell had been telling the truth. She was alive like he had promised, looking at me. Her gaze was as expressive as always, wild and wide and shimmering. She chewed on her bottom lip, like she sometimes did when she was lost in her darkest thoughts and I hated myself for not being there to protect her and the kids. The scratch on her cheek was an angry, taunting gash. Her ponytail was crooked, and her long sleeve shirt was torn. But she was standing there, in one piece, practically glowing as the light spilled through the doorway behind her. Letting out a ragged breath, I scrubbed my hands over my face, braced myself for whatever came next, and flung the door open as the fear finally subsided. The instant I stepped out of the truck, Elle came closer and began to sob. Jackson, I almost killed them, she cried. I almost killed the kids. I'm so sorry. Shh, you guys are okay. I wrapped my arms around her, feeling her flinch. As I let go, she gazed into my eyes and searched my face for only a second before grabbing desperately onto my jacket, balling it up in her fist. And she cried. She was warm and solid. A fireball nestled against my chest, and a sense of calm came over me in a way I'd never felt before. The tension eased from my shoulders, and I rested my cheek against her head. I knew we had to get out of there, she said in a rush. I knew they would come back if we stayed, but the caribou, I didn't see the caribou. Her words choked away as she tried to catch her breath and like a bullet casing dislodged from its chamber, my calm spiked to a stomach-churning dread. I looked down at her. Who would come back? Elle blinked and swallowed. Then she pulled away. Her wet eyes were shadowed and tired. You didn't go to the house? Slana? Hesitant, I shook my head. Elle stumbled backward. The relief in her eyes was gone, her expression drawn and her chest heaving. Why was she pulling away? What happened, Elle? I took a step closer, desperate to know what she wasn't saying. There were men, she said. Three men who came. We're fine and they're dead, but... She shook her head. They said there were others, so we left. Breath wouldn't come quick enough, and the implication of her words fell over me with a wave of hair-raising unease. What men, Elle? I took a step closer. What did they do? She shook her head and wiped the tears from her eyes. Nothing, she said, reluctant. I waited impatiently for her to continue. Jackson, we're fine. Sophie and I shot them. You'd be proud of her, actually. She said it lightly, but those tears were not for nothing. There was something she wasn't telling me. They didn't hurt us, she reiterated, but her eyes shimmered as she stepped closer, searching mine as if she struggled for the right words. But they were dangerous, Jackson. They could do things. Have to check on him, Dell's wife shrieked, staring up at him and her hands flailed in desperation. We have to know. Elle wiped the tears from her cheeks. They have a son in Delta Junction, she explained. And they didn't know about the outbreak until now. What? I looked at the old man standing in the doorway, peering out at the couple as Dell pulled his wife into his arms. How could they not? But I already knew the answer. They'd carved themselves a place so self-sufficient they were cut off from the world and the turmoil that came with it. Like our world had fallen apart months ago, theirs was only beginning to crumble. After all they'd done for El and the kids, I took a step forward. I'll take you to Delta Junction, I told them, glancing at Alex and the kids huddled in the doorway. We just came back from there. They didn't know what they were up against, and after what had happened to Elle and the kids in Slana, whatever it might have been, I wouldn't let Dell take any chances. The man and woman looked at me. Tears filled her eyes, and worry creased his brow. You helped my family. I'll do what I can to help yours. 40. Jackson. April 12th. Alex, Dell, and I drove nearly the whole way in silence. It felt necessary after we dropped a bomb on them 
potentially shattering their whole world. Dell's attention was fixed on the long stretch of white that covered the road, lit only by the headlights of his old clunky Dodge. We'd already plowed a path, which helped us make decent time. Although I'd offered to drive, Dell had needed to do this on his own terms, and in his own way. I'd thought about bringing two vehicles in case we needed room for one more, but I knew it was unlikely and false hope wouldn't do Dell or his wife any favors. In the silence, my mind turned to L's words over and over. There'd been a lot going on, a flood of high emotions and urgency as we loaded up to leave again. But what L had told me was enough to make the apprehension I'd already felt triple, and Slana had become a looming question mark I needed to know more about, though I feared the answers even more. They're not just crazy anymore, Jackson. They can do unnatural things. Yet, when I'd asked her what they could do, she wasn't entirely certain. One of them said he could smell our fear, but I, I don't know about the others. It was the way she'd grabbed my arm as I turned for the truck, the way she'd refused to let go until I acknowledged the heaviness of her words that stayed with me most. You have to be careful. I was certain Elle knew what she'd heard, but in the height of the moment and as crazy as the men clearly were, it could have been a group of sick fucks taunting her and the kids because they could. What weighed on me the most were the tire tracks we'd left behind for them to follow to begin with. I'd led the men right to the shop and respectively to the house, and I hadn't been there to protect the four of them. It gave me some comfort to know that Elle and Sophie didn't need my protection, but not enough. Dell grabbed the empty can from the cup holder attached to his dash and spit into it. He was like an old cowboy, but instead of living out west, he was here in the wooded mountains of the Arctic. Birch bark, he explained and looked at me sideways. I chew when I'm restless. You want any? I knew birch wood and spruce scum were used a lot in the wildlands, but seeing it used as a replacement for chewing tobacco was a first. I shook my head. Thanks, though. Suit yourself. Alex dozed in the center seat, his head lulling back in exhaustion. I didn't blame him. Part of my mind longed for a glimpse of sleep, but I knew it was a long time coming yet. It felt more like a week had passed rather than a single day, and I'd been feeling the effects for hours now. I stretched my legs out as much as I could, trying not to get too comfortable in the truck's warmth. <clears throat> so, Dell said, clearing his voice. It was rough from disuse and maybe a little apprehensive. The whole world, huh? All of it. It still sounded fictional, saying it out loud. What else do I need to know about it? How did one explain the downfall of humanity on a global scale and the aftermath that followed when all that likely mattered to this man was finding his son? It mimicked the flu, or maybe it was the flu. I shook my head. I don't know. But there was a rumor it was a government experiment gone wrong and another that it was some ancient virus unearthed by climate change. If that had been the case, I doubt the biggest outbreak would have been in New York so early on. There was never any explanation then? Not yet. There was no one left to figure it out, which stirred deeper concerns the more I thought about it. It was too late by the time they realized how bad it really was. I remembered the first day I'd heard about it on the news, and all I could do was shake my head, grateful we were in the middle of nowhere and not some metropolis. A lot of good it did us. So much for innovation in the 21st century. Science couldn't even save us. Dell glanced at me. Maybe that's what caused it. Damn, he was probably right. I wouldn't be surprised. At least your family survived. It sounds like that's more than most can say. How did you manage that? Did you have a bunker? No, I'm not a prepper and I did lose my family. My father, my daughter, and my wife. Saying it out loud for the first time was like sticking a dull blade through my heart and cutting me through. The hurt hadn't gone away even if it had become easier to push away. I should prepare myself for the worst is 
what you're telling me. His son was either dead or alive. And if he were the latter, he would not be the same person Dell remembered. If he had been, he would have come home. If Jet is alive, he'll be different. You should prepare yourself for that. The truck bounced over the uneven snow, and Alex swayed in his seat beside me. Dell, I started, fearing my concern had come too late. We haven't met people like you before, people who never had the virus. While I assume it's come and gone like the fever, having run its course, I don't know if you're contagious, he asked. There was no censure in his voice and no fear, like he'd already thought it through. I nodded. If you are, it's already too late, he said. And if we find Jet and bring him home, well, we might get infected that way too. I'm not sure there's a way around it at this point. There's no sense in dwelling on it. In a way, he was right. There was nothing we could do now. The kids had settled into their home and took, at least, had touched Elle's blood while dressing her wounds. I ran my hands over my face, rubbing the feeling back into my skin as numbness to all of this set it. The outbreak had transformed the world. I could feel it in the silence, a void unlike anything I'd ever experienced. The more I thought about what Alex had said, the more I realized he was right. You could feel a charge around survivors, an energy, if you stopped to notice it. You could practically feel what was coming, good or bad. It makes sense, Dell said. L not being their mother? He clarified. I thought she looked too young, but you never know these days. She found them in Whiteley when she was looking for her sister. They all lost their parents. It was good of you to take them in. That was all L, I told him. Dell looked at me, then peered out at the passing Delta Junction sign on the highway. Slow driving made for a long night especially with uncertainty as to what awaited us. But we were close, and I hoped whatever we found gave the Ranskin some sort of peace. You know, he said, when I first met Jet, he was a punk kid who was giving his mama a rough time. I knew it was because his father never treated him right, always drunk and belligerent, but I'd like to think he was a decent kid under all the hurt. I didn't realize he wasn't your son. Oh, he is. That's how it works, you know. They wiggle their way into your life. It starts with seeing a spark in them you haven't noticed before, and maybe no one else has either. You see something that makes you want to work for it, and somehow you build a friendship and a bond you never expected. Jed was never my son by blood, but we were closer than he ever was with his birth father. Unexpectedly, I became acutely aware of Alex sleeping in the seat next to me. In my 30 years, I'd swayed between wanting children and not. Hannah changed all of that. And yet, even now that she was gone, I could still imagine a relationship close to that of a father and son with Alex, which scared the shit out of me. I looked at Dell. Were you a family friend or something? I was Hank's best friend, and... I watched the way he treated his family. Maybe I even felt a little guilt for not stepping into their turmoil more while he was alive. But Jade has always been a good woman and deserves someone to cherish her and her kid. And after 23 years, Dell turned at the exit sign and onto the main road passing the high school Alex and I had scavenged only hours ago. Sometimes families have a way of forming, even if we don't think we need or want them. The kids, Elle and I, had never planned on staying together. It was something we agreed early on. But I knew saying goodbye would be challenging. It was part of the reason I'd wanted to stay detached for so long. But growing closer or not, Hartley wasn't the place for me. I could feel it in my bones. Elle and the kids are going to Hartley Bay, I told him. There's a safe zone there with a community for the kids and safety. It will be the best place for them. Dell looked at me as he turned down a side street. Will it? Scratching my jaw, I stared out the window. 
As we drew closer to the buildings and neighborhoods, I nudged Alex awake. You should park out here, I told Dell, before we get too far into the populated areas. Why? We're still a good mile away from Jet's place. If anyone is here, we don't want them to know we're coming. Trust me. While Alex and I had already swept parts of the town, that didn't mean there weren't survivors somewhere. And after Elle's concern, we couldn't be too careful. Dell's face was expressionless, but fear was a black glimmer in his eyes, illuminated by the truck's dimly lit interior. He nodded and drove a bit further up the road before pulling over under the cover of an empty carport. I took my fleece cap off and ran my fingers through my hair. I wasn't sure I was ready for whatever we would find, let alone what Dell would have to go through, but it was inevitable. And in a way, I knew Dell was lucky to be with us instead of stumbling into the unknown, completely blindsided. We go in on foot, take our weapons, and stay out of sight as much as we can. I told him and glanced at Alex. He already knew the drill. With a nod from Dell, I got out of the truck, Alex sliding out behind me, and we wrapped ourselves as best we could against the midnight cold. When Dell was ready, the three of us made our way into town against wind that felt more like razor blades. We didn't talk or stop for a break. We stuck to the shadows and paused every now and again to watch for movement or lights and windows, and to see if any smoke billowed from chimneys. We listened for sounds that carried in the increasing wind, but other than Mother Nature's nighttime fury, the coast was clear. There was barely enough moonlight to see as it disappeared behind the clouds, but we made do, only using our flashlights when we needed to. Cars were partially buried in snow some of them abandoned in the middle of the street, the passengers, human icicles inside. But Dell didn't stop to look, and neither did we. Homes and businesses had icicles hanging from the eaves, and not a person stirred as we made our way down a side street into a sparsely established neighborhood. It didn't look like one might expect, like a city that had been looted in the aftermath of the outbreak. Instead, it felt like the small town was only sleeping under a dark and dangerous spell. Dell stopped at the street corner and peered around, not panicked like he was looking for something, but like he was taking it all in. Dell was seeing the world as it was for the first time, and I could imagine the reality of it all settling in. If he couldn't quite grasp what I'd been telling him before, he understood it now. He tucked his neck gaiter down to speak. It's the last one on the right, he said into the wind pointing down the street. He pulled his face protection up again and led the way. Alert with our weapons in hand, we made our way down the abandoned street. Alex was cautious but walked with confidence. He held his gun like he'd been on a rescue mission a dozen times before. It was a welcomed reminder he would do well once I was gone. When we reached Jet's house, an old forerunner was parked in the side driveway, nearly covered in snow that slid from the rooftop. The forerunner hadn't moved in months, and like the other houses we'd passed, the drapes were drawn and everything appeared dark inside. Dell tried to turn the front door handle first, but it was locked. I don't know where he keeps his spare key, he admitted. We'll find a way in, Alex said, and he headed around to the back of the house, Dell and I following behind him. Dell knocked on the sliding glass door and peered inside through the open blinds into the darkness. No candles flickered, and Jet never came. And soon, my unease turned from apprehension about what we might find to a sadness that seemed to settle over all of us. Alex grabbed a shovel leaning up against the side of the house and offered it to Dell. It would be the only way in. Dell knew that much. There was a thunk and a crash as the glass fell inside onto the linoleum floor. Jet? Son, how are you in here? Dell stepped through the glass and Alex lifted his rifle as he walked in behind him. My eyes shifted around the backyard, wondering if neighbors or anyone lurking nearby might have heard us. The wind was loud enough to muffle the sound and arrow-like spruces surrounded the whole backyard, encapsulating it in a winter wonderland that showed no signs of melting anytime soon. Glock in my hand, I followed them inside, bracing myself for whatever Dell would find next. Son. Dell's hunting rifle hung at his side as we swept the galley kitchen with our flashlights, 
followed by the adjacent living room, which looked forgotten. Resigned, Dell made his way down the narrow hallway, passing a bathroom that had a pile of towels and clothes on the floor, and toward a bedroom. The air was frigid, like the ice itself had seeped inside and clung to the walls, and my breath was a white puff in the darkness. Dell stopped in the bedroom doorway, and Alex and I hung back, giving him all the space we could. A few breaths passed before Dell stepped into the room, and reluctantly, I crept forward to ensure the room was clear. It was, save for a bearded man tucked into his bed, like he'd fallen into a frozen sleep, and the mound covered in a sheet beside him. Dell stood at the bedside, staring down at him. He was lucky then, he croaked. Dell crouched down, hesitantly resting his hand over Jet's, and I backed out of the room, leaving him with his grief. A quiet Inuit prayer I'd heard only once reached my ears as I headed down the hallway toward the back door. As the words rolled off of Dell's tongue, they soothed old wounds and stung others still too raw, and I was grateful Alex didn't follow me. Dell's son had died peacefully in his sleep, but Hannah's final hours were more gruesome than that. I tried not to think of her terror as her murderer pointed a gun at her after she'd fought so hard to save herself, and I tried not to think about her pain as she bled out or the heartbreak she felt knowing her daughter was dying. I tried not to remember either of them the way they were the day I put them in the ground, but it was impossible. And while Dell mourned his son, I mourned my family. I mourned the mother I'd missed most of my life, wishing she were still here to offer words of wisdom when I needed them most. But she was gone. They all were. And I felt the loss as keenly as ever. I let my sorrow consume me as I stepped out into the cold, bleak night. When we returned to Jade and the others, we'd put on a brave face and be strong again. 41. L. April 13th. Sophie, Thea, and Beau were asleep on the same bed I'd woken up on earlier, swathed by the heat of the fire burning in the stove and the blankets tangled between them. The guys had been gone for nearly six hours and still hadn't returned. I'd offered to wait up with Jade, but she insisted I retire to the cabin with the kids. Granting her privacy while she waited in a state of grief and aching uncertainty was the least I could do. I'd upturned her world in a single, thoughtless sentence. So, he survived then? The answer, I assumed, was no. But the hours felt like an eternity one impossible to sleep through, despite how many times I commanded myself to close my eyes and count sheep instead of regrets. My body ached with exhaustion, and my mind was heavy, but none of it mattered. Jackson hadn't known about Slana when he'd arrived, which meant he didn't know what I had done to the man in the hallway. From my pallet of sleeping bags on the floor, I stared up at the wood-slatted ceiling. It hurt to breathe, and it wasn't only because of my sore body. I'd prepared myself for the probability that Jackson would come to make sure we were okay, because that's the kind of man he was. And then he would leave, barely able to look at me for what I'd done. The fire was something that might frighten him, but it was out of my control. The lie, however, was a betrayal no one would easily forgive. When he'd stepped out of the truck, I'd braced myself for coldness and anger. But the worry in his eyes, the fear on his face. I'd thought for a flickering moment he didn't care about any of it, as long as we were okay. But he hadn't even known any of it. Whatever I felt in that knowledge wasn't relief. If anything, the weight of my secrets now felt heavier and graver. He had been relieved to see someone he only thought he knew. I looked at the kids, bathed in the soft glow cast through the door of the stove. Sophie's brow was lined with discomfort as she dreamed, 
and I wondered if it was my haunting memory she saw tonight or someone else's. I needed to help her, and I had to tell Jackson what was happening to me and to Sophie, and I had to tell him what I'd done to his father. With my better arm, I manhandled the pillows underneath my head, trying to prop myself up more, when I heard Dell's truck coming toward the house. A flutter of nerves followed. The truck door shut and the tailgate squeaked open, and after a few minutes of murmurs, I heard the tailgate slam closed. They'd found Jet, apparently, and it didn't seem like he'd made it. I squeezed my eyes shut, and my heart broke for Jade. She'd been so kind to us, and what had been open smiles and warmth today would be sadness in the morning. The cabin door creaked open, and cold air whizzed into the room. Jackson's heavy footsteps preceded his shadow, followed by Alex's, and then they shut the door quietly behind them. It felt as if the air was being sucked from the room, and my heartbeat trembled with the urge to blurt the truth, though I thought it better to pretend I was asleep. I glanced up at their darkened forms. The folding cot is for you, Alex, I whispered. Apparently, my decision was to do neither. And your bag is next to Sophie's at the foot of the bed. He nodded and mouthed a thank you. Closing my eyes, I draped my arm over my face to give him a modicum of privacy. With no downstairs couch to sleep on, or a separate room to remove himself to, I wondered if Jackson would lie on the pallet beside me, or if he'd disappear somewhere, like he usually did when he wanted time to himself. Alex rustled into his nightclothes. A strong gust of wind racked the side of the cabin, making it creak. I wasn't cold, but the impending what next was a deep-rooted chill, and I pulled the blankets up higher around my neck. When I heard the squeak of the cot, I opened my eyes. Alex was settling in beneath a blanket, facing the wall. Jackson crouched beside the wood stove, warming his hands. He looked at the kids, then down at me. There's Aunt, I reassured him. He turned the handle and opened the stove. I could feel the distance, thick and gravid between us, even if he crouched only inches from me. You should rest, he said, and reached for another log to throw on the dying flames. The sun will be up soon, and we need to gather our things from the explorer. I know, I told him, wishing he'd take his own advice and let his mind rest for once. But I need to talk to you about something. Now wasn't the time. There would never be a good time. But he needed to know. Oh, he said. My name was a heavy, quiet breath. Can it wait until tomorrow? I could only imagine what they'd found in Delta Junction, but the toll it took on him was palpable. Of course, I whispered. Jackson closed the stove and brushed his hands off on his pants as he stood up. He removed his hat and jacket, and cold air wafted off of him carrying with it a scent I recognized as his own. Wood smoke, earth, and whatever it was about him that made him formidable, stoic, alluring Jackson. He removed his boots and stretched out on the pallet beside me. How's Dell? I asked. I knew he was grieving, but it was one thing to mourn someone you love and another to find their dead body. Grateful it wasn't worse. I think. Jackson's voice was soft despite its deepness, and he pulled a sleeping bag half over him, like being warm was only an afterthought. His clothes rustled. Our shoulders touched, but barely as he ran his hand over his beard. Finally, he let out a deep breath. Don't let the kids go into the garden shed, okay? I turned my head to look at him, watching the way his eyelashes fluttered with each thoughtful blink. Okay. Jackson met my gaze. In the silence, I could almost feel it, hot and prying me open, searching for something, even if I wasn't sure what. I swallowed, and his eyes shifted down to my mouth and neck. Then he looked away. 
I'm glad you're okay, he whispered. I'm glad you're okay too. Tears blurred my eyes. I wanted to say everything and nothing at the same time, because tomorrow everything would change. But within moments, his breath slowed and deepened, and Jackson fell asleep. 42. Jackson. April 13th. While Jade prepared her son's body for burial, the five of us, minus injured L, made our way out to the overturned explorer and trailer on the highway. Not only did we need to gather our things and inventory what we'd lost, but we needed to get the trailer off the road and out of sight from unwanted eyes. If what the Slana visitors had said was true, and there were more men somewhere close by, we didn't want them to find us or the Ranskins, and we'd made it easy with all the tire tracks in the snow. Alex and Sophie manned Dell's snowmobile, pulling an empty sled behind them, and I drove Thea and Bo in the Tacoma. Do you think someone took our stuff? Thea asked, sitting straight and alert in the back seat. Her little head shifted back and forth as she glanced between the windshield and the passenger window. Who would take our stuff? Bo quipped, throwing his hands up like he couldn't believe she was even thinking it. Wolves, Thea retorted. They could take our food. That's true, I told them. If any animal smelled the food in the bins, they might have figured out how to open them. The food may be gone. Thea's eyes flashed wider. What will we eat then? We'll find more, I told her. That was the least of our problems right now. While grocery stores weren't exactly accessible out here, whatever stores we found would likely be stocked with enough food to tide us over. It was finding another weatherproofed working vehicle that had been on my mind. With Elle injured, things would progress more slowly than usual. I'd always known she'd done a lot managing the kids, but in the time it took to give herself a sponge bath and change clothes with her one good hand, Sophie, Alex, and I got the kids their breakfast, dressed, and out the door so that Dell, Jade, and Took could deal with their family business. Besides gathering our things and restocking the supplies we were missing, we needed to find another vehicle large enough for five that could also carry most of our necessities before we overstayed our welcome. Elle was in pain. We could all see it plainly on her face, even if she thought she could hide it. And with everything there was to do in the shortest amount of time possible, the next day or two would be arduous, assuming we even had that long. At any minute, the Ranskins might decide their generosity had run its course, and it was time for us to leave. Are we going to have a funeral? Thea asked. She was full of questions. That was her thing, I realized. Thea didn't care what was happening as long as she could play in puddles and ask as many questions as she wanted. She was curious, and Bo was a thinker. Bo liked to roll his eyes and be part of the big kid action. He was observant, and I often wondered what gears were turning in that little head of his. I didn't have to wonder with Thea. Ever. Well? Well what? I glanced at her in the rearview mirror. The funeral, she reminded me. Yes, there will be a ceremony for Jet, I told her. Later this afternoon, after the sun goes down. Did someone kill him? Thea asked quietly, worried, sad. Her mind went there fast, which was a reminder of how much these kids had seen. They related the world to violence now, and the trooper inside me felt like I'd failed them in some way. No one killed him, I said softly. He died peacefully in his sleep. From the fever? I nodded. She was quiet and introspective for a few breaths, like her brother then asked, why didn't we die? Both Bo and Thea looked at me, curiosity widening their eyes. I'd seen it before when they asked if we were their new parents. I had let Elle take that one and buried myself in a bottle of bourbon. We definitely weren't their parents and never could be, but without a better adult figure, it was up to me to explain things to them the best I could, even if I didn't have all the answers. I don't know, I told her. I thought of the science book I'd brought back for Sophie, making a mental note to give it to her once we were back at the cabin. If Sophie could come up with even a general hypothesis, 
it would be something to help us make sense of things. For now, the truth was like a gray fog over a bridge we had been forced to cross, uncertain what had happened between one end and the other. I'm sorry, Thea. I don't know why some of us died and some of us lived. We're just lucky, she told me, and her words gave me pause. Were we lucky? The past four months had been tough, straight-up misery at times, and the past couple days had been a torrential shit show. But we were alive, and some were safe. We found each other, which felt like a miracle. Yeah, I decided. We are lucky. I brought the truck to a stop a few yards shy of the Explorer and looked at the kids. All right, ready for operation cleanup? Thea and Bo lifted two canvas bags each to fill with whatever they could. Yep. Be careful of broken glass, they said in unison. And if we find your popcorn, make sure we give it to you, not L. Bo muttered. You got it. Let's load up what we can. Alex brought the snowmobile to a stop beside the truck, and he and Sophie climbed off. Got it? I asked turning in my seat as Thea struggled with the door handle. She grunted in reply, and Bo, ever the older brother, reached across to help her open it. Then they both jumped out of the truck. I opened the driver's side door and watched as the kids ran over to Sophie and Alex. Okay, Sophie said and clapped her gloved hands together. Ready? We're going to see who can gather the most food and supplies first. Winner gets some of my Skittles. Sophie was clearly feeling better than last I saw her in Slana. I wasn't sure if it was the near-death experience or the fact that she'd proven to herself she could shoot someone if she needed to. But she seemed less cagey, even if she still kept her distance. I still knew little about the Slana story and what had happened with the men, but I had a sickening suspicion that's what Elle wanted to talk about last night. Her face had said it all, and I was scared. I didn't want to hear what those men had done. I didn't want to feel worse than I already did for leading them right to the front door, even if I knew she'd gotten the kids out safely. I climbed out of the truck and shut the door, rifle in hand. The cold air was always welcome, especially in the morning, and I took a deep breath. The sun was out, the sky was clear, and I was glad to know we'd at least have a beautiful day to get a lot done. Scanning the tree line in the road for anything amiss, I made my way around the perimeter. I wanted to find out which critters had been in our backyard overnight, and if it was only the animal kingdom I needed to worry about. I followed the patterns in the snow, noting the ptarmigan and fox prints, as well as a tattered bag of bread a dozen feet from the crash site. If frozen wonder bread had been the only casualty, I was okay with that. The caribou prints were still fresh as was the snowmobile path from Dell's impromptu hunting after the accident. Other than tire tracks I felt safe assuming were from the Dodge and Tacoma, it appeared no one else had been on the road, which was one less thing I had to worry about, for now. My first bag's full, Bo announced. Mine too, Thea said as she bent over to grab a box of crackers to shove on the top. Set them on the sled and fill up another one. Sophie instructed as she crouched beside the medical supplies, sorting through what remained. Bo, I need your muscle, Alex called. This camping gear is heavy. Beaming with purpose, Bo handed Thea his bag and headed over to help. All of them were busy at work without a single complaint, and even if I was still getting to know them, it was sad to think I'd wanted nothing more than to be their travel companion in the beginning. Now, I couldn't imagine the next five months without them. I tried not to think about it and stared at the Explorer. We had our work cut out for us, that was for sure. Staring at the dented hatch, I wondered what it would take to get it open and unload the rest of our things when I noticed a pad print with four claws beside my boot. While I wasn't generally afraid of wolves, knowing they weren't exactly manhunters by design, their constant presence was beginning to change that. I followed the trail a few yards north and then back again before they wrapped around the other side of the vehicle. There were claw marks in the snow, near the back seat where either Thea or Bo had been sitting, like the wolves had been trying to get in or get something out, possibly food. I might not have given it another thought had my instincts not screamed at me that something was glaringly wrong. 43. L. 
April 13th. While the others were at the road gathering our frozen belongings, I straightened our little living space the best I could, smoothing out the fox fur blanket that covered Took's bed, doing a slow, awkward side bend to pick up Bo's socks, half hidden beneath the bed frame. It was only a matter of days, maybe even hours before we would leave, and with our few belongings already packed in our bags, it was difficult to find something to do. Bothering Jade or Dell while they were mourning wasn't an option. And even though I missed the chatter of the kids, I was relieved Jackson was gone. It was easier that way, for now. We would talk, eventually, but it was a matter of timing again, for the Ranskins' sake this time. We'd already caused them enough upset to last them the rest of their lives. Fresh air. I needed fresh air and sunshine. There had to be a scientific study published at a college campus on the California coast somewhere about the healing powers of sunshine, or maybe that was just wishful thinking. I doubted it could heal sore bones, but it might help ease my mind a little. Stepping outside, I turned my face to the sun and closed my eyes against its bright rays. I inhaled the morning air, willing it to seep as deep as possible into my lungs. The warblers chirped, the pine trees rustled in the light breeze, and my hands flexed at my side. It was a beautiful day, and yet it was too quiet. I was stewing. I couldn't run to expel nervous energy or help the crew clean our supplies from the road. It felt like I couldn't do anything worthwhile at all, but I was determined to find something. The Ranskin's dog yawned and stretched in his kennel. His tail wagged when he noticed me. With an excited yip, he paced back and forth, looking at me like he was waiting for me to do something. There had been little opportunity for casual conversation, so I hadn't learned his name. He was gray and slender, with a thick, fluffy tail and white markings around his mouth. The closer I drew to him, the more excited he became, and when he nudged his empty bowl, I began to understand. Ah, it's breakfast time. I'll see what I can find. I wasn't familiar with the property, aside from what I'd seen walking from one cabin to the other, but finding the dog food seemed easy enough. It would be stored somewhere indoors or in a bin, safe from critters. Veering away from the shed I knew held Jet's body, I headed to the shop where I assumed meat and other foods were stored. It was heavily latched with reinforced metal siding, enough to make it more bear-proof than the rest. As I passed the smokehouse, I made a mental list of other tasks that might be helpful, which included checking the embers that smoked inside and pulling the laundry down from the line to fold it if it was ready. I reached for the shed door, realizing the latch was already open, and heard a loud thwack, followed by scraping. Though I thought I should probably turn around so not to intrude, curiosity outweighed my uncertainty, and I creaked the door open to peek inside. The shed was the size of a three-car garage with a workbench along the back wall and a large table with stone slabs in the center. Blood stained the wood paneling around it, but it was too cold to smell anything other than the tang of the metal that bolstered the building and the scent of damp earth. Took stood at the work table, cutting up caribou meat Dell had brought back with him. Have you ever killed and prepared your own meat before? He barely lifted his gaze to look at me. No, I admitted. I haven't. I hadn't realized he'd noticed my snooping. He tossed the strips of meat into a container and lifted what looked like an entire side flank from the workbench behind him onto the cutting board. Thwack! He chopped the flank in half. Took managed it effortlessly, despite his age lines and peppered hair poking out from beneath his cap. Well, I guess I've killed my meat before. I teased, somewhat abashed by my horrible joke. I cleared my throat. But I've never prepared it, no. It's satisfying. You might like it. I can imagine. And I could imagine. Out here, living was about knowledge, hard work, and patience. And with those three things, I would never have to worry about having enough food or providing for the kids.
We would be safe and secluded, too. I peered into two buckets of entrails set off to the side on the floor and tried to remember it was sustenance, not disgusting. The look of raw meat was one of the items I'd have to add to my list of shit to get used to. Do you know what a caribou flank would cost at a butcher? Took's gaze shifted to mine again. I'd assumed he was being facetious, but he seemed more inquisitive than glib. A lot? Took shrugged. No clue. I've never had to buy one. Touché, I said with a quirk of a smile, and I stepped further inside the shed. If he was talking to me, my presence must not have been wholly unwanted. Can I help you with anything? The rest of the gang went to get our supplies from the road. I'm in the market for some chores. I held my palm up to add, I should preface that I'm not good for much. Took lifted an eyebrow. Restless already? Pretty much. I'm one of those people who needs to keep busy. Ever since. I stopped myself before I could put my foot too far into my mouth. The outbreak was probably like a fresh, gaping wound to them because it was all so new. Took didn't need reminding. He tied a strap of leather around a caribou thigh. The sickness, he finished for me. You might as well say it. He hefted it up, sidestepped me, and headed out the door. Okay, well, ever since the outbreak, it's unnerving to be idle. I followed him out to the smokehouse, our feet crunching in the snow, still thick in the woods despite the warming days. You think you won't survive the illness, then the next thing you know, you're just trying to stay alive. Even in Slana, we spent our time stocking up on food and supplies, preparing for whatever comes next. So, being busy keeps me focused. Took glanced over his shoulder, his gaze meeting mine. A restless mind is a restless soul. He pulled the knot on one crossbeam tighter, stringing the meat up, causing it to swing. I reached out to steady it. Took was right about that. Restlessness felt more like a disability or a disease, difficult to treat, though I'd been trying different remedies for months. Once Took was satisfied the meat was secure, he turned around, gaze fixed on me. He was a little taller than I was, maybe 5'8 or 5'9, and reminded me of my old friend, the fisherman. He had baggy, all-weather trousers on and a trench coat of sorts that looked waterproof, maybe easy to clean after a day butchering meat. It is a test, he said, walking past me and out the door. Yeah, another one, I muttered with a humorless laugh. Took turned to me. Everything is a test, he said in earnest, and my face flushed. He lowered a bushy gray eyebrow, and I realized he was referring to himself, too, to the turmoil his family was facing. I could see the truth of his words in his eyes, both shimmering and stark. It's all part of change, even if it's difficult. It's a natural part of life. I wasn't sure how natural the outbreak was, but he was right. Nothing was certain, and change was inevitable, no matter how big and small, no matter how heartbreaking. I'm sorry, Took. That was insensitive. We've turned your world upside down. You should never be sorry for telling the truth, he said, pointing at me with a dirt and blood-stained finger. Although he was adamant, his voice was soft. If you hadn't showed up, we wouldn't have a month's worth of caribou meat. His head tilted ever so slightly, and I saw a satisfied twitch in his dark gray eyes. They were silvery pools of wisdom, just like his daughter's. Everything happens for a reason. You are here for a reason. For a man who had to give up his house for us to stay in, watch his daughter grieve for her only son, and mourn Jet for himself, Took was less cantankerous than usual. Thank you. What are you thanking me for? He grumbled and continued to the shed. And just like that, Grouchy Took was back.
I'm thanking you for putting things into perspective. The wood smoke clung to my clothes and hair as I stepped inside behind him. As bad as I felt for the Ranskins, I knew Took was right. They may or may not have ever known what actually happened to Jet, or anyone for that matter. With a grunt, Took hefted one of the buckets of entrails onto the work table and began picking through them, sorting the meaty bits from the rest. What are you doing with those? Save some for fish bait and trapping. It's time to start stocking up for winter again. Already? There's never a dull moment living out here, I mused, but it was admiration I felt. Each season brings with it new tasks that need to be done. This month, the salmon and waterfowl are rampant, and we need to stock up before they've moved on to their next stop. He looked up at me and nodded to the door. Did you see the pot warming on the embers in the smokehouse? I nodded. Can you carry it? He glanced at my rib. The pot wasn't any bigger than a tea kettle, so I nodded. Good. Take it to Jade. She's in the garden shed. I nodded because I couldn't say no, but I wasn't sure she'd want me in there. Took handed me a thickly folded cloth and nodded for the door again. Oh, the dog. He's hungry. Yeah, Koda's always hungry. I'll take care of it. Go on now, he urged. Jade could use a hand, and since you've only got one to spare. I couldn't help but smile and hurry toward the smokehouse. Took had made a joke, a pretty funny one at that. But I did what I was told and picked the pot off the embers with the folded cloth, feeling the weight of the water in every part of my body as it protested. With a deep breath, I squared my shoulders and steeled myself for what awaited me in the garden shed. I knew Jade was readying her son's body for burial, something that felt especially intimate. Hesitant, I stopped at the door and tapped my knuckles on its rough surface. I'd grieved for my sister's death and for a life I hadn't appreciated to the fullest, but I'd never grieved for a child. I wasn't sure what state I would find her in, but I got the impression Took didn't want her to be alone. Jade, I whispered through the wood door. Some sort of steel protected the seams in the door for better insulation, and I assumed it was warmer inside. Jade remained quiet, and I thought maybe she'd return to the house, but when I creaked the door open, she stood on the far side of a wooden table. Mechanical parts were stacked beneath its thick legs, and plants and burlap bags with bulbs poking out of them hung in clay pots on the walls. Soil dusted the ground, and it looked like the space might have served as their garage, too. Her son's body lay on a blanket of caribou hide, wrapped in another blanket from the waist down. Jackson said they'd brought his wife, Sarah, back, too. I didn't see her in the room, but I wasn't going to ask where she was, either. I cleared my throat. I'm sorry to intrude. I whispered, stepping inside. But I have the warm water. Jade brushed Jet's black hair out of his face as one of her tears dripped onto his shoulder. She didn't acknowledge me. I wasn't sure she even processed my being there, but she needed the water all the same. Uncertain where she wanted it, I placed the pot on the table by the crook of his neck. Like Jade, he had a tattoo, but not dashes on his chin like she did. A black and red Hata moon wrapped around his right shoulder, glistening with Jade's tears in the sunlight. It was similar to the totem around Took's neck, guardian and protector of the people of Earth. Jackson had the moon tattoo on his arm as well, and while he was very much alive and virile, it seemed unfair that Jet hadn't made it too. I tried to reconcile the way Jet looked now, discolored, but not dead for four months decayed, like he'd been preserved in an ice tomb, and how he might have looked before. Jade stared at his face, her eyes red-rimmed, but bright gray wells of sadness in the sunlight. I was about to leave her to mourn when she said, when he was a boy, he loved ice fishing. She looked up at me as if a thought struck her. Have you ever been ice fishing? I nodded. Once, when I was nine. With your father? Yeah, something like that. 
Dr. John was the closest thing I'd ever had. At some point, I had to accept it. Jet loved it. Del and I thought for sure he would be a fisherman one day. A small smile curved the corner of her mouth as she looked back down at him, seeing the boy he'd been instead of the lifeless man he was. Can you hand me one of those rags, please? She pointed to the shelves in the corner behind me, where three of them were folded and stacked. I handed one to her as she poured water into a ceramic dish resting on a shelf behind her. She replaced it with the pot on the table by his shoulder and dipped the cloth, testing the heat of the water before she submerged it completely. Unrushed and thoughtful, she began to wipe his body, back and forth, gently. She ran the rag over his cheeks as if she were bathing a small, delicate child. A trail of steam followed each careful stroke. Is there anything I can do to help? Jade's head drifted to the right and then the left as she memorized the curves of his face. He was a handsome man, with narrower features than Jade had and closely shaven black whiskers on his face. After I had Jet, I thought I might want to have another child, until I saw what kind of father my husband was. There was a sadness in her voice I understood, a longing like I often longed for a real family in my childhood. I wanted Jet to have someone to play with, but it never worked out that way. There were other children in the village back then, but I know he grew lonely sometimes, especially after they all moved away, lost to the changing world of convenience. I didn't begrudge any of them, but Jet did, I think. She dipped the cloth into the warm water again. When you live out here, it's easy to keep busy, but the quiet hours are harder for some. Jet struggled with it. I think that's why he moved to town with Sarah. He liked the noise and the city. She talked about her son with a lilt of joy in her voice, a contentment I was grateful she had. He thought I was so silly for calling it that. The city. It always felt big to me. I think that's why I never went back. A bird whistled outside the shed, and Coda's excited yelp ricocheted between the outbuildings. But Jade was lost in a world where her son was alive, and happy memories made her eyes smile. I've always liked the quiet. It brings me peace, something that Dell realized a long time ago. It's why he never made me leave. She glanced at me. He moved out here just before my husband died, you know. He had a ranch back in Oklahoma, came here on a fishing trip. My husband was his guide, and Dell never left. Jed and I were lucky for that. Her eyes shimmered as she submerged the rag in the water again and rang it out. You find people in your life when you need them, she said. That's something I've always believed. She looked up at me again her gaze lingering this time, and what looked like gratitude pulled at her cheeks as another small smile twitched into place. Jade's sincerity made my chest ache. She was right. We'd needed them in more ways than one, and they'd needed us in some strange way too. It was a fate I could feel, even if I couldn't quite understand it. With a deep sigh, Jade took Jet's hand in hers. Will you bury them today? I asked. Tonight, she whispered, running the damp cloth over his fingers. When the lights dance in the sky. 44. L. April 13th. We stood, nine strong, at Jed and Sarah's graves protected beneath a towering spruce in a quiet forest. Only the sound of a soft wind blew through the boughs above, and though the sun had long set, the snow sparkled in the dancing lights illuminating the sky. They'd always felt like an earthly wonder, but tonight they were more than that. The northern lights were vibrant with life and hope. Jet's wrapped body was barely visible, as Dell and Took placed the final two stones over his grave, 
a fortified protection from the elements and wildland creatures above the frozen earth. Del stood beside Jade and took her hand in his. She squeezed his fingers before she took a step closer to the grave and placed a bear figurine on the headstone. We stood in a quiet semicircle of grief and sadness. The biting cold breeze stung my overwarm skin. Cold puffs of white commingled between us, and Jade let her tears fall silently on his grave as she said her silent goodbye. Del bowed his head, as did the children, Thea taking Jade's hand in hers as she peered down at her little snow-dampened boots. Then Jade closed her eyes and began to sing. It was a whisper at first, words I'd never heard, but that were more beautiful than anything ever spoken. Sounds so celestial, they evoked a calm unlike anything I'd ever felt. As her voice grew louder, I recognized the tune, and my eyes blurred with tears. She was singing Amazing Grace. Jackson glanced from Jade to me, surprise filling his eyes. The more he listened, the more the permanent crease in his brow softened. I wanted to know what he was thinking, almost yearned to. But when he peered up at the lights, so did I, and I imagined a life where all things could be so breathtaking. Dance with the spirits, my son she whispered when she finished, and a strong gust of wind blew through the forest, sending Jade's fur cape flapping in the breeze as she kissed her flattened palm and bent down to place it on a stone for a final time before she joined us in the semicircle again. Thea did the same, reclaiming Jade's hand again, and we all stood in respective silence, taking in the beautiful lights that shimmered above us, clearer than they'd been on any night before. He will live with the spirits now, Jade said, peering down at Thea, then at Bo, with all the souls and spirits that have come before him, animal and man alike. Thea blinked up at the lights in awe. Bo wiped at his cheeks, gleaming with dampness, which I hadn't expected. I took his mittened hand in mine and startled as a wolf house sounded in the night sky closer than I was comfortable with. Jaw clenched and heart pounding, I peered into the woods surrounding us. The wolves were close, too close. Come, Del said behind me, let's go back to the house. Are they going to eat Chet? Thea whined, glancing back at Bo. No, sweets, Jade answered. They can't smell him, it's too cold for that. Come on, Bo. I turned to leave, squeezing his hand in mine, but he dug his heels into the snow, jerking me back a step. I grimaced and tried not to shout. Bo, I said evenly. Come on, we need to get inside. I'd never been afraid of wolves before, but their constant presence was impossible to brush off any longer. Bo didn't move, acting like he hadn't even heard me. His eyes locked on the darkness of the forest, at something I couldn't see, and he wiped another tear from his cheek. Bo, let's go, please. The white spruce branches trembled, and a black wolf walked out of the shadows, ice on its fur coat, twinkling from the lights above. Its head hung low, and its eyes were so yellow they were almost glowing. L, Jackson cautioned and his looming form appeared beside me. Let's go, Bo, he said, firm but calm, his eyes never leaving the wolf. More glowing eyes came into focus deeper in the woods as three more wolves stepped closer. Jackson, I breathed. He lifted Bo into his arms and took a slow step back, taking my hand in his. We took another step back, then another, and the wolves watched us without moving as we retreated back to the cabin with the others. Bo didn't make a peep. The wolves didn't come closer. I only allowed myself to sigh with relief when Dell came up beside us, rifle gripped protectively in his hand. First the wolves were in Slana, and now they were here. It was growing harder to ignore the increasing draw Bo had to them, 
and they to him. 45. Jackson, April 13th. The cabin was cramped with nine of us, and more bodies meant more heat. The kids didn't seem to mind, but I was taking layer off after layer. Elle was down to her t-shirt, though. She'd kept her gloves on, as usual. I decided I liked that random quirk of hers. She didn't get grossed out by blood, which there was a lot of when you worked outdoors or raised kids, and she didn't shy away from hard work or uncomfortable conversations with them, like I did. Elle didn't even complain when the heat was too high, and she was so miserable I could see the sweat on her brow. She was selfless and seemed perfect in so many ways. The gloves were a nice reminder that she wasn't without idiosyncrasies of her own. I appreciated that about her. Dinner's ready, Alex announced and handed Sophie a soup bowl and bread roll to pass along. I scooted one of the tree stumps over we'd brought inside and claimed a spot next to the couch. I was a big guy, but I didn't need much in the way of comfort. Another howl, more distant this time, pierced through the night. The wolves were persistent and still close, even after we'd moved inside. The knot in the pit of my stomach tightened as another wolf howled back. Elle glanced at me from where she sat at the table next to the kids. The disquiet was equally obvious in her eyes, but the wolves were only one of a few topics she likely wanted to discuss. I'd kept myself busy all day, getting the food and supplies locked up in the meat shed and gathering stones with Alex for the burial. Even if it made me a coward, I still wasn't ready to know what had happened in Slana or hear the disappointment underlying her words. You weren't there. Here you go, Del, Sophie said, handing him a bowl of soup and a warm roll as he sat on the couch beside Jade. Caribou stew, made with ingredients from your winter garden, of course, she explained. And the rolls, heated to perfection, are from ours, Elle added wryly. Del's eyes gleamed with hunger, and he nodded in thanks. There was another howl, further away this time, and though the Ranskins continued to show no signs of getting sick, I was seriously considering some animals were. What's Del short for? Bo asked, turning around in his seat at the table. Delmont, but don't bother calling me by it, he said. Delmont was my father, and I'm not as old as he was yet, so I won't answer. He slurped at his stew with a wink. I was named after my dad too, Bo said proudly. But Bo isn't short for anything. It's a good name, Jade said. She wrapped her shawl tighter around her and nestled deeper into her spot on the futon. And it fits, Sophie added, handing me a bowl of stew. Her eyes met mine, but only briefly, and she walked back to the stove. It means handsome in French. She'd barely looked at me all day, and even for Sophie, withdrawn as she sometimes was, it felt ominous. You're French? Thea asked, running her tongue over her red lips. Wow, that's fancy. Either Thea had been hungry enough to brave the piping hot stew, or she was more resilient than I thought and didn't care in the slightest. My mom is, uh, was, Sophie amended. Or I guess my grandma was. There was a stretch of silence as reality settled in around us again. Everyone we ever knew who wasn't in the room with us was likely a was now. Why am I not surprised you're French? Alex smirked. His Alex-like merriment always cut through the thick tension in the room. Sophie's pale skin flushed, and she tucked her loose long hair behind her ear and averted her gaze. I wondered if the same charge Alex felt sometimes when he touched Sophie went both ways, and I forced myself not to smile. Sophie delivered another bowl of stew to Took, then sat at the table beside him, cramped with the kids and Elle. There were a lot of us, but we'd made it work. Thanks for dinner, Alex. Sophie blew on a spoonful and hesitantly took a sip. Took sniffed the steam that rose from his bowl. It smells edible at least. Oh, stop it, Dad. I chuckled and finally worked up the nerve to take a bite. It's delicious, Alex, Jade said, licking her lips. Don't listen to him. 
Alex glanced up from his bowl, broth dripping from his chin before he could wipe it away. I hope so, because there's plenty more. Clanks and slurps and sighs filled the room as we all sat in companionable silence, appreciating our warm meal together. Elle quickly admonished the kids when they began playing with their food and winked at them when she felt she'd done her due diligence as a parental figure, promising them a snowball fight after dinner if they kept more of their broth inside their bowls. What about you, Elle? I asked, growing more curious about her with every week that went by. What's L short for? She gave me a hesitant, sidelong look and peered around the room. Eleanor, she said reluctantly, and dipped a part of her roll in her broth. You don't like Eleanor? Her frown surprised me. Who said she doesn't like it? Dell asked. Sometimes we just like nicknames. L lifted a dark, delicate eyebrow and took a sip from her bowl, contemplating. Dabbing her lips, she cleared her throat and said, No, he's right. I don't like it. Uh-oh. Took grumbled and sat back in his seat, settling in with bright amusement to listen. At least I didn't used to like it. I'm not sure how I feel one way or the other about it now. She glanced between the eight curious faces staring at her. I was named after someone I don't like all that much, she admitted. I was expecting a funny retelling about her and her twin sister being mixed up or something at birth. Not that she hated her name. But then, I shouldn't have been surprised. Elle had made it clear her life before was a dark, windy path that gave her nightmares and made her feel like she had to protect herself in order to escape. It's your mother's name. I couldn't help the question. I wanted to know how she'd come to be the woman I knew, Purposeful and formidable and yet soft in the most striking moments. Yes, my mother. She left when I was little, just sort of disappeared. She didn't care what happened to me and Jenny after that. She met my gaze, a gleam in her eyes that looked almost desperate, but I wasn't sure why. Took was a family name too, Jade explained, breaking Elle's hold over me. An ancestor I've never met. I ate a few more spoonfuls of stew, finally cool enough for me to appreciate while everyone else was nearly finished. Me either, Took said. I heard he was a son of a bitch, he grumbled. Dad. I chuckled. We've all got a few of those in our family. You look like a man who knows a bit about Alaskan heritage, Jackson. Who are you named after? My grandfather. I wiped my mustache and leaned forward, my elbows resting on my knees. He was a fisherman in Sitka, originally from Canada. He was one of the last people in my mother's village that still made his own boats with cottonwood he'd stripped and split. That's remarkable, isn't it? I can't imagine having such a skill. Jade finally walked over to the stove and ladled herself a bowl of stew. Was he able to teach you? I sat, my empty bowl down, and rubbed my hands over my thighs. Being in a confined space with everyone's eyes on me was something I was barely getting used to when it was just the six of us, but five sets of eyes had become eight. Elle watched me, more than amused that I had taken her place in the hot seat. No, I said. My grandfather didn't get to teach me much of anything. Not that I retained, anyway. My mother died giving birth to my sister, and my dad moved me to Anchorage, where he was from. I didn't learn much after I turned nine. Jade clicked her tongue and sighed. I'm sorry to hear that. I still fish with willow branches from time to time, though, just like she taught me. And I can build a screaming fire. I winked at her and smiled, proud of what I could do. Both are important skills if you want to live in the wild land. Dell said. Lord knows I had a thing or two to learn when I decided to stay out here. Hell, I'm still learning. The wood in the stove crackled. Bo and Theo whispered as they played with the salt shaker at the table, as if no one could see. Then, howling punctuated the silence again. Maybe they want the meat in the smokehouse, Alex said, wiping his mouth with the back of his arm. Jade handed him her napkin. Maybe it's never been an issue before, 
Dell said. Cottonwood has a strong odor to most animals, he shrugged. Coda will alert us if they get too close. Dell was good at playing off the wolves, but I knew he couldn't dismiss them so easily. Jade shook her head, her smoky-colored eyes wary and fixed on me. You said yourself everything was different now. The animals, could they have gotten sick? I hadn't thought so, but no, I'm not so sure. I sighed, uncertain what to think anymore. It's possible, Sophie said, peering into her empty bowl. That textbook you brought back, Jackson, listed a bunch of animals that can be infected by the avian flu, bird and mammal species. Dell, Jade whispered. Should we put Coda in the garden shed for the night? He nodded. If it will make you feel better, we will, just to be safe. We can make sure the kennel is reinforced before we leave. It shouldn't be more than a day or two. I was going to take Alex out tomorrow and see if we can find a vehicle in Tetlin or one of the communities along the highway. We can work on a long-term solution for the kennel when we get back. Actually, Jade said, glancing around at all of us, I was thinking you could stay here a while longer, for a couple weeks at least, until Elle heals up a bit more and the roads are a bit safer. She looked pointedly at Elle. It will give you all some time to get your things in order, find another truck and whatever you need for your trip. Elle's eyebrows shot up. Then she looked at me. It was a good idea. In fact, I was relieved they'd offered. It meant we didn't have to rush to get back on the road and we could offer our help to them for all they'd already done for us. That's really generous of you, Elle began. I insist. Jade stood up from the couch and patted me on the shoulder. You all could use this time to regroup and rest. She walked over to the stove and set her bowl in the wash tub. We could use the company, Dell admitted. He leaned forward, swallowing the last of his soup as he glanced between Jade and me. And the distraction. Jade hummed as she filled the wash tub with melted snow water. I glanced at Took, uncertain what he thought about all of this. Well, he said, impatient. If grumpy old Took was on board, I didn't have any reservations. I met Elle's gaze, though it wasn't as relieved as I'd thought it would be. When she realized everyone was waiting for an answer, she smiled. Yes, of course. Bo and Thea shouted, Yay! But I knew Elle's smiles, and while hers was big and wide, it was reluctant, too. It's very nice of you to offer. Thank you. She gathered the kids' bowls to stack on top of hers. Great. Dell sat back into the couch and crossed his legs with a smile. We'll have to get some fish while you're here. Maybe show the kids what it used to be like growing up out here before everything was at your fingertips. Used to be at your fingertips, Alex muttered and stretched as he stood. Then he went to help Jade with the dishes. Fishing would be great. It was a pastime I rarely had time for, even before the virus, and something that always brought me a sense of peace. It would be a nice break from all the planning and preparing for a while. Fishing after hunting, Took groused. That herd is on the move. They will be gone soon, and we could use more caribou. Yes, after, Dell agreed. Elle walked past me, biting her bottom lip. I gently grabbed her hand as she passed. Hey, are you sure it's okay? I whispered. Elle's eyes darted to mine and then to my hand on hers. She pulled her fingers from mine with just enough urgency to send a message loud and clear. Yes, it's fine. She flashed another false smile, fisting her hand at her side, then sidestepped me and headed to the wash tub. Somehow, I'd crossed a line, and her withdrawal left an unexpected pang of hurt in its wake followed by a hearty dose of guilt for caring. 46. L. April 14th. Time for chores, Jade called as she stepped out of the house, a smile lighting her eyes. The kids and I finished donning our outdoor clothes as she slung a twenty-two over her shoulder. It was small, but packed a mean enough punch to scare any unwanted, four-legged visitors away. Being naked of my own gun, I was relieved. 
Can't we go hunting with Jackson and Dell? They probably haven't gone very far, Bo pleaded, eyeing her rifle. Alex let me drive the snowmobile in Slana. I could take us there. My eyes widened. He did, did he? Jade chuckled. No hunting today, Bo. She opened Coda's kennel so he could run free. His barking resounded through the air, and the grouse cackled and flit with whistling wings from their sunbathing beneath the trees. Besides, Jade continued, we have something far more important to do today, and it doesn't require us leaving our own backyard. She winked at me. We're collecting wood. Now, she clapped her hands. Who's pulling the sled? It needs to be someone strong and- I can do it, Bo said, trotting over to the sled leaning against the side of the cabin. We'd used it so many times, dragging it over branches and rocks, I was grateful it hadn't cracked and was still in one piece. Thea, you can wrangle Coda in, she said, handing her a leash. Okay, she chirped. The kids were more than happy to stay with the Ranskins for a while longer. I was less content, however, even if I knew it was irrational. Staying with them had the best possible outcome, but it made me uneasy knowing there was still so much they didn't understand about us. My fire was coming back, and while Sophie kept her distance when she could, it was only a matter of time until someone started to take it personally. Now, do you see that patch of trees up there on the hill? Jade pointed to the dense horizon. That's where we're going. Keep a sharp eye out for lynx and wolverines. They like to hang out around here because of the hares, and we don't want any trouble. Okay, the kids said in unison, as if wolverines and lynx were akin to raccoons and other everyday backyard critters. Lead the way, Jade flung out her hand like she was releasing the greyhounds, and happily, Bo and Thea made their way up the hill, hunting with the grown-ups forgotten, for now. They struggled through the deep snow, but I reveled in the imminent exhaustion our morning excursion would bring. Coda barked and hopped through the snow with Thea, happy to be out of his kennel and part of the commotion. I took in the wild landscape, sparkling whites and midnight greens against a cloudless blue sky. The world was pristine in the sunlight, reminding me how small we were once again. I made a valiant effort not to move my arm as much as we hiked up the hill, each step sending a twinge of pain through my side. Sophie could know things about people, and I could turn to flame, but aside from the men in Slana with evil hearts, I wondered what else people could do. Was there someone out there who could heal themselves? That would come in handy. My burning energy had saved my life twice, but what other abilities did people have? They couldn't all be bad. Which powers were people using for good? Do you think there are colonies of people banding together? I looked at Jade, who seemed to see the good and hopeful in all things. For all we know, the lower 48 are up and running, and we're still up north, clueless. One day, I half expect a helicopter to fly overhead, and I'll feel that grand sense of relief that it's all over. Do you think? I shook my head, regretfully. No, I don't. It's already been four months. I feel a sense of hopelessness in my bones, knowing that if it was going to happen, it would have already. You never know, Jade said, as she scanned the wooded hillside for dangers. The world might surprise you. And yes, I think there are other survivors banding together. It's the human way, caring for and helping one another. Don't let a few bad eggs make you lose hope. Jade and I continued the rest of the trek in silence, listening to Bo and Thea chatter about the squirrels and hares that had left footprints in the snow. Why can't we see any? Thea tossed a stick for Coda to retrieve, though it didn't make it more than a few feet. Her nose and cheeks were rosy, and her braids bounced against her puffy jacket with each perky step. She jumped on a pair of tiny footprints. Hey, genius, it might be because you're scaring them away with all your talking and jumping, Bo told her. Plus, we look like aliens to them. And we're big, she added. Bo looked down at her. You're not big. 
Yaha, she retorted, puffing her chest out and glaring at him. Jade sighed. Is it strange that I enjoy hearing them bicker? Not at all, I said with a chuckle. It helps things feel normal. No bickering now, Jade called, though her voice was light with amusement. It's just up here. She began to walk more quickly. The winds are stronger on the hill, she explained, pointing to the split branches and broken twigs covering the ground. They break easily under the weight of the snow, since they're frozen deep down to the core. There was an awe in Jade's voice I admired, a sense of wonder that captivated me when she spoke. I wanted to soak up every bit of knowledge she had and be just like her one day, centered and confident. I wanted to be content. Now, Jade said, these, she picked up a thick white stick. These are birch branches, good for burning. Those are the ones we want, all shapes and sizes, as long as we can pull them down the hill. Got it? What about these? Thea asked, lifting up a wispy, needle-covered twig. That's a spruce. We can use the big branches for building. It's hard wood and strong, good for hanging poles in the smokehouse and in the skinning shed, but not for burning. We'll come back for those when we have more help, okay? Everything Jade knew from living in the wild was like liquid gold. We needed every ounce if we would make it in a world without noise to stave predators away, without factories to make our clothes or the materials for our homes. We would need to relearn the ways of the past to make it in the future. Let's make sure we remember what Jade's telling us, I told them, and ask a lot of questions if we have them. We can teach Sophie, Alex, and Jackson when they get back, and Sophie can put them in her book. Okay, Bo said, scouring the thick snow beneath the shelter of the trees. Coda barked at a ptarmigan, white and hidden in the snow, and sniffed fox trails that looped through the woods, disappearing deeper inside. We gathered branch after branch, Bo and Thea making it a timed game to see who could collect more wood the fastest, and we were done before too much time had passed. Okay. I think we need to be done, I told them. I wasn't sure we could make it down the hill without some of them sliding off as it was. The load is looking pretty heavy. Here, Thea said, adding more tinder to the top of the pile. Jade brushed her gloves off on her pants and peered up at the sky as the clouds moved in front of the sun. Elle's right. We should head back and see if we can get a nice warm fire going in the cabin and something to eat. I wiped my brow with my forearm. I was wearing a long sleeve shirt, but had only worn a tank top underneath to help keep my body temperature down. It wasn't working. Plus, we've still got wood to pile up before the sun goes down, I added. Let's head back, so I can strip down. Jade nodded and picked up her discarded 22. Oh, look, Thea, this is a perfect sized walking stick for you. Jade picked up a scraggly birch branch and broke off the pointed, wispy end. It's as tall as me, Thea mused, standing up beside it. With a final measure of approval, Thea followed Jade down the hill, stick jabbing through the snow with each step. Ready? I glanced over my shoulder, waiting for Bo to grab the sled rope, but I lost my voice before I could say his name. He stood a few yards behind me, the black wolf from last night pensive in the sea of trees, staring at him once again. Bo, I breathed, slowly reaching for my pistol, but it wasn't on my belt. I looked behind me, afraid to call out for Jade already halfway down the hill, completely unaware. I wanted to scream for her, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. Amidst the desperation that tightened every muscle and the terror of uncertainty, Something kept my feet from moving and my mouth from opening. The wolf stood as it had the night before, its head down and its yellow eyes fixated on Bo. A voice screamed at me to pick up branches and scream and shout at the wolf to go away. But Fire El, the part of me who knew impossible things were happening all around us, knew Bo was safe. They were ten times stronger than Bo and just as tall, yet they hadn't hurt any of us yet. Curiosity overwhelmed my instinct to be afraid. 
the wolf sniffed the ground, its eyes fixed on Bo. Their silent stare down dragged on until a few thrashing heartbeats later, the wolf blinked and looked away as if it was satisfied and took a step closer. Fear won out, and I took a slight step closer. Bo, I said flatly, reaching out my hand. Neither he nor the wolf seemed to notice I was there, let alone register that I'd spoken. Bo, give me your hand, I told him. Now. Finally, Bo looked up at me, but he just stared at my hand. Bo, I warned and wiggled my fingers. Come on, take my hand, please. Obediently, he stepped closer and linked his hand with mine. She won't hurt me. His voice quivered a little, but I wasn't sure if he was sad for having to leave or a little scared. Maybe not, but that's plenty close enough for one day. The wolf brought its head up, watching me so close I wondered if I'd made the wrong choice. A gunshot pierced the air, and the wolf fled back into the woods. I couldn't move at first, my heart pounding like a hammer, staking me into the ground where I stood. My hands began to shake as I realized how horribly that could have ended. I glanced back at Jade, the twenty-two at her side. Let's go home, she said, her chest heaving. I saw the fear in her eyes and the bewilderment. Coda! she shouted, running a hand through her hair as she turned to head back down the hill again. Coda ran out of the trees, trotting up behind her with his tongue hanging out of his mouth and his tail wagging. What are you good for anyway? She groused and leaned down to pat his side. I took Bo's hand in mine again, gripping it as hard as I could to keep the tremors from worsening. She won't hurt you either, Bo said quietly, and I looked down at him. How, how could you possibly know that? He shrugged and picked up the rope to the sled. I just do. 47, Jackson, April 14th. Brittle winter ravaged brush crunched under our feet as we made our way toward a rocky knoll. There was no trail to follow just Dell's photographic memory from years of hunting the land. We'd tracked the caribou and needed a bird's eye view for a proper shot. Although we'd had many target practices over the past several months, none of us had done any hunting. Where are the caribou going? Sophie asked a few steps ahead of me. Dell said they're heading for their calving spots, Alex said, shoving a piece of jerky in his mouth. Does that stuff line your pockets or something? I joked. The kid never seemed to leave camp without it. His eyebrows waggled, and he offered me one. Maybe. This is some of the stuff Took made. You want some? You mean the stuff he won't stop bragging about? Sure, why not? Alex grabbed another chunk out of his pocket, picked off a piece of lint, and handed it to me. Thanks. I tore off a bite and pulled my rifle strap further up my shoulder. I eyed the moose jerky as I gnawed on it. It was smoky, but not too over the top that it tasted like a campfire. I shrugged, pleasantly surprised. Not too bad. Shouldn't there be more of them then? Sophie asked and peered out at the small herd in the distance. I thought the point of having so many members of a herd was to protect themselves and their young. The more bodies and movement, the more confusing it is for their predators. Woodland caribou are more solitary, Soph. My attention was half focused on Dell as he brought the binoculars to his eyes. And they're more predictable, which makes them easier targets for poachers and trophy hunters. You don't like hunters, then? She asked. I don't like people who break the law for a rack they can hang on the wall and then leave the rest to waste. Well, we won't be doing any of that, Dell said from a couple yards ahead, and he waved us onward. If we're lucky, you'll have an entire caribou to take with you to Whitehorse. He pointed to a patch of woods on the other side of the clearing. There's likely another small herd over there, if history is anything to go by. I've seen them there a few times. Dell glanced back the way we came. Since we have the two snowmobiles, we can take back double the load. We may not get another chance before they're gone. Dell wasn't one to be overly emotional, sad, excited, or otherwise. 
at least not that I'd seen in the few days of knowing him. But he was glad we were there. You could tell with each lively step and hear the smile in his voice. Part of him missed civilization, and while I wouldn't claim we were high society, we were new faces and animated conversation, and I was glad we could give that to him. He peered up at the sun, then appraised the herd, lying around about half a mile out. These guys will be on the move after the first shot, then we'll be on the hunt again and we're wasting daylight. He nodded toward a rocky bluff ahead with a few evergreens scattered around it. It's as good a place as any, he said. Careful, though. The boulders are slippery. He stepped over one and pointed to a dozen tiny dots across the field. Bulls only. It's hard to tell, so look for big, wide racks. You said big racks, Alex snickered, and Sophie rolled her eyes. Wow, real mature, she chided. The three of us followed Dell up the knoll, our dusky jackets resembling rocks from a distance, and the caribou couldn't smell us downwind. It was our first hunting trip, and even if we shot nothing, I'd still feel proud. Of all of us, though, Sophie seemed the most excited, and I was glad to see her spark was back and that she was interested in being a part of the team again. Are you ready for this? Alex looked at Sophie as we reached the top. Dell offered her his hand as she made the final climb and she shook her head. I'm fine, thanks. She smiled and stared out at the herd. But I am ready for hunting. It's been a while since I practiced my aim, but I'm as ready as I'll get. Well then, you're up, Dell said, crouching behind the boulder as he peered through the scope on his rifle. There's no pressure, self. Alex handed her his rifle. In fact, if you don't get anything, it will make me look better when I go next, he grinned. So, please, feel free to miss. I crouched down, out of the way to watch and wait. Do you remember what I told you, Soph? Safety on until I'm settled, and keep my finger off the trigger until I'm ready to shoot. She glanced at me. It's hitting the target I'm more concerned about. It's all a learning experience, Dell said. From bullet to bowl, today's the day you learn how to kill, dress, and store your meat. He said eagerly and rubbed his hands together excitedly. I imagined he and Jed enjoyed hunting together, and I wondered what it would be like after we left. Took and Dell at it again, only we wouldn't be around to distract them from the void Jet left in their lives. Now, get into position, he told Sophie. They're moving around a lot, so you might have to wait for a good shot. She propped the rifle on the top of a boulder and peered through the scope. Alex grinned and plopped down on the ground beside me. She's totally going to get one and show me up, just to spite me. You and me both, I guessed. Dell lifted his binoculars and studied the herd again. I see a few bulls to the right. Can you see them? She grunted and quirked her mouth in concentration. Yeah, I think so. The shot's yours when you're ready, Sophie. Anywhere behind the shoulder blade. Dell watched the herd as she finished settling in. She fidgeted with the rifle, trying to find a comfort zone. Then... She took a deep breath and licked her lips. I waited with bated breath until she pressed the trigger. The shot cracked through the stillness, and the herd startled. I'll be damned, girl! You got him! Dell shouted, and the caribou Sophie shot wavered and fell into the snowfield. We're on the move, gang! Dell shouted joyously. Grabbing his gun, he headed down the knoll to the snowmobiles. Great shot, Soph! Alex said and he reached down to help her to her feet. She took his hand with a triumphant grin, but as she stood, she yanked her hand back again, causing Alex to stumble into a boulder and shout with pain as he slipped and landed on a rock. What the hell, Sophie? He growled, wincing as he climbed back up to his feet. I reached for him to offer some leverage. Alex grabbed hold of my forearm and heaved out a breath. Sophie clamped her hand over her mouth, eyes wide and head shaking. Alex snatched his gun from her. I'm sorry, she gasped. I didn't mean to do that. Her voice trembled as she glanced from me to Alex. I just, you can't touch me, okay? No one can touch me. He looked at his palm, as if he was registering it. You feel it too, don't you? He realized. Feel what? I asked, glancing between them. The thing I was telling you about. Alex's eyes met Sophie's again, a silent conversation passing between them and he shook his head. 
What do you know, Sophie? What's going on? Why do I feel a wave of uncertainty every time I touch you? I don't know, she whimpered. I don't know what you're feeling. I only know what I feel. Which is what? I asked. Their chest heaved so violently I thought both of them might be on the brink of tears. What the hell is going on? It was fine for a while, she said, mostly to herself. But she looked Alex right in the eyes. Something's wrong with me, ever since Whiteley. Whiteley? I blurted. That was nearly five months ago. Then tell me, what's wrong with you? Alex begged. You're freaking me out, Sophie. Good, because it's fucking scary, she blurted. The charge? I asked, looking at Alex. Is this about the charge you feel around her? I was beyond lost, but it was the only thing I could think to grab hold of. Sophie shook her head and took a step back, like the world was closing in on her and she was going to make a run for it. I know it, all of it, everything you don't want to feel. Sophie looked at me this time. I know it and I can feel it too. The look on her face was one of disgust as she let her hands fall at her sides and paced back and forth. Say that again? I asked. What don't I want you to know? I had no secrets, nothing to hide, nothing that would make her fear me. Your wife, she bleated. Molly. Hannah? Molly? I never told Elle or anyone else my daughter's name, at least not that I could remember. I know how bloody your hands were as you buried her. I can feel what it cost you, the part of you that died that day. I know how much you loved her, how much you still love her, and that it's hard for you to be around us. Stop, I told her. Just, just stop. I ran my fingers through my hair as dizziness set in, and I turned away from her. Sophie knowing anything about my life before was like my flesh had been peeled away, every dark part of me gaping and exposed. How? I breathed, forcing myself to face her. How do you know any of that? Sophie's head shook. Her chin trembled. Her eyes clouded with tears. I, I don't know. I don't know how any of it is possible. We're just different. She looked at Alex. And somehow you feel it too. Alex stepped back like he was petrified of the very thought. No, I don't see that shit. I feel something, but I don't know any of that. I don't want to. Sophie reached for his hand, desperate to show him. Alex's mouth opened in protest, but the words never fell from his lips. The creases in his brow deepened, his lips pinched together, and his eyes shimmered with unshed tears before he had the wherewithal to tear his hand away from her. I gawked at Alex, weighing his reaction, then at Sophie with disbelief. Sophie's words were impossible. What was happening was impossible. It's only when someone touches me, she explained. Except for you, Alex. I feel a connection with you, but I've always shied away from it because I don't want to know more. I don't want to know everything. Dark shadows filled Alex's eyes. Why didn't you say something? At least I would have known I didn't repulse you, she blinked at him, her gaze softening. Why haven't you said anything? This is what you were trying to tell me in the truck. I considered Alex's words and tried to understand how I'd missed so much. Alex shook his head and threw his hands up. I have felt weird touching Sophie and Elle, but I didn't know what it- He looked at Sophie. Wait, is that why Elle wears gloves? Because she feels it too? No, she had them before. It's because of the fire. The what? Alex and I blurted. Sophie glanced between us licking her lips as she took a step back. We're different, she said. But you, she looked directly at me. You should ask her about it. It was like all the knots in my stomach from the past four months twisted together, tighter and tighter, until I couldn't stand it any longer. Elle's had plenty of time to tell me. I ground it out. My hands clenched at my side, and I looked into Sophie's secretive blue eyes. Tell me. Now. Sophie lifted her chin, almost defiantly, and swallowed thickly. She didn't mean to do it, she prefaced. Do what? Why does she wear the damn gloves, Sophie? The men in Slana, she started. 
We shot two of them, but the other burned alive. You're saying her hands are fire? Alex confirmed, barely able to believe it himself. But then recognition widened his eyes and lit his face. So that's what I feel when I touch her. That's impossible. I rasped. It couldn't physically be possible. I'd seen her hands, hadn't I? They were normal, just like everyone else's. The gloves are because of the fire. My mind was screaming at me, telling me this wasn't real. These abilities weren't even possible. And if Elle had known about them, if she could kill a man with her hands, she would have told me. While Alex considered the implications of his touch, all I could think about was why Elle had kept what she could do from me. Did she think I wouldn't believe her? I thought aloud. She'd told me the men in Slana had been dangerous, that survivors were changed, but like this? It wasn't just the men who could do unnatural things. She was different. All three of them were. How long? I met Sophie's gaze, subdued and crestfallen in a way I'd never seen before. How long have you been keeping what you see a secret? It's only gotten worse the last couple months. And Elle? How long has she been hiding this? Sophie's brow furrowed. How long? A while. Alex looked at his hands like he might see flames burst from them. How long is a while? I repeated. I felt it the night I met her at your apartment, Sophie. He paused and shook his head. She touched me and a weird feeling. I thought I was just crazy. That's what we've been worried about. It's why we haven't said anything. Alex's eyes narrowed at a memory. The guy in her house. I can't imagine killing someone with my bare hands. My heartbeat shuddered, and I peered down at Sophie's delicate hands, like one of Alex's electric charges zapped through me. The pieces fell into place. The guy in her house? Elle wasn't just hiding what she could do. She was hiding what she had done. 48. L. April 14th. I sat at the table with Jade, mending the wear and tear in our clothes I'd neglected for months. I turned one of Jackson's wool socks inside out, deciding on a red thread since I didn't have black to match. I tied a knot in the end of the string, only for it to pull its way all the way through the wool, and I groaned. You need a larger knot at the bottom, Jade said peering over the rim of her glasses. She didn't normally wear them, but they suited her. It feels like a cruel joke, I said, staring at the pile of clothes. What's that? She pulled the needle through a tattered quilt she was re-hemming. We'd planned to stock up on clothes before we left, but leaving in such a hurry, we hadn't gotten to it. It's the end of the world, and we could go on the biggest shopping spree of our lives. And yet... Here I am, sewing our holy socks and underwear because we only brought enough to get by. I stared at my thermal tops. Case in point. What I really needed were t-shirts. I wiped the moisture from my brow and glanced at the low-burning fire in the stove the kids huddled beside, whispering. Where did you two sneak off to after chores anyway? Nowhere, they said in unison. I lifted a skeptical eyebrow. Is that so? They'd been conspiratorial since we'd returned. Maybe you should wash that sap off your hands then, I told them. You wouldn't want to leave any evidence. Bo looked at his hands, then at his sister's. Thea, he groaned, and helped her to her feet. They walked over to the wash tub, their whispers fading when they noticed my eyes on them. I hope you haven't been getting into trouble. Took might not take you fishing tomorrow. We didn't do anything, Bo griped. And while part of me wanted to tell him to watch his tone, I couldn't bring myself to do it. After what happened with the wolf, he'd been distracted, and I couldn't blame him. I couldn't stop thinking about it either. It must be nice to have so many people care about you and want to keep you safe, Jade told Bo with a soft chuckle. She winked at me and rose to her feet. Not really, he grumbled. Jade lifted her mug. Care for some tea? 
she offered. Tundra tea with a little honey. I make it from a shrub that grows heavy around here in the spring. I don't make it very strong unless I'm using it for medical reasons, but I've grown to like the taste more over the years. Yes, please, I'd love some. While Jade puttered around in the kitchen, I silently rejoiced, completing the sock mending pile. Jade brought two mugs back to the table and sat one down in front of me. I lifted the mug to my nose and inhaled. I could smell the honey mingling with something unrecognizable, but a bit bitter. So, Jade said, more quietly than before. Her eyes shifted to Bo. Will you tell Jackson about what happened today? Yes, when he gets back. I have a lot to tell him. You're worried? I inhaled like it might make the tension in my chest and shoulders dissipate. I've sort of been stockpiling conversations we need to have. Let's just say he won't be happy with me. I lifted the mug to my mouth and took a sip. It was scorching hot, but I only remotely felt it. I'm talking to him tonight, though. I couldn't put it off any longer. Jackson couldn't put it off any longer. He'd been avoiding me, too. Like Jackson could hear his name on the breeze, the snowmobiles hummed toward the house. The kids jumped to their feet and were out the door before I could tell them to grab their jackets. I set my mug on the table and met Jade's pewter gaze. She smiled reassuringly and squeezed my hand. Whatever it is, you'll be fine. You both only want what's best for the children and each other, so you'll work things out. I nearly snorted a laugh. I'm glad someone has so much faith in me. Jade and I rose to our feet and headed for the door. I'd spent the past few weeks preparing myself for this conversation, and while I was half petrified, another part of me had no energy left to worry about the outcome. When I stepped outside, Alex and Sophie climbed off one mobile, more somber than I'd expected, and Dell climbed off the other. They had two sleds of caribou meat, but there was no Jackson. When Sophie saw me standing on the porch, she glanced furtively away with reddened cheeks. What is it? I asked, stepping off the porch. Did something happen? It wasn't until Alex met my gaze, his eyes darting directly to my hands, that dread began coiling inside me. Jackson knows, Sophie said so quiet, it was almost lost to the sound of the sled being drug across the snow. It was a warning, but I felt relief as the burden of my secret dissolved to nothing. But in realizing Jackson wasn't with them, apprehension settled quickly in its place. He needs space, Alex said over his shoulder. Needing space, I understood, but the questions were whether he was coming back, and if he did, would he stay? 49. Jackson. April 14th. The night I met Elle in Anchorage, I debated whether I should save her life. It went against every fiber in me not to, but I'd seen too much and had expected the worst even as the three men surrounded her. It was a split second of indecision, but I knew I would never forgive myself if I walked away, knowing there was a chance an innocent might die, even if she proved to be as crazy as the rest in the end. Noticing the kids she was trying to protect only helped me pull the trigger. And as she stood over her assaulter's lifeless bodies, shaking but determined not to look away, she compelled me to offer them a safe place to stay. I saw myself in her that night, on the brink of breaking as she sat on that couch. But instead of giving up, she used her fear to bolster her strength. At least that was what I thought I'd seen. After the shock of learning the truth of who she was and what she could do wore off, I questioned everything I thought I knew. I stared into the dark forest as I walked through the snow, drawing closer to the cabin with each step. Elle had been lying from the first night I met her. I didn't blame her for not telling me who she was back then, but I blamed her for hiding it the moment she joined me and for hiding it every day since. As much as I understood her fear, she hadn't even tried to tell me the truth. I felt like an idiot, 
commending her on her quirks and strength, unaware the entire time of the truth. I'd berated myself this whole time for putting her and the kids at risk. While Elle wasn't only capable and strong, she could be deadly if she wanted to be. I rolled my shoulders, willing the tension to disperse as I peered up at the main cabin's chimney, billowing with smoke. Sophie had kept what she could do from all of us, too. I didn't like the fact she was walking around with my memories. Memories no teenager should have to witness, and yet, her silence didn't hurt as much as Elle's did. Across the yard, I saw the light under the skinning shed door and headed toward it, passing the house and determined to keep my hands and mind busy for as long as possible. Jackson. Elle's voice was barely a whisper and I tried to ignore the way my chest ached as I walked past. I'm not talking about this now, I told her, forcing myself to keep walking. I was weak around her, and I hadn't realized how much until tonight. I know you're angry with me, but there's something I need to tell you. There's more, I spun around. Really? She stepped off the porch into the moonlight, her eyes like liquid malachite and shimmering. I felt senseless satisfaction, knowing she was hurting too. Even if I knew Elle wasn't malicious, she'd made a conscious, daily decision not to tell me the truth about what she had done and what she could do. And betrayal stung like a bitch. Jackson, I know I should have told you. I was scared. Scared. You could have fried me with one touch, and you're scared of me? I would never hurt you. You already have. I shouted. She flinched, and her dark hair fell in her face as she took a sudden step back. I already knew my dad was crazy, El. He loved his damn dogs more than me and shot them for God's sake. You knew how crazy I felt as I put the pieces together about what happened to him. That I knew something was wrong and you didn't tell me. I didn't know if you'd believe me. Oh, that's horseshit, I spat. We've been partners in everything. I hated that my voice wavered, that any of this mattered so much. I was supposed to be indifferent, just going through the motions until it was time to part ways, and yet each of her omissions felt like a burning hole in my gut. At least I thought we were. And take those gloves off. They aren't protecting anybody. I shook my head. Her shoulders heaved but so did mine. My face burned like my chest, and I couldn't catch my breath. I hated myself for being angry with her, but I couldn't help it either. The door to the cabin cracked open, and Bo stepped outside. Are you guys okay? He leaned against the porch post, the corners of his mouth pulled down with worry. Elle wiped the tears from her cheek. Yeah, kid. My heart squeezed as I realized whatever world I'd been living in all this time was only a false sense of belonging. We're fine. Unwilling to risk more of a scene, I turned on my heels and headed for the skinning shed. I opened the door and shut myself inside, trying to catch my breath. When I looked up, Took, Dell, Alex, and Sophie were looking at me, their faces brightly lit by the lantern light. Sophie looked away immediately, cheeks reddened. Dell wasn't an idiot. He didn't know what I was upset about exactly, but he knew enough to look at me with a sympathy I didn't want. What's left to do? I pulled my gun strap over my shoulder and leaned it against the wall. Dell held up his knife. We're learning about the best angle for proper precision and the right type of blade. I shrugged my jacket off, tossed it over a pallet of canning jars and stepped closer. Don't stop on my account. Took handed me the knife. I'll let you take over, he said. I need to check on something. Alex pointed to the hind quarter, strung up on a crossbeam, waiting to be taken to the smoker. That one's ours, he said. I'll hang it up. I'll help, Sophie added, and they disappeared before I could say anything. At least the two of them had made amends. Or so it seemed. What are we cutting? I asked peering down at the hunk of meat on the stone top. We're cutting half the steaks into stew bits. It's easier to thaw and more versatile that way. I followed his lead, grateful for a task to focus on. Dell looked at me. Should I even ask? 
Nope. Have it your own way, he muttered. We cut meat slab after meat slab until the steak strips were tied and the stew bits were sealed in jars to go into the underground freezer. We'll get a new block of ice tomorrow while we're ice fishing, before the lake completely melts. That will keep everything cold throughout the summer. Tomorrow. Summer. It all seemed too distant in the future. I needed to get through tonight first. Sounds good. Jackson! I glanced up at the door as it flung open, creaking on its rusty hinges. Elle stood breathless in the doorway. She winced as she handed me the satellite phone. It's Ross. He's trying to reach you. 50. Jackson. April 14th. I grabbed the phone, my hands trembling as I brought it to my ear. Only this time, I wasn't shaking with dread, worried I wouldn't get a response. Ross? I had to force the word out, and I held my breath. Muffled movement was all I heard at first. Jackson? It's damn good to hear your voice. My heart swelled at his familiar timber. You son of a bitch, I rasped. Tears stung my eyes. I hadn't experienced joy in so long, I'd almost forgotten how light and liberating it was. Where the hell have you been? I've tried calling you for months. Where haven't I been? He said dryly. I had to deviate a little. Yeah, no shit. I almost gave up hope. I looked at Dell, forgetting he was standing there. Then I looked at El. She averted her gaze, chewing her bottom lip. Getting too warm in the shed's confinement, I stepped out into the brisk night. I know, brother. It's been a while. I hated to ask, but it seemed insensitive not to. Kelsey? Who? Oh, no. She didn't make it. Who? God only knew what he'd been through since Anchorage, but who? Where are you, Ross? I'm in Fairbanks, he said. I waited for him to say more. What about you? Where have you been? All over the fucking place, I told him. I've been traveling with some people, though. I haven't been alone. Oh, good. Me too. I met a guy here in Fairbanks. While I knew what he'd been through would change us, it was hard to tell if Ross was being intentionally vague, if he was crazy or maybe just broken in so many pieces he'd never be the Ross I remembered. Either way, I was beginning to worry. Is everything okay? He chuckled. <laughs> Not at all. Are you? I'm serious. Where the fuck have you been? I felt like a broken record, but as the sleepless nights and discoveries of the day set in, all I felt was relief. Ross was alive. I thought you were dead. I know, Jackson. Shit. I'm sorry, brother. It's a long story. Nothing I can get into now, but I promise, I will tell you everything. Ross was true to his word, always, and my gut told me that while I felt sick to my stomach for a dozen reasons, I knew I could trust him. So I did. Are we still meeting somewhere? White Horse, I told him. I'm in St. Elias territory, though. I'll head to the Midnight Sun Lodge as soon as I can. I can probably be there in a week. Great, that gives me time to fuel up and get the truck ready. You're still in the work truck? He laughed. That thing has saved my life a few times, he said. You weren't exaggerating when you said people were fucking bonkers. I could only imagine what he'd come across in Fairbanks. I'm just glad you're breathing, I told him. It was all I'd wanted after radio silence for so long. Back at you, brother. I'll call you when we're ready to leave. Deal? Same. It was silent as Ross breathed into the phone, and I wondered what else there was to say. It felt like there should have been a thousand things, but knowing he was alive was enough. For now. Hey, Jackson. Ross said, tentative. Yeah? Stay safe, my man. You too, Ross. After another hesitant pause, he ended the call. I stared at the phone in my hand. It had been practically glued to me since Anchorage, but his calls never came. There had been a hollowness I carried, 
a void of every life I cared about being taken. But knowing Ross was alive was like a brimming bowl of sustenance I needed at the perfect moment. Ross sounded different, but I was different too. Bottom line, I would get to see him after all these months of thinking he was dead. Tears burned my eyes. Exhaustion solidified. For the first time in months, all I wanted to do was sleep. 51. L. April 15th. Jackson didn't want to talk to me, but his anger toward me and what I had done aside, he needed to. Everyone knew he'd finally found Ross, and it was only a matter of time before he would leave. Jackson had found his friend. There was no reason for him to wait around with us any longer. But we needed to know when he was leaving. He still didn't know about Bo and the wolf either, but maybe he wouldn't care either way. He'd been gone all night, and while I didn't blame him for needing his space, it was morning, and I needed him to think about the kids. Heart in my throat, I walked over to the side of the Tacoma, where he sorted through the supplies brought in from the road. I'd already organized them and taken inventory, but I wouldn't stop him from his maniacal searching. He glanced up as I approached, squinting in the sunlight. Have you seen the fishing line? He asked, lifting the lid to the hunting bin. That he acknowledged me at all was a good sign. It's in the craft box. He glowered. The craft box? I nodded to the bin beneath the camping supplies behind him. It's more of a junk drawer, but you'll find a spool in there. He lifted one bin off the other and began rifling through rubber bands and zip ties, the miniature sewing kit and safety pins. I know you don't want to talk, I said, straightening my shoulders. And that's fine, but the kids... The kids what? He found the spool and clicked the lid back onto the box and put it into the truck bed. They know you talked to Ross last night, and they're worried. He flipped open a toolbox. Why would the kids be worried? He seemed almost indifferent to my standing there as he fingered through the nuts and bolts. I crossed my arms over my chest, feeling my side twinge, but it was bearable. Are you going to leave? That was always the plan. He pulled out a drawer, didn't see what he needed, then shut it, opened another drawer and shut it just as quickly. What are you looking for? Maybe I can help you. The sharpening stone. It's with the box cutter and the scissors in the do not touch bin. He continued to move the bins around. Jackson, would you? I reached for his arm, determined to make him stop for a single second to look at me. He paused, eyes fixed on my hand gripping his bicep, so I let it fall away. It wasn't fear in his eyes, even if he'd said I was dangerous. It was something much more distant. You can be mad at me, but that's not what this is about. He straightened and turned to face me fully. For the first time since I'd known him, it felt like he was looming over me, almost threatening. Somehow, his reserve was much more fearsome than his shouting at me last night, and I felt uncomfortable under his scrutiny. I shoved my hands in my back pockets. They care about you, I said, my voice barely a whisper. They think you will leave them. Pain creased the corner of his eyes before he glanced away. I'm not leaving yet, he said, staring at the cabin. Will you talk to them? Sophie feels responsible and she knows you're angry. I'm not angry, he said, though I knew it was a lie. Will you tell her that? She thinks I'm only saying it to make her feel better. Yeah, I'll talk to her, he said. And I'll talk to Thea and Bo while we're at the lake. My eyes widened. You're still going? Jackson's gaze hardened. Why wouldn't we? I opened my mouth but couldn't find the words. I was uncertain what to think anymore. I don't know. I guess I thought you might decide. To what? Blow them off? Like suddenly I don't care about them? His jaw clenched. Glad to know you think so highly of me. 
I... I didn't like this indifferent side of him, like the old Jackson was back and he was distancing himself from me again. I didn't mean that. My not telling you wasn't because I don't trust you. Wasn't it, Elle? He spoke the words so easily, I questioned for a split second if they were true. No, it wasn't. I wanted to tell you, I told him shakily. But you wanted my help more and thought I'd leave. There was no anger in his voice, barely any emotion at all, just simple facts. At first, maybe, but it got more complicated than that. He grabbed his toolbox, like he was finished talking to me. I don't blame you for being angry. I told you, L. I'm not angry. Well, maybe you should be, I shouted, then clamped my mouth shut. What the hell do you want from me, L? He took a step closer, his hazel eyes fierce in the sunlight. Do you want me to shout at you? Do you want me to tell you that it's all bullshit because you had months to tell me and you chose not to? And you know what? He stared down at my gloved hands. I would have rather had him lash into me, like he just needed to get it out of his system and then things could go back to the way they were, rather than have him stare at my gloved hands in silence, like they disgusted him. I didn't ask for this, I told him, almost a plea for him to understand. He might not want to talk about it anymore, but I did. I woke up one day to a man in my house who was trying to kill me. I thought I was going to die, and then a horrifying, miraculous thing happened. The tears welled in my eyes, and I tried to blink them away. You can judge me for not telling you what I did to your father, and you can be angry for my not telling you what I can do, but you can't be angry at me because of what I can do. L. Just listen, please, I begged. I didn't tell you what I did when we met because it seemed impossible, and you would think I was crazy like the rest. I worried I was crazy. And you're right. I was scared with four kids and I needed your help to keep them safe. But I kept it a secret because I didn't want to hurt you and I don't want to lose you. I wiped the tears from my cheeks and took a step back. Something crazy is happening, Jackson. Something I don't understand and it's not just me. Bo and Sophie. I shoved my hands into my pockets. They're scared. I just hope you can find the time to say goodbye before you disappear. Having said enough, I turned back for the cabin. If Jackson was the man I thought he was, he'd make things right with them before he left. If he wasn't, then the five of us were back where we started, scared and determined, and we'd figure it out on our own. 52. Sophie. April 15th. They say an old soul is a person who has the knowledge and wisdom of someone much older than they are. The only person who ever told me I was an old soul was an elderly woman in my building who mistook me for Holly Lynch, a girl who hadn't lived on my floor for over 10 years, or so I was later told. But watching Elle and Jackson argue with each other made me feel like an old soul. It was weird, and not because it felt like they were a mix between pseudo-parents and older siblings to me. It was because it felt like I knew both of them better than they knew themselves sometimes. I didn't know what they were feeling and thinking all the time or anything like that. My power didn't work that way. But I'd learned plenty about them since all this craziness started, stuff I don't think even they were aware of. Being only 18, I wasn't supposed to know those types of things. A person was supposed to accumulate knowledge over the years and gain wisdom in their old age through experience. Instead, it was like reading sections of a biography in a single touch, absorbed into a photographic memory complete with live action, color, and all the feels. Good or bad, each glimpse became part of the library, 
all because I let someone pat my shoulder or because one of them would grab my hand when I wasn't expecting it and there was a spark of connection. When it happened and what I saw were out of my control. Stretching my legs out on the porch step, I stared at the skinning shack across the yard where Alex and I played Butcher the Caribou last night. I'd hunted. I'd shot an animal. I hadn't seen that one coming. I was the pale girl with weak hips and twisted ankles, who had to wear leg braces most of her childhood so that her mother's image of perfection wasn't shattered and it would keep the bullies at bay. The day I'd gotten sick, I was worried about teen pregnancy. Now, I was learning how to live off the land like Swiss Family Robinson. Six survivors living in a wild world wrought with dangers. Day one of surviving together had been awkward. Week one had been eye-opening, to say the least. Week two, I'd finally bought into the dynamic of staying together. Love them or hate them, and everything else was history. The difference was everyone only saw Sophie Collins, the strange, delicate girl who needed extra care and acted crazy sometimes. Yet when I thought of Elle, Jackson, and Alex, it felt like I'd known them a lifetime. There wasn't a TMI switch I could shut off when I was on overload, and those were the days I wanted to disappear in a dark cave and hide forever. The door to our cabin opened, and Alex stepped out onto the porch. He'd been avoiding me, which I knew would happen. I thought you'd be out doing whatever you do when you're not hanging with the kids, he said. Yeah, well, there's no reason to hide anymore. The cat was out of the bag. I lifted up the science book that Jackson had gotten for me. Besides, I've been doing some light reading, I told him. Alex crouched down beside me, a waft of wood smoke filling my nose. You could have told me, Soph, he said softly. I wouldn't have thought you were crazy. While his voice was gentle for reassurance, he still sat three feet away from me. He wouldn't? I knew enough about him and his character to know there were a hundred things he'd never want me to know. Like the first time he was with a girl, and how incredibly awkward it had been. What life was like with his real family before his dad died, and the guilt he carried because of it ever since. I would rather have known why you were keeping your distance than assumed the worst. I looked at him, right into his beautiful green eyes. Are you sure about that? You're not so much an open book as you like people to think you are. I know you hate me knowing things about you. He didn't bother denying it. Besides, I told him, I already feel crazy enough. I didn't want you, of all people, acting weird around me, or for you to look at me differently. Alex had been an unexpected gift since the day I'd met him, even before our entire apartment building was infected with the virus. I hadn't known him 12 hours, and he'd saved my life in more ways than one. I might not like you to know, but it doesn't change anything. His voice was like a lure that hooked me and pulled me out of whatever fog I sometimes found myself in. And it also sounded like he meant it, but as my superpower strengthened, so would his discomfort. Maybe not, I said, but Alex had never had a sense of place, and I knew the minute I'd felt his first memories of his family, that he'd push me away if I got too close to his truth. Did you have a girlfriend? Before, I mean. I stared down at my broken nails, jagged and dirty. I'd come a long way from the mayor's groomed and picture-perfect daughter. If my mother could see me now. Alex smiled. No. Why? Are you interested? His eyebrows danced at the insinuation. No, of course not, I said too quickly. That would be weird, right? I tried to laugh it off. Yeah, I guess, he said. But he didn't laugh with me, especially since you've been pushing me away the past few months. Besides, all-knowing wizard that you are, 
Wouldn't you already know if I'd had a girlfriend? I shrugged. No, not unless I made a habit of touching you. I've kept my distance from everyone for a reason, remember? Why do you ask, seriously? Oh, because, I drawled. I wanted to know what she was like. In December, I had a subpar boyfriend and was on the brink of an emotional breakdown. And that was before the virus. After was even worse. Alex had been my rock, and he'd seen me at my absolute worst. Weak and desperate and grieving for my dead parents. Even though I knew he felt something for me, I didn't want Alex to want me because I was a girl he liked to save. I wanted him to like me because I was strong and useful and came with a TNT flammable label, not fragile, handle with care. What sort of stuff do you know? He asked, and I felt my face flush as I scooted around to face him, one leg crossed over my lap. He wasn't asking about Elle and Jackson. Everyone had dark pasts. What I know changes nothing, not how I feel about you, Elle, or Jackson. I wanted to give him a dozen reassurances, but I didn't. It wouldn't do any good if I did. So, what did I tell him, if not the full truth? I knew he had burn marks on his arms from his mother. I knew the hairline scar on his right temple was from being bullied when he was little, because he was poor. I knew what his stepdad did to him the day he died. Random stuff, I said instead. And it was true. I saw whatever people were feeling in the moment, and the memories that linked to it in one way or another. Personal stuff, I added. The emotions were the worst part. The happy ones tended to fade, just like optimism on a shitty day. The bad ones clung like weights, and I assumed because they were so much stronger with all the anxiety and doubt everyone felt all the time now. But like, what, exactly? My favorite color? The first time I smoked weed in middle school? Or like, the crazy shit? He knew it was more than colors and rap sheets, but if I didn't tell him something, the curiosity would eat away at him. I know you always marked other on intake forms instead of Hispanic because you don't know who your real dad was, I told him. And I know that you've always wondered if you had any siblings. And I know why you bought me that pregnancy test the first day we met. The amusement dulled in his eyes and he pursed his lips. I won't tell anyone, I promised. Even if Alex didn't like my knowing things, he knew he could trust me. His face softened. I know, Soph. We stared at each other for a few long seconds. The cool morning breeze was refreshing against my warming skin. What about you? I asked, glad I wasn't the only screwed up one. What have you seen? Yesterday was the first time, he said. You were worried your hair was out of place. I pretended to throw the textbook at him. Shut up, that's not what I worry about. He grinned. Sometimes you do, he said with a smirk. Admit it. Well, I don't want to look like a bush woman. His smile was infectious, and I laughed. Stop staring at me. I can't help it. Now it's all I could think about. Sophie, the Alaskan bush woman. I rolled my eyes. I'm glad to see you're having so much fun with this. I'm only playing. That's not what I saw. His voice sobered, and his eyes glazed over like he was standing on that rocky knoll again, eyes wide and terrified. I saw Elle and that man in Slana. Not the whole thing, but bursts of images, and I could feel her power. Though, I wasn't sure if it was actually hers or your perception of her. Could have been both, I guess. It was hard to discern my emotions from others sometimes, because my reactions to theirs were often similar. Alex let out a breath and leaned back against the porch post, and he laughed and dragged his fingers over his head. This is so crazy. 
We're talking about this shit like it's normal. Yeah, trust me. It feels anything but normal. He shrugged. It's that or freak the fuck out. And that was probably one of the most real things Alex had said to me, even if he thought he'd meant all the rest. I looked at him, studying the verdant depths of his eyes. What? Has anyone ever told you you're an old soul? Oh boy, now we're getting too deep, he teased, jumping to his feet. Come on, let's go get some breakfast. My treat. Oh, a granola bar. Lucky me. 53. Jackson. April 15th. I've never fished before, Thea said, peering out the window of the truck. I glanced at her in the mirror, then at Bo. While Thea talked enough for the three of us, Bo seemed even more out of sorts than usual. Well, hopefully you'll have fun, I told her. I enjoyed fishing when I was your age. I hadn't iced fished in years, but soon the ice would melt completely and they might miss their chance to learn. Bo was quiet in the back. He stared out the window, his mind somewhere else. How about you, Bo? Are you excited to try fishing for the first time? I went once with my dad, he mumbled. Good, maybe you can teach me. I'm a little rusty. He leaned back in his seat, his head bouncing as we drove through the woods. The plow came in handy, creating roads that would be easier for us to follow on our way back. What's eating at you, kid? He met my gaze in the mirror. Are you and L still fighting? I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> We're not fighting. We just disagree on some things. It sounded like you were fighting. He said, is it because of me? No, but we aren't fighting because of you or anyone else. Elle hadn't told me what was going on with Bo, but then things had escalated quickly and there hadn't really been an opportunity for that. Why would we be fighting about you, Bo? She doesn't like the wolves. What do you mean? He sighed. She thinks they're dangerous and doesn't want me around them. They're really nice, Thea chirped. I like the black one the best. Bo smacked Thea on the arm and glared at her. Hey, no hitting, I chided. Bo crossed his arms over his chest. You have such a big mouth, he muttered, glaring at her. Nuh-uh. Bo rolled his eyes. Whatever. As Thea's words sank in, I tapped on the brakes, bringing the truck to a stop. Then. I turned around in my seat. You've been playing with the wolves? I wasn't sure why I was surprised. Bo had been pushing his luck with them for weeks. They won't hurt me, he grumbled, just like I had done when I was a pissed off and defiant at his age. Bo, they're wild animals, I pointed to Thea. What about your sister? They aren't pets. You guys could get hurt. You don't understand, he growled. How come Elle can use her power, but I can't use mine? Your power? I didn't even know how to answer his questions. Yeah, Elle killed that guy with her bare hands, and she's not in trouble. Elle did what she had to do to save you, I reminded him. She didn't want to hurt those men. Well, I know the wolves won't hurt me either. It's like the same thing. The image of a wolf mauling Bo made my stomach flip-flop and the hair on the back of my arms stand on end. How do you know they won't hurt you, Bo? I just do, he said, voice sharp with impatience. Why won't you guys trust me? I'm sorry, kid. Wolves aren't particularly cuddly animals. They're not pets. Well, mine are. Mine? I rubbed my forehead and continued down the trail left by the snowmobile. Things were getting weirder by the hour, and I didn't know how to navigate questions about how baby caribou were born, let alone superpowers. Does Elle know you've been playing with them? He met my gaze again and regrettably shook his head. I'll tell you what. I started, grasping at straws. Tonight, 
We'll talk about it, okay? All of us, together. We'll figure out what's going on, and we'll get some ground rules in place. But until then, no more playing with the wolves, okay? I brought the truck to a stop near the water's edge, where Took and Dell had their snowmobile parked. Then I turned around to face him. Bo, do we have a deal? Reluctantly, he nodded. If you promise, I'll take you hunting before I leave. His brow furrowed. What, suddenly you don't want to go hunting anymore? I do, he said. But when are you leaving? My throat constricted, and I hated that it was becoming so difficult to talk about. Soon, I admitted. But not for a few days, at least. I'll take you hunting before I go, okay? Bo nodded, but his heart wasn't in it, and I felt the excitement of the day officially dampened. Do you guys even want to fish anymore? I do, Thea chirped, and she flung open the door. I looked at Bo, praying we could salvage what was left of the late morning. Fishing was supposed to be a fun trip, but I hadn't expected I'd have to address superpowers, wolves, and Lady fucking Phoenix, too. You don't have to, I told him. Bo stared at me for a few heartbeats. I still want to fish, he said. He climbed out of the back seat and shut the door. I watched as he and Thea ran over to Took and Dell, unloading their things from the sled. Nothing was easy anymore. Everything that was supposed to be good was complicated. Everything that was meant to be easy was problematic. The plan had been the same since day one, and suddenly I had a fraying knot in the center of my stomach, telling me it was wrong to leave. My best friend was alive, and I should be more ecstatic. Elle killed my dad, which shouldn't have felt okay, but I was glad she did. He would have killed her instead, and I would have never known her or the kids. They'd never have been a part of my life. I wanted to be angry at Elle for lying because it was easier than admitting I cared about her in a way that made me feel like a disloyal piece of shit to my dead wife's memory. Bo stepped in front of the truck and tapped the hood. Come look! I climbed out of the truck, grabbed the tackle box from the passenger seat and the poles from the back, determined to enjoy the day like we'd come out to do. The rest could wait for a few hours. It had to. I needed a break. It's so pretty, Thea squealed, clapping her hands. Took stood at the bank, pointing at a patch of sunlight, ice crystals floating in the air around it like suspended, blinking diamonds. They're called dust diamonds, Took said with a crooked smile. We only get them a couple times a year when the weather clears up. It's one of Jade's favorite things. I've never actually seen them before, I admitted. My mom used to tell me stories about it, though. She said the ice danced to the silent song of sunlight. It does look like they're dancing, Thea said, voice radiating with awe. Is this what heaven looks like in the daytime? We hadn't talked about death much, even though it had surrounded us all winter. I didn't know what heaven looked like, or if it existed, but I agreed it would be a beautiful place if it did. I hope so. What do you think it looks like at nighttime? The light's silly, like Jade said. I smiled. How could I forget? Inhaling the sharp scent of ice and evergreen, I soaked in the snow-capped mountains that surrounded us and the crystalline sky that shimmered. We picked a good day to come, Bo said. We sure did, I said, content. Dell used the ice spud to measure the thickness, a few yards out on the lake. The sun had been shining longer and higher in the sky, but the world was taking its time to melt. But like every natural part of Alaska, it was hard to predict, and we had no idea what was already shifting under the frozen surface of the water. Some ice is thicker than others, you guys. Stay in the areas where Dell is putting the holes, okay? They nodded, and I pointed to a prickly, fallen tree angled half-frozen in the water, a perfect haven for bottom feeders and shadow dwellers. What about there, Del? Yeah, we'll get nibbles in the debris for sure, he called. It's just over five inches. It's safe, but be careful. He began to pick a fishing hole in the ice with a chisel. All right, you two, you heard him. I handed the kids their poles. Stay in these areas. 
The last thing I need is one of you falling in. Oh, man, Thea giggled. That would be so cold. Yeah, and L would kill me, I told her. So be careful. Where are the fishing jugs we carved last night? Took grumbled, searching through their toolbox. Bo opened our tackle box. Right here. Careful, so as not to hook himself, he handed Thea hers and studied his own. Alaskans have been carving their own jigs for thousands of years, I told them. You couldn't have a better teacher than Took, I'm sure. Thea looked up at me, blinking as she mouthed thousands with awe. Let me see your handiwork. I crouched down between them. To a fish, their jigs would look like a piece of driftwood, but they weren't bad for a nine- and six-year-old's first time. I didn't have fancy poles like you growing up, but that's another skill for another time. I grabbed a container of frozen guts to use as bait, while Took helped them attach their jigs to the fishing line. Some guts for you, I said, handing a frozen piece to Bo. And some guts for you. Thea's face crinkled with disgust, but she didn't hesitate to take it. It's not so bad when it's frozen, Bo told her. Okay now, shove them on your hook and we'll let it dangle in the hole just a little, so that other fish will think it's still alive. Thea pursed her lips as she struggled to bait her hook. It got stuck to her mitten, but she was determined to do it on her own. Ready, Dell said. Come pick your holes. Thea chose her hole first, and Took helped her drop her line. Dell helped Bo with his, and I grabbed a stick as thick as my finger from the bank and tied fishing line around it, making a rod of my own. What kind of fish are we getting? Bo asked. He stood there with his fishing pole in hand, waiting. Oh, well, Dell said. I don't know what we'll get. Could be grayling or whitefish. And if we're lucky, maybe even trout. That's my favorite, I told them. Don't all fish taste the same? Bo asked. They're all fish. Took chuckled to himself and straightened, stretching out his crooked old back. No, Dell said. They don't all taste the same. You'll see. I had a fish once, Thea said. Fuzz bucket ate it, though. What's a fuzz bucket? Took asked. A bigger fish? It's a cat, silly, Thea laughed. Oh, okay, he eyed her skeptically. I crouched down over my own hole and braced my stick over it, making sure the line went as far down as possible to float with the water, which I would check on later. Once the rods rested and carved out holes and the lines were set, Took, Dell, and I made camp on the bank. We unfolded chairs and built a fire to blazing, simple and quiet, just as I'd hoped it would be. Now what do we do? Thea plodded over, her braids hanging messily on each side of her face. I tugged her beanie down further over her pink ears. We keep warm and wait for the fish to come. But, she pursed her lips in disapproval. But that's boring. Chuckling, the guys and I looked at each other. That's fishing, Thea. It's a game of patience. Well, then this was a mistake. Bo muttered. Thea sucks at patience. I do not, she retorted. Do too. Shut up. Okay, you guys, I said. No bickering while fishing. It's one of two rules. What's the other? Bo asked. Safety, I told them. Well, it's his fault, she retorted, walking back out to her hole. I'm going to wait for my fish. Don't touch mine, Bo told her and followed after her. I have hot chocolate when you want some, I said. And snacks. Okay, they called. But I was officially an afterthought to them. Do they know a watched pot never boils? Took asked, shaking his head. They'll get it eventually, just like Jet did. Dell nodded with certainty. You'll see. At first, I thought it was beginner's luck, Took added. Suddenly, he was catching all the fish. He batted the notion away. I stopped fishing with him. Ouch, I chuckled. Jet had patience, Took. You're like Thea when it comes to fishing. I'm surprised you enjoy it. I don't. Just because I know how doesn't mean I like it. Dell threw his hands up with a chuckle. Then why do you do it all the time? Because you like it. I'm not sending you out here alone. 
Dell and Took bickered back and forth, half as bad as Thea and Bo, and I admired their relationship as much as I envied it. The more I watched them and heard their stories, the more I looked forward to having happy, memorable stories of my own one day. So, Al said you might leave soon. Dell poked the fire with a long stick. You still going to Whitehorse? I stared into the embers, uncertain how to answer. That was the plan. Was? Took raised his eyebrows, looking more perturbed than curious. Was, is, I'm not sure which. Dell leaned forward, resting his elbows on his knees. Pardon my prying, but seems like if you're uncertain, it might not be the right answer. Yeah, well, things are complicated. Dell and Took finished in unison. I'll keep saying the same thing, Took grumbled. Life is complicated. You still gotta make decisions. Do you want them to be good ones or bad ones? I'll tell you what the bad ones are. Please excuse my father-in-law. He thinks highly of his own opinion. Well, I'm not sorry, Took said tersely. In the grand scheme of things, it's really not that complicated. Do you want to be alone or be with people you care about? Trust me. Time flies and all that. I get what you're saying, Took, but... I glanced out at the ice and rose to my feet. Where are the kids? Probably just exploring, Took said. That's what I'd be doing. I walked out onto the ice, relieved to see their poles were there and they hadn't fallen in. I glanced around the frozen lake. They weren't out in the middle of the ice, which had been my fear. I headed toward the curve in the bank and was about to call for them, when I saw Thea sitting at the water's edge through a thicket. I prepared my scolding speech to give them for going off on their own when I saw something move in front of her. I took a few steps closer. My gaze latched onto a twig that spun around and around on the ice in front of her, moving at the same pace her finger twirled. I blinked, barely able to believe my own eyes, and couldn't open my mouth to say a single anything. Bo walked further out onto the ice with a much larger branch and stopped a few yards out. Try to roll this one back to you, he told her, gaze narrowed on the branch intently. It's the biggest one so far. Though I felt the need to caution them, I couldn't look away either. Thea could move things with her mind. Elle was right. It was all impossible. All of it was, and until yesterday, I would have thought Thea was crazy had I not seen it for myself. I held my breath as Thea squeezed her eyes shut, then blinked them open in concentration. The log at Bo's feet moved, only trembling at first, but as Thea continued to stare at it, it hedged and began to roll slowly toward her. You did it! Bo shouted, but his excitement was short-lived. When he noticed me watching him, he leapt into a run to get off the ice, and his foot went straight through. He screamed as he fell into the water. Bo! I shouted and took off running. Fuck! Thea screamed from the top of her lungs as she ran to where the water sloshed over the ice. Get back! I told her and fell to my knees when I reached the hole. I couldn't see him through the murky water. There was no flailing, and the horror he might not know how to swim eviscerated any shock immobilizing me. I jumped into the water after him. It was so intensely cold, it felt like I was surrounded by fire and a net of razor blades. I didn't see Bo at first, and panic was a blaring cry as I tried to focus in the icy water. My eyes burned, my fingers and legs were numb, but as the ice was chipped away from the surface, I could see more clearly. The white of Bo's jacket against the darkness floated like it was suspended in the air, and Bo wasn't moving. I pulled my body through the water without thought, clutching Bo's hand in mine as I forced my limbs to send me to the surface. Arms reached into the water next, helping me pull him to the top. Dell and Took lifted Bo out first, then their hands frantically grabbed at me as I used every ounce of willpower I had left to kick and pull myself out of the water. The hard ice felt like a miracle, almost warm against my freezing skin, and I peered around for Bo. Is he breathing? I cried as Took helped me onto my knees. Is he breathing? I shouted and scrambled over to the bank where Dell crouched over Bo's body. Dell. I pleaded, is he breathing? Thea cried behind me, screaming her brother's name. 
and all I could think was I'd been too stupid and slow to react. I should have gotten him off the ice. I should have jumped in faster. He's only in shock, I prayed, my voice frozen in my throat. Every ounce of training I'd had was like a rock sunk to the bottom of my gut. My head was empty, and the energy that was left drained from my body as hot tears streamed down my face. Finally, Bo doubled over, gasping for air as he choked up water. Oh, thank God, I breathed. Thank God. I held his forehead against mine and pulled him against me, trying to warm him. Are you okay? You scared the shit out of me. I, I think so, he chattered. Took held Thea in his arms, trying to console her as she cried. He's okay, Thea, I told her, but it was hard to believe myself. Here, Dell said, removing his coat. We've got to get you guys warmed up. I helped Bo to his feet, ignoring the ache in my body as I stood and lifted him in my arms to carry him toward our camp. Sit next to the fire, I told him, setting him down on one of the chairs. We'll get you something warm to wear, okay, bud? Bo nodded, shivering but alive, and okay. Del, get his clothes off, would you? I might have something in the truck we can use. What about you? Del said. You need dry clothes, too. Yeah, him first, though, I called over my shoulder. Dell murmured about wet socks and boots as I opened the truck for an extra jacket or flannel. Finding a towel and dirty thermal shirt, I grabbed them and shut the door. This is all I could find. I stopped at the front of the truck, my body ice cold while fear burned red and hot straight through me. A black wolf crept out of the woods, furtively glancing around at us as it timidly made its way toward Bo. Slowly, Dell stepped toward the gun propped against a spruce a few feet away. He looked at me, and as crazy as it was, I shook my head. The wolf stopped at Bo's feet and licked his shaking hand with a whine. On trembling legs, Bo climbed out of the chair and plopped down on the ground beside the fire. The wolf waited for him to settle in, half naked by the flames, and it laid against Bo's little body to keep him warm. It chose him, Took whispered, pulling me out of my trance. What? I shivered, but as my body numbed, I wasn't sure if it was from cold or sheer awe. Dell lifted the discarded jacket off the ground. It looks like the kid's got it covered. You're the one we have to worry about now. 54. L. April 15th. Now, we let the fat boil, and the rendered tallow that comes to the top will become our wax once it hardens, Jade explained. We can get a dozen candles out of this batch, and all the membrane and meat that's left will freeze for Coda's food during the winter. It's as easy as that? I stared at the empty mason jars on the table and the thin wooden wicks piled beside them. It's messy, but yes, it's fairly straightforward. Coda barked outside as the truck and snowmobiles rumbled closer. They're back early, Jade mused. Wiping our hands off on our aprons, we headed for the front door. The instant I saw Bo was in the truck bed, wearing clothes that were too big and hair stuck in a frozen mess, I knew something was wrong. I stepped off the porch as Jackson climbed out of the passenger side of the Tacoma, his clothes stuck to him and covered with frost. What? I'm fine, he said, pointing behind him. We need to get Bo inside. There was a frustration in his voice I wasn't sure was aimed at me, but I didn't argue. I hurried around the bed of the truck and nearly fell back. Oh my, oh my, I breathed, my hand clamping over my mouth. A black wolf lay beside Bo, its yellow eyes lifting as we gathered around, though it didn't lift its head or bare its teeth like I expected it to do. Bo quivered a little, draped in an oversized coat that shook around his shoulders, but his skin was pink and full of color. Jade gasped beside me, none of us moving. Jackson, I whispered, uncertain what to do. It's been keeping Bo warm since we pulled him out of the water, Dell explained as he shut the driver's side door of the truck. Time to go inside, bud. Jackson said, 
coming around to the tailgate. He nodded to Bo, as if they had an agreement. Bo nudged the wolf, and though it seemed inconvenienced having to move, it stood up and jumped out of the back of the truck. Bo scooted to the edge of the tailgate, held out his hand, and the wolf stepped closer for Bo to pet the top of its head. The wolf's eyes closed and its ears flattened, and for a few breaths, I watched as Bo and the wolf had a silent communication. Then the wolf's eyes darted around at us. It trotted past Coda's kennel and disappeared into the woods. I gathered Bo against me, ignoring the twinge in my side as I squeezed. Are you okay? He was warm, despite his hair frozen on end. I desperately wanted to lift him into my arms, but refrained. What happened? I pulled back, waiting for him to say something, but he only glanced at Jackson before sliding onto the ground. Jade reached out to offer Bo her hand. Let's get you all bundled up inside and warm, she said. Sophie and Alex ran over, Alex's eyes trained on the forest. What the hell was that? Sophie took Thea's hand in hers. Sounds like you had an interesting morning. Yeah, Thea murmured. It was really scary. Alex followed them inside, the air buzzing with questions and curiosities. But my mind was still reeling as I watched them disappear into the house. Although I could fill in some of the missing pieces, I wasn't sure how or why Jackson and Bo had fallen into the water, and the remnants of what happened. Thea's face still red from crying, and Bo and Jackson soaked to the bone. I couldn't help the uneasiness that settled in a little deeper. The door had barely closed when Del popped back out in a new jacket and settled his cap back on his head. We still have gear at the lake and a snowmobile. We'll be back. As Dell closed the Tacoma door, I sidled up to the window, glancing between him and Took, though both of them tried to avoid my gaze. What happened? My voice was surprisingly calm, and I peered past them, at Jackson, heading to the smaller cabin. Is Jackson all right? Physically, they're both fine. Dell's choice of words didn't put me much at ease. Took nodded in Jackson's direction offering me a silent nudge. Then the truck rumbled to life and Dell rolled up the window. And as quickly as they had driven into camp, they followed their tracks back out again and disappeared through the trees. I considered going inside to check on Bo, but there were enough people fussing over him, so I headed toward the cabin. My heartbeat thudded like a bass drum, and I braced myself for whatever might transpire between Jackson and me when I stepped inside. He probably didn't want to see me, but I cared too much to let him be. I creaked the door open. Jackson stood half-clothed in wet pants beside the wood stove. He shivered as he stared at the wall, eyes frozen to his mustache and hardened to his pants. I didn't bombard him with questions I knew he wasn't ready to answer, so I grabbed a folded quilt from the bed and shook it out. Standing on tiptoes, I tried to drape it over his bare shoulders, struggling as my side twinged. Jackson reached out for the blanket, pulling it around him haphazardly. He didn't look at me, though, just stared at the fireplace, lost, in shock, maybe even angry still. Take your pants off, I whispered, and went over to his bag for a pair of sweats and wool socks. You need to get out of those clothes. I placed them on the bed next to a thermal shirt for him to change into and opened the wood stove to build a fire. My hands moved quickly. Splinters and scratches weren't something I had to worry about, though my gloves were plenty scarred and discolored from so much use. Shoving tinder beneath the crossed wood, I lit it with a match and breathed life to the burgeoning flames. Eventually, Jackson dressed behind me, unhurried and wordless. One boot scuffed the floor then another as he took them off. The floorboards creaked under his weight, and then heavy, soggy clothes thudded to the floor. I rubbed my gloved hands together against the growing warmth, acutely aware of the irony as I tried to keep my mind from wandering. The fire may have sizzled in my veins, but the flush of my skin seemed to deepen, 
as I realized this was the first time Jackson and I had been alone in so long I couldn't remember. It felt different than before, charged from the turbulence of the days past and uncharted. Once he finished changing and the flames were roaring, I closed the stove door and looked back at him. Though Jackson stood tall and his presence often filled the room, he seemed different. An emotion I hadn't seen before eclipsed his hazel eyes. Instead of haunted by the past, he looked dazed and uncertain. I stood and stepped toward him. Are you okay? Hesitantly, I rested my hand on his arm, offering whatever reassurance I could. Jackson's eyebrows drew together, almost painfully, and his gaze drifted to my hand. I was about to remove it when he took my wrist, stared at my glove, then began to pull it off. No! I tried to tug away, but he whispered my name, and I stilled. With bated breath, I stared into his eyes. He was completely still, determined. Slowly, he inched the glove from my fingers. The air was cool against my skin as the glove dropped to the floor, and my eyes fluttered closed at the relief I felt. I took them off sometimes, but only when I dared to chance the outcome and was alone. Jackson placed my hand against his chest, and my eyes fluttered open. His chest was solid and cold, and I could feel the rhythmic thud of his heart against my palm. Ba-bum, ba-bum, ba-bum. His eyes closed, and he spread his freezing palm over mine. I could feel the cold waning from his fingers as the heat from my hand seeped into him. Jackson calmed me in a way I never understood, and in a frizzen of desire and curiosity, I pressed my fingertips more firmly against his chest, letting a flood of heat fill us both. I wasn't afraid, but content. What's happening to us? He whispered, lifting my hand from his chest. He stared down at it, lost in wonder. Any uneasiness from before was gone. I don't know. My voice was quiet, but seemed to echo in the room. I've been trying to figure that out myself. Jackson blinked at me, his lashes wet but no longer icy, and water dripped from his beard onto my boot. I didn't know if he would be okay, he finally said, his voice thin. Bo? He'll be fine, I told him. He had a wolf blanket to keep him warm. I lifted my shoulder with a slight smile, like it was just an ordinary day. Jackson's brow puckered again, and he let go of my hand. Thea moved a log with her mind, he said. My eyes widened. That was a new one I hadn't heard yet, and I couldn't help but smile. Really? He nodded slowly, and his frown deepened. When they caught me watching, Bo ran for the bank, and the ice broke under him. And let me guess, you jumped in after him, I said knowingly. That's what Jackson did. He saved people, even if he didn't realize it. All of us were proof of that. I guess all of our secrets are out now. What's yours? He shook his head. I have no idea. I don't think I have one. Thoughtful quietness surrounded us, broken only by the crackling wood and a sigh as Jackson sat down in the chair. What now? He asked. He picked my glove up from the floor and handed it to me. Well, I'll get a towel for your defrosted hair for starters. I teased. I grabbed a towel from the clean stack by the door. And we need to talk. All of us. I handed him a worn, brown towel, fraying on the ends. I'll give you some space. I turned to leave, and Jackson reached for my hand again. Oh? Yes? His eyes sought mine, and he squeezed my hand, rubbing his thumb over my wrist. Thank you. My chest warmed, and I exhaled a shaky breath of relief. 
It was a look of forgiveness and gratitude, and I couldn't have asked for anything more. 55. Sophie. April 15th. Where are my pants? Thea groaned, glancing around the room with her hands on her hips. Here. I pulled them out from under my sweatshirt on the floor. Clean socks are in your bag. Privacy was something you sort of forfeited when you lived with so many people, especially since being safe meant sticking together. That's why the girls dressed first. Then we switched with the boys. It was our current routine, though revisions tended to happen quickly as our location changed. As an only child, I'd always had privacy. Well, not where my mom was concerned. She hovered, making sure I did my homework and showered, like I needed reminding, and did my leg stretches that hadn't been necessary for eight years. She didn't want all of our hard work and the physical therapy she'd paid for to get my weak legs in tip-top shape to go to waste. Part of me wondered if that's why it was so hard to lose her. My mom had been a nagging reminder of everything I needed to do, hadn't done, and would one day become. Without her, I wasn't sure who I was. I'd spent my teen years pushing back, trying to prove I wasn't a baby girl anymore and would never be her perfect Sophie. Not having her around made me feel like I was just sort of lost. When I first started seeing and feeling other people's memories, I thought it was just my mind breaking down and my weakness showing through. And that was the hardest part to imagine. I'd always felt like the weak link, and now, when I needed to be strong to survive, it wasn't just my bones I had to worry about anymore. It was my mind, too. If I'd had Elle's power, I wouldn't have to worry about shrinking away at someone's touch or going out of my way to avoid them. Ready! Thea chirped. Switch! I called, and Elle creaked the door open to find the three guys sitting on the step, patiently waiting. Done! Thea sang. Alex looked at his imaginary watch as he stood up. You almost beat your record. Ah, see, Thea? I nudged her. We are getting faster. Being around Thea and Bo was easier, and I wasn't sure why, exactly, only that their memories didn't seep into me, wringing me out from the inside. I had a feeling it had to do with their resilient ability to keep moving forward and not overthink and hold on to things. Alex sidestepped me as us girls filed out the door. He grinned, of course, because that's what Alex did. He acted like life was what it was and you had to roll with the punches. Inside, though, he was all about survival. Each day was about proving his worth, and that meant being the person he thought we all wanted him to be and hiding from his past. Being with all of us had given him a purpose for the first time in his life, but now I could learn things he didn't want me to. So he kept his distance, and things were different between us. Already seeing so much about him, I anticipated that would be his reaction when he learned what I could do, and it's part of why I kept my silence for as long as I could. A logical person would understand why he was wary, and of course I did, but the distance still stung. I wasn't just a random person he wanted to keep secrets from. I was supposed to be his friend. More than that, in some ways, after all we'd been through. We'd had a connection since the day we met, and suddenly, none of it mattered. I had become something else to him. No longer just Sophie, but dangerous Sophie. You better hurry, Thea sang through the door. If we beat you, you're making us breakfast tomorrow. I'm already making you breakfast tomorrow, Alex called back. Besides, Bo griped, that wasn't part of the bet. I leaned against the porch post and stared up at the sky. The night was cold, the air crisp. A few clouds dappled the inky blue, moving quickly across the moon. Jade, Took, and Dell asked very few questions. 
though all of them had seen enough to know we were different than they were. They didn't know about my touch, but I'd been careful to keep my distance as much as possible. It felt wrong to touch them, to see their private lives, especially since what happened with Jet. I couldn't control the things I saw, at least not yet, and I didn't want to trespass more than I already had. I thought maybe it was the memories closest to the surface that I felt most, but without practicing, I couldn't be sure. And if I was honest, I didn't want to have to hold any more fear or pain. My mind was already chock full, and it was difficult to ignore. So I kept my hands to myself as much as I could. The coast is clear, Alex said, opening the door. And we made excellent time. I don't know, Thea drawled, and she pointed at Bo, who was still pulling his shirt down. He's not even ready. Yeah, huh Bo said. Nuh-uh. How about we call it a tie tonight, guys? Elle prompted. We're all tired and we can start again tomorrow. Jackson closed the door to the wood stove, still in his sweats from earlier. He'd been shaken up after what happened at the lake, but it was nice to see he was finally coming around. A little worse for wear. Bo was the one who fell in, and he was unfazed, maybe even relieved to show everyone he was right about the wolves. Of course, Bo could talk to wolves, Thea could move things with her mind, and Elle could kill a man with a single touch, while I carried the burden of it all. Me, the weak one, as if it was my own. I fleetingly wondered if my mom would be proud. Everyone grab a seat, Jackson said. Thea and I crawled up onto the bed, where Bo already sat, fluffing his pillow. Alex took his cot under the window. Before everyone goes to sleep, El started, standing at the foot of the bed. We need to talk about all the new things that are happening. She met Jackson's gaze as he laid the pallet of sleeping bags out on the floor. We never talked about what I did to that man in Slana, she said. Bo stiffened beside me, which was strange, but then he'd watched El fry a man, which wasn't something I liked to relive either. You did it to protect us, Bo said. You had to. Yes, I did it to protect us. But we all know that killing isn't okay, right? I know I wasn't there, Alex said, elbows resting on his knees. But what are you worried about? That we're scared of you or that we think it's okay to kill people? Both, I guess. We've seen a lot of death and we've been very afraid. Of the bad people, Bo said. Yes, there are bad people, and the things we can do now can hurt people. So we have to be careful, because there are good people too, like the Ranskins. We can't walk around pretending we know what we're doing and how to control it, especially around Jade, Took, and Dell, because they might get hurt. Do you agree? I nodded with the kids. Even if my ability couldn't physically hurt them, the emotional scars people carried were their own to bear, and I had no business intruding. Elle looked at Bo. Are there any other animals or capabilities you've discovered we should know about? He shook his head. Just the wolves. But Bo didn't seem certain, something we all seemed to pick up on. Elle tilted her head. There's nothing else, Bo? What about you, Thea? We won't be angry. We want to help each other. Bo looked at his sister, his chest rising and falling more quickly. Thea stared at him, and I could practically feel their worry buzzing in the air between them. I heard you can do something pretty dang cool, Thea. You can tell us, I said, and ran my fingers through Thea's brown hair. In an instant, Bo was standing over Thea's bed, his pajamas wrinkled, but his coat was on. Get up, come on, we have to go. She climbed out, head fuzzy and skin still hot with fever. But Thea did what her big brother commanded. Mom says the bad guys are coming, he told her and took her hand in his. I blinked, the memory shifting in a flash. Frigid, howling wind whipped through a dark hallway, 
the way only lit by Bo's flashlight as he hurried ahead. Debris littered the ground, crumbled concrete and copper piping. His hand was in his mother's. It was Katie, my teacher, alive. Her blonde hair was disheveled, her pajamas soiled. Mama, what's wrong with you? Where are we going? Bo hurried obediently beside her, trying to match her pace. Shut up and hurry, she told him. We have to hurry. Graffiti covered the cement wall, and I could almost feel the coldness of the wind against my skin. Katie glanced back. Her brown eyes were bloodshot, and sores dotted the corners of her mouth. They're coming, she warned, panic in her voice. The bad men are coming. Thea moved as fast as her little legs would carry her, petrified of the bad men coming, but it wasn't fast enough. Hurry, Katie shouted, reaching back with spindly fingers, nails bit to the quick. Thea whimpered, her head a throbbing mess of hazy confusion and fear. Katie grabbed hold of Thea's arm, tugging her forward. I said they're coming, she muttered. The bad men are coming. Thea stiffened against her mother's touch, and Katie tugged her harder and more ferociously. You're hurting her, Bo cried, tears in his eyes. Mama, you're hurting Thea. Stop being a little brat, Katie shouted, dragging Thea up the flight of stairs as Thea kicked and pulled to get away. Bo shouted and pulled at her to let go of his sister, but Katie shoved him into the wall, oblivious as he fell to the ground. Stop it, Katie screeched at Thea. Stop it, we're almost there. No! The more Thea struggled against her, trying to pry her mother's fingers from her wrist, the more terrified and obstinate Thea became. The haziness began to vanish from her mind. Thea's panic was like a shockwave coursing through me. It wasn't Mrs. Gunderson snarling at them. It wasn't even their mom. She was a woman so sick, I prayed the inevitable end would come already. They were in a room. Thea stood shaking in a doorway as her mother demanded them to jump. It's the only way, she said. It will be like flying. She peered out the broken window. Come, Bo. Katie tried to grab him, but he stepped away. No, he shouted at her, no longer sobbing with fear, but determined to protect his sister. Come on, Thea, he said, choking in a breath. Thea shook with cold as he reached for her, the chill seeping through the floor and into her boots, chasing away the final remnants of the fever. Get back here, Katie shouted, and she grabbed onto Bo's hood and tugged him so hard he fell back and hit his head. Stop it, Thea shouted, eyes blurred with tears. The shock, the fever, all of it wearing off as she realized it wasn't her mother standing in front of her. Thea ran to Bo to help him up, but Katie reached for him first. Grabbing hold of Bo's jacket, she tugged him toward the window. If you won't jump, I'll push you out. And as Bo's pleas and Thea's screams commingled, I could feel the shift in the room. The air in Thea's lungs caught, and her thoughts hardened with resolve. Desperate to make her mother listen and disappear, Thea began to scream. She screamed so loudly, her mother's body lifted off the floor and was flying out the window before Thea even understood what was happening. Eyes blurred with tears, I blinked myself back to the cabin. It was warm, Bo and Thea were safe, and Elle was still talking as if only seconds had passed. Jackson said you moved a branch with your mind. Elle's voice was easy and open, even excited. Is there anything else you can do? I wiped the moisture from my eyes and forced myself to breathe, rooting myself back to the moment. That I'd felt anything from Thea at all was new, but that she and Bo had been carrying their mother's final hours around like a buried secret was indescribable. Um, well... Thea looked at Bo for approval. He shrugged, and Thea licked her lips glancing furtively around the room. I can do things like this, she said, making a piece of firewood tremble in the basket. Elle and Alex's eyes widened. Sometimes I can move things, 
but only when I'm really scared or thinking really, really hard. She fidgeted with her fingers in her lap, eyes darting around at everyone. You mean, you could have been doing my chores this whole time? Alex teased. Thea looked at Beau again, waiting for him to say something. But he just stared down at his hands, disappearing inside himself before my eyes. You don't have to be afraid, I told Thea, barely able to get the words out. We all love you, both of you, and we know you're good. You'd never do anything bad you didn't have to do. A tear escaped my lashes, and I wiped it hastily away. Elle studied me, brow furrowed. You can tell them, I urged them both. Bo looked at me, understanding widening his eyes. I nodded for him to take the leap. I'm right here. I forced a reassuring smile and rubbed his shoulder, pushing the flicker of emotion I felt away with all my might. I needed to be here with them in this moment. Thea licked her lips and took a deep breath. One time, Thea said with a ragged breath, I saved Bo from the bad lady. Her eyes shimmered. I thought it was a bad dream, she added. But as she sat there, really thinking about it, I saw the realization dawn in her brown eyes. Even though she understood the fever and had understood what happened to her mom, the weight of what she'd done finally began to settle over her. Then, her chin trembled, and she began to cry. Hating my power and every horrible thing that came with it, I wrapped my arms around Thea and pulled her closer, trying to ignore anything she'd unwittingly let me see. It's okay, I whispered, squeezing my eyes shut. I wanted her to feel my love, so she could feel something good and true. It was an accident, Bo bleated beside us. She didn't mean to do it. When I opened my eyes, his face was red with tears, and he balled the blanket up in his hand. Hey, kid, Jackson said, crossing the room. Whatever it is, it's okay. He took Bo's hand in his, so tiny in comparison, and rubbed Bo's shoulder as he sniffled back tears. We aren't mad at you or Thea. As I wiped the tears from my eyes, Alex looked at me, his own glistening in the firelight. The day he found Bo and Thea, Alex had told me about their mom's body and about their strange silence and secrecy. I knew Katie had lost her mind. I just didn't realize. I hadn't thought. Elle looked at me, distraught and lost, but I couldn't bring myself to say the words aloud. I was losing count of how many times it felt like my heart had broken, but it cracked and everything strong inside of me poured out. Half sitting on the bed, Jackson wrapped his arms around Bo and let him cry into his chest. She was sick, Bo explained through choked sobs. Understanding widened Elle's eyes and she covered her mouth with her hand. Everyone had thought she'd killed herself in front of her children, but the truth was far worse, and whatever was happening to us, this was only the beginning. 56. Jackson. April 16th. It was past midnight when the kids finally zonked out. Elle and I sat on the floor against the wall in companionable silence. I leaned back, my arms draped over my knees, completely spent of every possible emotion as a result of the past few hours. Grief and exhaustion, anger, fear and uncertainty, love and understanding. More than anything, I was brokenhearted for Thea and Bo. I hadn't seen that coming, I whispered, my voice hoarse. Me either. Snot and tears stained both of our shirts, and I had to chuckle to myself. Four months ago, I hadn't expected to be taking care of kids, let alone to feel so endeared to them. Now, I wouldn't have it any other way. I looked at Elle. Her cheeks were rosy from the heat of the room, and her hair was in a disheveled ponytail that hung messily around her ears. She crossed her legs out in front of her and sighed. 
She was barefoot and wearing a t-shirt and sweats. I could imagine her at home this way. Hair must, eyes gleaming in the flickering light. She'd spent the past months working her fingers to the bone, chopping firewood, insulating bedrooms, and lugging around 30-liter jugs of drinking water. But like this, still and thoughtful beside me, there was a softness about her I'd rarely seen before. It made me want to touch her skin, but I looked away instead. They need to practice what they can do, I said. All of them. They need to know how to use their capabilities and how to control them. We all do. She looked at me. Even you. I mean, there has to be something, Jackson. You can't be the only one without a power. My power is that I worry, I told her. I have the ulcer to prove it. She nudged me and heaved out a breath. For the first time in months, I felt like I could let my mind rest for a little while. Like there wasn't something looming overhead. And I closed my eyes and let the feeling sink in. I worry too, Elle whispered. Sophie told me something once, right before the accident. She said there are good guys and bad guys. Always, I breathed, letting my eyes flutter closed. We know some survivors are homicidal, out there sniffing the air for their next victim. My eyes popped open, remembering what she'd told me about the man in Slana. But, she said, if we are the good guys, how are we going to protect each other from the bad ones? Other than practicing what you all can do, the five of you would be a force to reckon with, especially if Alex can draw powers from all of you. The bad guys wouldn't stand a chance. Jackson, I'm serious. So am I. Elle dropped her head in her hands and groaned. Sometimes I'm so scared. All of us were scared all the time, but it was the first time I'd heard Elle say it out loud. She looked at me, lips pursed as she inhaled a deep breath. What if there are bad guys in Hartley? You could decide not to go, I told her, tired of fighting every part of me that wanted to make all of this work. We could come up with a different plan, together. I half expected her to smile with relief, but instead she frowned. What about, you know, she hesitated. Your dad and... I leaned my head back against the wall. You were right. This is bigger than us. I don't want to dwell in the past anymore. I want to do something that feels right for a change. And whatever all of this is, it feels like this is it. Maybe this is the family I was meant to have. The words were toxic, and I cleared my throat. I hadn't meant to say that, and it felt wrong. But even as my eyes blurred, it also felt true. I think Hannah would want me to do this. Elle's eyes lingered on me for a few seconds. Then she looked at the kids, still sleeping in their beds. She remained quiet, which I appreciated. I was confused enough without her questions. The kids' chests rose and fell slowly, sounds of their soft breaths filling the small room. I wish I could sleep like that, Elle said, smiling contentedly at the kids. They're down for the count. Are you still having trouble sleeping? I asked. There had been so much moving and commotion since we arrived, I wasn't sure. Yes, a little. But it's not like it was before. What do you mean? She shrugged. I used to see things and have lucid dreams where my stepfather stood at my bed. I hated thinking about him, remembering. She blinked and shook her head. It's not like that anymore. My mind just won't shut off. Lack of sleep is definitely catching up with me, though. She said with a yawn. It was difficult to picture a frightened Elle lying in her bed, and yet I wanted to comfort her all the same. I just wasn't sure how, or that she even needed me to. It's times like this I wish I still had a camera, she mused, staring at Alex. His face was smushed against his pillow, his mouth agape. Incriminating evidence is fun. Climbing to my feet, I hauled myself over to my scavenging bag that hung on the wall of hooks and coats. In all the craziness, I'd forgotten about the camera. As quietly as I could, I pulled it out of my bag with one hand and grabbed the box of film. And then I shoved the dark chocolate Milky Way into my sweats pocket. I have no idea if this is any good, I said, 
turning around. I held out my hands as I took a few steps closer. But I thought you might be able to use it. With another yawn, Elle looked at me. Her green eyes grew big and round. What the hell? A wide, toothy grin like I'd never seen consumed her face. No way. She climbed to her feet, practically stumbling in excitement. And it's analog? She practically giggled as she took it greedily. I grinned as she turned into a giddy schoolgirl before my eyes. I figured digital was pointless, but we'll have to figure out how to develop the film. Elle turned the camera over in her hands, analyzing every number and every button. This is a great camera. Yeah, ten years ago. No, still, she insisted. And the film will be easy to figure out. She sighed, her smile still pinned from ear to ear. I just, I can't believe you got me a camera. That you even thought of it. I might not have been sober all the time, but I was listening. I pulled the Milky Way from my pocket. No way, she chirped and covered her mouth immediately, glancing back at the kids. It's been months since I've had one of these. I'd never heard Elle laugh with pure joy, an excited to the core laugh, and it made me happy. She stepped closer and leaned forward. My heartbeat skipped and my chest warmed as she pressed her lips to my cheek. Resting her warm palm on the side of my face, she whispered, Thank you. I closed my eyes, soaking her in. 57. Jackson, April 16th. Sitting in the chair beside the stove, I pulled my boots on by firelight. Like clockwork, I woke up with the sun. Spring made for longer days, which I was accustomed to when I was working. Spring also meant warmth and a break from the snow, so I welcomed it. I peered down at Elle, curled up on the pallet, a canteen and her pistol beside her pillow as she slept. Unlike the rest of the clan wrapped in blankets, she wore a t-shirt and shorts, her blankets wrapped around her feet. As if she could feel my gaze on her, she stirred in her sleep, turning onto her back and folding her arms over her face. I smiled. Her gloves were still off. Maybe she finally trusted herself the way I trusted her, even if I knew what she could do was dangerous. Schlepping into my jacket, I grabbed my rifle leaning against the door frame. I reached for the door to head out for my pre-dawn perimeter check when a groggy voice reached my ears. Jackson? I turned around. Bo sat up in bed, hair tousled as he rubbed his eyes. Can I go with you? Relieved he wasn't shying away after all that had happened last night, I nodded and pressed my fingers to my lips. Quietly and carefully, Bo climbed out of bed, glancing at his sister and at Sophie, wrapped in blankets beside him. Neither of the girls stirred. Content to spend the morning with Bo after such a tumultuous 24 hours, I stepped outside to wait for him. The morning air was perfect, a refreshing jolt after a night of gut-wrenching revelations. I knew Bo and Thea weren't going to be okay, not deep down, after something like that. But at the same time, I didn't know how to help them. The door cracked open behind me, and Bo stepped outside, the floorboards creaking on the porch as he zipped up his jacket, his beanie in hand. You couldn't sleep? I whispered as I closed the door quietly behind him. Not really, he said, but it wasn't with sadness. Scanning the gray morning, he stepped off the porch into the snow and tugged his beanie over his head. Ah, I see. I lifted an eyebrow, staring down at him. Too excited about your new friends? Bo shrugged like he didn't care, but I knew better than that. You can be happy about your power, Bo. I realized that it might feel wrong to find joy in one's own ability if everyone else was scared of what they could do. You just have to be smart and careful, I added. He blinked up at me eyes cloudy with sleep. Then he nodded. I glanced at the main cabin. A small swirl of smoke was coming from the chimney, but no lights flickered inside. Like the rest of the Ranskins, Coda was still sleeping in his doghouse. It looks like it's just you and me out here this morning. Bo grabbed hold of my arm and shook his head. Wait. He pointed to the north end of the property. At first, I saw nothing but morning shadows. Then a gray wolf stepped out, stretching with a yip. 
like it had just woken up. Next, a white and tan wolf came into view. I had to fight back the urge to be afraid, instinctually, at least. They were large and powerful, with jaws of steel and a ferocity to match when it suited them, especially when they were together. But they were awesome, too, majestic and otherworldly in so many ways. I swallowed thickly. Do they sleep here every night? They hunt at night, he said matter-of-factly. I knew wolves were nocturnal, but that wasn't exactly what I meant. Where is their home? Shrugging, he started walking toward them. They live here. I didn't know if they were the same wolves from Slana, but I had a sneaking suspicion they were. Have they always been here? The gray one, whose tail wagged more vigorously the closer we drew, darted into the trees. No, Bo said over his shoulder. As he started walking faster, I could barely hear him through the sound of my boots crunching in the snow. The white and tan wolf darted into the trees next, and Bo ran in after them. Bo, I said carefully, I think you should come back toward the house. I was all for him practicing his communication with the wolves, but I wasn't sure about disappearing into the woods with them. I gripped my gun tighter. Bo! Come on! He called. You can say hi to all of them. The ever-present disquiet I had that always kept me on edge dimmed a little, and I knew Bo was right. I could say hi to a wild wolf because he said I could, and they were his friends. Instinctively, I knew it was safe, even if I questioned my sanity deciding to do so. Bo's white jacket flashed against the trees as the sunlight filtered through their leafless boughs. My stride quickened, my heart racing as my body warmed. Where the hell are you taking me? I muttered, but Bo was too far ahead to answer. There were so many questions, like why wolves, and why had his power taken so long to fully manifest? How the hell did the virus make any of this possible? Wings fluttered in the trees above, and my heart raced until finally Bo slowed. How do you communicate with them? I asked, inhaling the dark woods around us. I know what they're thinking, Bo explained, staring down at the wolf tracks. I see it in pictures, and I can feel if they are scared or happy. The gray and tan wolves trotted further ahead. I stepped over a log, waiting for the hair on the back of my neck to rise. I couldn't believe the words on the tip of my tongue, but I said them all the same. So what are the wolves thinking? Feel free to leave out the gruesome details. It was only a joke, but part of me wondered what exactly Bo saw when he talked to them. I heard a few yips in the distance, and my gaze flicked forward. They just want to play, he explained. They think I'm one of them. And you know they don't want to hurt you. You can sense that? I wanted him to be absolutely certain. Bo laughed at me. <laughs> yeah, I'm certain. I mean, they get scared sometimes, but then they don't come around. I told them you wouldn't hurt them, though. Well, that's good, I mumbled. There are eight. Taiga and Luna and their six kids. Eight, I breathed. That's a big number. Under different circumstances, we could have been marching to a feeding frenzy for all I knew. Taiga, like the snow forest where they live, is the dad. Luna is the mom. Her favorite part of the night is when there's a full moon. They already had names. Of course they did. Have you been sneaking out to play with them since Slana, Bo? He stopped ahead of me clearly guilty, as he hesitated to answer. Only a couple times. I didn't want to get in trouble, and they were still scared of me a little, I think. I see, I said with a huff. My nose was cold from the brisk morning, and my skin was dampening with sweat. Bo, on the other hand, seemed completely unfazed by our morning excursion. Bo bit the side of his mouth, waiting for me to say something, but I nodded him forward. Lead the way, I told him. There was no one doing the past. A small smile grew in place of his uncertainty. We are already here. He led me to a cluster of boulders on the side of the mountain, covered with snow. Four wolves lounged together on the rocks. Two others ran up to Bo. I stopped where I stood a few yards away, watching Bo interact with a pack of wolves with bated breath. All of them came out to greet him. Tails wagged. They sniffed and nuzzled him. They yipped happily as he ruffled their fur and patted their heads. The biggest smile I'd ever seen engulfed Bo's face. 
This is Rocky, he said, glancing over at me. He petted the chocolate-colored wolf's head, and it licked his glove in return. He likes to lie on the rocks in the sun. He's the youngest. Rocky, huh? I crouched down, watching from the sidelines as he laughed with true happiness I'd never heard in him before. Come on, you can pet him, Bo said, leading Rocky over. Bo grabbed my hand for Rocky to sniff it. He likes attention the most. I waited for the ominous warning inside me to blare back to life like it did so frequently. But still, nothing came. I had no apprehension whatsoever, just like when I was around Elle, knowing what a simple touch from her could do. Unable to resist, I pulled off my glove and reached out to the wolf. His mane was soft but thick, and Rocky's eyes met mine, softly blinking as he succumbed to all the attention. He likes your beard, Bo said. It makes you less strange than the others. I chuckled, uncertain how to take that other than hairy beasts liked hairy beasts, I supposed. The other wolves sauntered over, less quick to welcome me than Rocky, but equally curious. The knot in my stomach never returned as eight wild wolves sniffed me and licked my clothes like I was nothing more than another friend. As Bo and I played with them, I realized maybe there was something different about me. And there had been, all along. 58. L. April 16th. Aurora Borealis broke through the clouds as I made my way to the fire pit. The others were still getting dressed for a night under the stars, but I was content in my jeans and long sleeves. Fleetingly, I wondered if that's how it would be for the rest of my life, always warm or overheating, and what summers would be like. Miserable? Either way, Jackson was right. The more we practiced, the more control we would have and the more we'd know. Even if I feared I'd hurt someone, it didn't mean I couldn't practice on my own. Instead of trying to deny my ability, like I had for nearly five months, I was sort of excited to embrace it. Knowing I wasn't the only one now made it less intimidating somehow. When I came to the fire pit, I glanced around to see if anyone else was headed over yet. The Ranskins didn't know openly that we were different, but between my argument with Jackson for all to hear and what had happened with Bo, they had to have some inkling that we weren't a typical family. Satisfied that only Coda rustled over by the main house, I knelt down by the logs of the unlit fire. My rib was on the mend, but it still hurt like a bitch. Part of me wondered if it would hurt even more if I didn't have the insane amount of energy I had coursing through me all the time. Since Slana, the burn had been slowly building up again, and it was time to see if I couldn't let some of that pent-up energy out in a new way. With another quick glance around the property, I reached out to touch one of the logs, disappointed when nothing happened. I wasn't entirely surprised, though. Jackson had let me touch him with my bare hands, and nothing had happened. While I now understood his keen sense of impending danger, I thought he was a real daredevil before. Why would an inanimate log provoke anything different? Feeling even sillier, I leaned closer and tried to blow the fire to a start. Nothing happened. Shutting my eyes, I reluctantly thought about what had happened in Slana. I remembered the fear that had me running up the stairs toward the sound of the kids screaming. I felt the clawing desire to kill and protect, and imagining the intruder looming over them with menace in his eyes had my blood burning hotter. Fear, I realized. It was the rising fear and desperation that stoked the fire inside. I just had to harness it. I tried to light the fire again, latching onto the fear and the dread that resurfaced, and the burn shifted inside of me, blooming in my chest and heating the tips of my fingers. The fire still didn't start. However, something was happening in the blood that ran through my muscles and limbs. Do you need a fire starter? I jumped and turned around at the sound of Jade's voice coming up behind me. She was wrapped in a wool shawl, her eyes sparkling from the dancing lights above. Oh, uh, yeah, I said dumbly, and I sat back into an empty chair. Trying to start it yourself? 
She lifted an amused brow and settled into the seat a couple of chairs down. She blew on her hot mug and glanced at me over the brim. I, I, I stammered. Yes, actually, it was a relief to say. I took a deep breath and held up my palms. I know that sounds crazy, and I'm sure... Crazier than a wild wolf crawling into a little boy's lap to keep him warm? Crazier than Sophie telling me she loved the moon drawing I gave my son three years ago because she forgot she'd only seen it in a memory? I swallowed thickly. I thought I was crazy when that bag of oats fell over while Thea and I were on the other side of the room. Her proud smile was impossible to ignore, Jade explained. My cheeks burned red and it wasn't from my unnatural kind of heat. Jade looked at my hands. And you aren't wearing your gloves, she pointed out with a smile. I tilted my head, uncertain I could believe she was so content with it all. All of these unfathomable things are happening, and you aren't freaking out? Even in the slightest. It's unexpected. It's not every day a little girl can stir your gravy for you from the other side of the room while you finish folding the laundry. She winked. It started a bit messy, but we were practicing this afternoon. We weren't sure how you would take it, I admitted. I wanted to tell you sooner. I think we all did, but... When I was 11, Jade started, I woke with a horrible premonition that my mother would die. I remember having tears in my eyes the instant I opened them. It felt so real. I ran from my room and told my father I saw her drowning in the river, that she would fall through the ice and be swept away by the current, but he didn't believe me. I was a child who woke up from a nightmare in his eyes, no matter how desperate I was to stop her from leaving. But it wouldn't have made a difference anyway, because she'd already left with my uncle and grandfather. It was their annual fishing trip northwest, at a river that has claimed many lives. Jade's eyes were soft and somewhere far away. She never came back from the trip. My lips parted, caught somewhere between surprise and sadness. She drowned. Jade dipped her chin slowly and took another sip of her tea. I believe in things unseen, she said and there are many things still unknown about our spirit and purpose in this life. She paused, a thought lifting the corner of her mouth before she continued. I think we all have something inside of us we don't fully understand. It's always there, and sometimes it remains undiscovered. I don't know if it's the sickness you've all been through, or something more infinite than that, but perhaps, with everything you've been through, you found yours. All of you have. And that's something I think should be celebrated. Your purpose has always been there. Only now, it's known. I'd never considered there was an innate part of me that had been dormant and would still be that way if I hadn't visited the fiery depths of the sickness before I came out the other side. The human mind is so complex and still so unknown. I repeated the words Dr. Rothman had told me many times. So is the intricacy of all life in this place, no matter what you believe. I'm certain most would agree we know little in the great scheme of things. Jade peered up at the lights in the sky. Sometimes, a little something incredible is all we need to give us the boost we need to figure things out. Jet was up there in the rainbow of lights. So was Jade's mom. I'm sorry about what happened to her, I said. Your mother, I mean. I couldn't imagine losing my mother because she was never a part of my life. But I could imagine losing one of the kids and how devastated I would be. I figured multiplying that by a hundred wouldn't come close to the love between a mother and daughter. Thank you. But it was many years ago. I went to live with my grandmother, who was very old-fashioned, she said, pointing to the lined tattoos on her chin. As you can tell, I barely notice them anymore. 
They were a part of who she was. What do they mean, exactly? Maturity, she said. Womanhood. Achievements in my life. This one is Jet. She pointed to the middle line. This last one is Del. How fascinating, I thought aloud. Jade was such an interesting human. I wanted to cling to her like lichen on a rock and absorb all her knowledge and insights about life and people. Smiling, she nodded to the abandoned fire. Perhaps you need something to give you a little spark. Oh, right. I stared at the logs, untouched and lonely. Maybe, but I haven't needed one before. I took a match out of the camping box beside the fire and stared at the striking tip. I wasn't sure I wanted to attempt this with her sitting there, but I had little choice. Closing my eyes, I thought about the intruder's face again, saw the gauntness of it and the fever in his yellow-tinted eyes. I touched the tip of the match, barely pressing my fingertips against it, but intent on burning the image of his face away. At first, it felt like the typical tip of a match, until my fingers warmed and I felt heat against my face. I opened my eyes, watching the flame flicker on the end, burning slowly down the stick. I grinned, brimming with a sense of accomplishment, even if it was only just the start. The closer the flame moved toward my fingers, the more curious I became. The door to the small cabin opened across the yard, and I heard Bo and Thea bickering before they stepped outside. I tossed the match into the fire and quickly lit another one with a single touch. With a victorious smile, I reached out and watched the tinder catch flame. Thank you, I whispered, gaze flicking to Jade, like we had a secret. She smiled back and brought her mug to her lips. I held my bare hands to the fire, enjoying the growing warmth without my gloves to hinder the sensation. I thought using my fear and anger would make it work like before, I mused. I guess I was wrong. Memories of fear and anger aren't the same as the heat of the moment, she said, and I restrained from laughing at her choice of words. I guess that makes sense, at least for everyone but Sophie. Unfortunately, she couldn't escape it. Yaha, Bo said, trudging over from the cabin. Nuh-uh, Thea retorted, hustling to catch up. Her puffy jacket made her little arms bounce as she ran. Whatever. They already have names. You can't change them, Thea. And you can't name a boy Flower if he doesn't want that to be his name. A white and gray wolf with a black spot on the top of his head trotted over behind them. Thea took an empty seat by the fire and scratched the wolf's neck as he plopped down between her and Bo. Pretty flower, she cooed. You're so annoying, Bo grumbled. What is this one's name, Bo? I asked. I had already met Luna, the one who had kept him warm, but the rest were still new to me. Littlefoot, Bo said, pointing to his back leg. He was born with a smaller foot in the back, but he still runs faster than the rest. I reached beside Bo to Littlefoot at his side and offered him my hand. I probably smell like smoke, I realized. The wolf sniffed me, his cold nose brushing against my skin, and he lowered his head for me to pet him. Took and Dell came out of the main cabin next, thermoses in their hands. Did everyone bring their cups? Took asked and unscrewed the lid of his. Yes, Bo said, and Sophie straggled over behind them. I was glad to see she seemed to be doing better after last night. She'd been distraught for Bo and Thea, and rightly so, but she smiled now, even if it seemed faint with exhaustion. Took walked the circle of chairs, pouring each of us a full mug of hot cocoa. He was a man of tradition, like Jade, but he'd taken to nightly hot chocolate with the kids, nature walks with Thea, and carving with Bo. He'll be sad to see them go. Sophie muttered, like she could read my thoughts. Her eyes met mine as she sat down beside me, then shifted to Alex. 
Her expression was less easy with him again. I knew he was pulling away from her a bit since he'd learned about her power. I just hoped time was all he needed to accept it, for both of their sakes. Alex flashed everyone a smile as he sat down on the other side of me, between me and Jade. He snuggled down into his jacket and stared into the fire. Penny for your thoughts, I said. Alex's mouth lifted in the corner, and he yawned. I'm tired. Jackson and I were working on the trailer all afternoon. I think the axle's finally fixed, but my shoulder is shot. A wolf whined and his ears tilted back as Jackson strode up behind us. Hands in his pockets, he glanced around at all of us and took a seat in the empty chair across the fire. Where did you disappear to after dinner? Jade asked. Making the rounds? Jackson chuckled. Out of habit, yes, but I guess I don't need to anymore with these guys hanging around. Littlefoot trotted over as if he and Jackson were old friends, and Jackson patted him on the neck. And, he said, I've been thinking. Oh boy, Alex said playfully. Here we go. He leaned forward to warm his hands against the flames. Is it about you leaving? Sophie asked. I could hear the reluctance in her voice, and it made the anticipation all the greater. About all of us leaving. Together, actually. If you want. You're coming to Hartley? Alex straightened. I mean, that's awesome, but I thought you weren't feeling the whole community vibe. That depends, he said. What do you all want to do? I don't want to go to Hartley anymore, Bo said. You don't? I shot a look to Jackson. Why not, Bo? What about the wolves? He said. I can't leave them, and they can't live there. I hadn't considered the wolves in any of our plans. Are you sure they'll want to come with you? Yes, they do, and Hartley won't let me keep them, and they might try to hurt them. It's okay, kid. We'll figure it out, Jackson said. It's up to everyone else, too. He peered around at the others. What about the rest of you? His eyes landed on Sophie. What do you and El want? She asked, flicking her gaze at me. If I knew Sophie, she knew the answer before we did. I want to do what makes the most sense, I told her. I want us to be safe, and I want us all to agree if we can. We can't stay here forever. We need to find some place to call home. Not to speak out of turn, Took said, and we all looked at him. But you can stay here. We have land. We can build on it. Took, Del chided. What? It's true. We have the space. Of course you're welcome to stay, Jade said, gesturing to all of us. We would love to have you, but there is no obligation. I know you want to start new lives, and there's still a lot you don't understand. Maybe you can find the answers out there somewhere. It was a beautiful thought, staying with them and continuing to learn what they knew about the land. It would be much simpler than starting over and risking new places and people. What about your lodge, Jackson? Alex looked at him. What about Whitehorse? I half expected Jackson to shy away from the idea, given it meant so much to him and his wife, but he lifted his shoulder as if it was a possibility. We could do that, he said. Or at least check it out. I'll be meeting up with Ross there regardless, he said. I have to see him. I think, Sophie began, holding her mug tightly in her hand. I think we should at least visit Whitehorse, even if it's just a short trip to see what it's like. If we don't, she looked more pointedly at Jackson. We'll always wonder about it. And you have Ross to think about now, too. I thought of Jackson changing his plans for us, on top of foregoing Whitehorse, and having to worry about choosing between us and Ross, now that he knew he was alive. If you're already going to see Ross, Alex said, 
We can go with you and figure it out then. Jackson nodded, thoughtful as he picked at a loose string in his folding chair. We can always come back. And if we stay in Whitehorse, Sophie added, looking at Jade, we won't be as far from you as we would be in Hartley, so we can still visit. Jade's lips parted in a relieved smile. That would be wonderful. We could still go hunting with you guys each spring, Alex added. It could be like an annual thing. And either way, I said, winking at Bo, you can keep your wolves. Jackson glanced around the circle, meeting each pair of waiting eyes that blinked back at him. It's decided then. We plan for a trip to Whitehorse to check things out. He looked at me with a nod. I'll call Ross. 59. L. April 18th. It was twilight by the time we reached the Yukon. In the middle of nowhere, we didn't have to worry about cars abandoned on the highway or roadblocks to get around. All we had to worry about was snow and fuel, and we'd been lucky with both. We'd been on the road for nearly 10 hours and had stopped only three times between fuel refills and bathroom breaks. With six people in two vehicles, the Pathfinder Jackson found yesterday, following behind the Tacoma as it plowed the Harrier roads, we'd taken every safety precaution, from toe straps to toilet paper to extra snacks for the kids, just in case. We were cramped, but it was worth it. Whitehorse was a sprawling city, but it was the surrounding mountains we were heading toward. I was content leaving the city and the horrors that likely came with it behind and eagerly continued south. I knew Whitehorse was a place of deep-rooted, native culture, and I wondered how many other remote villages and homesteads in the area had missed the outbreak or even knew about it. L? Alex's voice came through the CB radio. Sophie clicked it on. This is Sophie. We're going to follow the Yukon River through the city, Jackson said on the other end. Keep to the highway. The fewer people that hear or see us coming, the better. Got it. We're looking for signs for Midnight Sun Lodge, and it should be about 10 or 15 minutes down the highway. Okay, we'll keep our eyes out. And L, Jackson hedged, his voice grave. Don't stop for anyone, okay? I glanced at Sophie, hating this part of traveling near cities. I won't. The radio went silent, and I glanced in the rearview mirror, glad to see the kids were asleep. I didn't want to have to worry about what might happen or what they might see along the way. At least we're almost there, Sophie said encouragingly. I could use a nice leg stretch. Tell me about it. My fingers are stuck like this. I smiled and held up my hands, fingers bent like claws. Sophie sighed and stared at the passing mountains beyond the window. What do you know about Jackson's friend? She asked, lifting her foot up onto the dash. I mean, other than they work together. I know nothing about Ross, I admitted, other than he's all Jackson has left from his life before, and he's important to him. Do you think we can trust him? I mean, he was gone all those months. He's got to have a power too, right? How do you even broach the topic to begin with? She muttered the last part. I don't know, but I trust Jackson, I told her, and his ability to sense things. Jackson had a natural gut instinct about things. It was something I could always rely on. Sophie looked at me. That doesn't mean we have to go in blind, she said. Although she was genuinely offering to use her power to learn his intentions, it would come at a cost. It always did. You don't have to do that every time, Sophie. She shrugged. I think I do now, Elle. It was a sad realization, and I hated that it fell on her shoulders. There has to be a way to control it better. In time. Now, Sophie was the one reassuring me. I smiled, grateful to have her with me in all of this. Team good guys, right? For sure, 
she said with a grin. We need to come up with a name, though. Something epic. We sat in silence for the rest of the drive, taking in the dark roads that were lit only by our headlights. The sky was clear, and the world had a moon glow about it, even if we couldn't stop to appreciate the stars. When the sign for Midnight Sun came into view, I glanced at Sophie. Wake the kids up, would you? I scanned the signs ahead. Sophie twisted in her seat, half leaning in the back as she shook Bo awake. We're almost there. I glanced in the rearview mirror, just as Thea stirred. We're here, Bo told her, and she gripped her stuffed duck closer and threatened to fall back to sleep. Wake up, Bo groused again, and her eyes blinked open languidly. I'm tired, she whined. You guys remember what we talked about, right? Bo met my gaze in the mirror. It was imperative they remembered. No talking about powers, he said. Or the wolves, Thea added sleepily. And, Sophie prompted, we stick together until we're comfortable around our new friends, right? Yes, they agreed in unison. If you see anything strange, I warned, tell one of us, okay? I followed Jackson down a muddy road and saw the lights on in the lodge before I could make out the building. They have power? Sophie asked. Or generators, maybe. That's awesome! She could barely contain her surprise. Or wasteful, but I kept that thought to myself. I didn't want to give the kids a bad taste in their mouths before we met up with everyone. I was just scared, and I needed to remind myself that not everyone was evil outside the six of us. Jade, Took, and Dell had proven that. When we got further down the drive, a Chevrolet truck with the plow on the front was parked behind the building. Jackson pulled off to the side, and I followed next to him. Though I was excited for Jackson, I was nervous about what the next 24 hours might bring. You are formidable. It was a necessary reminder. I wasn't helpless. I hadn't been for a long time, even if I was still getting used to the idea. I waited for the cue from Jackson, and when I got a thumbs up, I shut off the engine. All right. I pushed the driver's side door open. We're here, but remember the rules. The kids climbed out of the back seat. Put your jackets on, Sophie told them, stretching her legs. With the sun long set and the heat of the car escaping, it felt like the Arctic again. Carefully, I stretched out my neck, stiff from gripping both hands onto the steering wheel. I peered up at the lodge. It was huge compared to anywhere we'd stayed during the past five months. A log chalet with a wraparound porch surrounding it. Three chic cabins with angled roofs were snugly situated a few yards behind it. Land surrounded us, mountains and forests spreading as far as the eye could see, all of it glowing in the moonlight. Jackson and Alex stretched and groaned as they met us in the center of the driveway. It doesn't feel wrong, but it doesn't feel right either, Jackson said without ceremony. His gaze shifted between the lodge and us. I wondered how much of his reluctance had to do with his wife versus the people that waited inside. I guess we'll see, Sophie told him. That was the longest car ride ever, Thea groaned. Huh, Bo? But Bo was too busy peering around the property to answer. We were nestled in the forest. The wolves would have plenty of areas to hide. I leaned down and whispered in his ear. Are they here? He shook his head. Not yet, but soon, I think. Good. His connection to them increased daily, and I knew he wouldn't settle in until they were. I'd feel better once they arrived, too. Well, should we go look inside the house? Alex asked. The front door flung open as he took Thea's hand. Hot damn! A man's voice boomed in the crisp night air, and he stepped off the porch with his arms wide and welcoming. 
It's been too long. Brother, Jackson breathed, relief easing his shoulders a little. The two men embraced, and I took the infamous Ross in as they patted each other on the back. Ross wasn't as tall as Jackson, but he had broad shoulders and filled out his clothes just as well. He had shorter hair and a bit of scruff on his face, but more than anything, he was open and animated where Jackson was reserved. I thought your ass would never get here, Ross said with a final squeeze. You and me both. Jackson gestured to the five of us. Meet the gang. Gang, this is my best friend, Ross. Ross's smile widened, and he leaned forward, offering his hand to Thea first. Well, little lady, my name's Kyle Ross. You can call me, well, Kyle or Ross, I guess. I'm Thea, she said shyly, and this is my brother, Bo. She pointed to Bo, who eyed him carefully. Hey, little dude, nice to meet you. I'm not that little, Bo replied curtly, and Ross chuckled. No, I guess you're not, are you? He straightened and looked at Alex, offering him his hand. I'm Alex, he said with a quick shake. Nice grip, Ross said peering down at their clasped hands. Young and strong, I like it. He clapped Alex on the shoulder and looked at Sophie, next in line. Sophie, she said, reaching out her hand. Her lips were pursed and her expression pensive, though she forced a smile as he took her hand. Nice to meet you. It's good to see another ginger in the group, he said jokingly, and one even better looking than me. He winked at her with a chuckle. And you've got a firm grip, don't you? Jackson and I watched Sophie closely, the strain in the corner of her eyes giving her turmoil away. Her smile tightened, and she dropped his hand and took a step back. Sophie nodded reassuringly and wiped the moisture from her eyes. And you must be Elle. Ross stood in front of me. His eyes widened ever so slightly but I wasn't sure if it was out of surprise or if his ability allowed him to know what I could do. Yes, nice to meet you. I offered him my good hand and his grip was soft but strong. I could smell alcohol on him and I wondered if his smiles were covering what the alcohol couldn't. Jackson made it sound like he was palling around with a bunch of kids, he added in awe. You guys look like warriors. Sometimes, I joked glancing at Jackson. He eyed his friend with a waning smile. Well, Ross put his hands on his hips and scanned all six of us. Aren't you a big happy family? You always wanted one of those, eh, Jackson? He patted him on the back, and Jackson's easiness faltered. You have travel companions as well? I prompted, eager to change the subject. It was apparent Ross didn't realize how hard the past months had been for Jackson. Yep, that would be old Bert. He's passed out on the couch. He's a lush, just to forewarn you. Can you show us around the place? I asked, trying to move the conversation along. It was clear Jackson and Ross, no matter how close they had been, were uneasy in each other's company now, and the awkwardness made me restless. That way we can figure out sleeping arrangements and where to put our things. You bet. Ross turned toward the place. Jackson, you probably know this place better than I do, but I'll show you around. So, I said as we all trailed after him and Jackson into the lodge. What is the situation here? You have electricity? All the lights were on, though I didn't hear a generator anywhere inside. Yeah, for now. Isn't that great? You picked a primo spot, Jackson. Ross gestured to the large industrial kitchen as we stepped inside. It was updated and modern, with rustic chic everything. Exactly what I would expect to see in an upscale lodge for tourists. Don't mind the mess, he said, bypassing the dirtied kitchen. Some of us are still celebrating the fact we finally got here. He walked further into the house. Everything had clean lines, 
and welcoming warm tones with light wood and landscape photography lining the walls. It made me long to watch the sunset once the winter clouds were gone for good. We got a community space here, Ross said, waving away the drunk old man. All I could see was gray hair and maybe a mustache. Anyway, Ross continued, in there is another space. He pointed to a formal living room and a game room or den. There were large vertical windows everywhere, draped with moss-colored linen. The air was cool, but not freezing, which might have been my body temperature. There are three bathrooms and five bedrooms upstairs, and then there are a few cabins adjacent to this one. We made our way up the stairs. The loft area was an office, with a large, shaggy rug to cover the cold hard wood, and a minimally decorated but wide hallway shot off either end, one toward the master bedroom with two other rooms and a bath, and the other hall led to a final two narrow rooms and the last bath. There were bathrooms everywhere, and I longed for a steaming hot shower, despite my internal temperature. Do the bathrooms work? Sophie asked. They sure do. This place has all the fancy bells and whistles to protect the pipes and the well, at least for now. He shrugged. I haven't showered yet, but I use the hot water in the kitchen. Ross pointed to a closed bedroom door. I'm in one room down here, but the rest are open. It's bigger than I expected, I mused, staring up at the vaulted ceilings and down over the landing into the living room. Plus the detached buildings. Yep, it was a good call meeting here, Jackson, Ross said, but Jackson lingered in the doorway behind us, staring into a darkened room. Ross made his way downstairs again, but I exchanged a look with Sophie. It was their room, I assumed, the one he'd shared with his wife. I'd forgotten how difficult it must be for him to be there without her, and yet I imagined it might give him a sense of closure, too. Leaving Jackson to his thoughts, Sophie and I followed the kids back downstairs. Jackson had been doing so well, I selfishly hoped being here and seeing Ross wouldn't change the way things had been among all of us. Where's all of your luggage? Alex asked, poking his head back into the kitchen. Supplies and clothes and stuff? Ah, we've only unpacked what we've needed. Ross grabbed a beer bottle from the 12-pack on the counter. A tequila bottle sat beside it. He popped the cap off the bottle and slurped down a few glugs before he came up for breath, smiling. Can I get you all anything? We have beer, and there's canned food in the pantry if you're hungry. Why don't we check out the other cabins so we can get settled? Jackson said, coming back down the stairs. He nodded to the back door. The kids are exhausted. Ross's easiness wilted briefly, looked almost sad, but he nodded and held up his beer. Sounds good. Alex led the way, Bo at his side. Sophie and Thea followed behind him. There weren't any bodies when you got here? I asked him, suddenly worried what we might stumble upon. Nothing weird we should know about? Nothing weird. Ross shook his head. There were two women, there in the garage. I figured we could deal with that tomorrow. He tossed Jackson a ring of keys, hanging from a long line of hooks. You'll need these. The cabins are locked. Jackson nodded in thanks and followed me out the door, pulling it shut behind us. I want us all in the same room tonight, Jackson said. I eyed him, willing him to tell me what was going on in his head. Should I be worried? He hesitated to answer. I don't know, he said. It's a weird vibe, but nothing hair-raising. Ask Sophie. I know Ross is in bad shape. Drunk, which isn't like him. I could hear the concern in Jackson's voice. Four months ago, he would have been pulling the bottle out of my hand and telling me to keep my shit together. We've all changed since December, I reminded him. We don't know what happened to him in Fairbanks, or anywhere else he's been. Both of us glanced at Sophie, grabbing her bags out of the car. She 
was the only one who did. I peered at Ross, sitting inside at the table, hand on head as he rubbed it methodically and stared at his beer. He's right there, I whispered. Why don't you go ask him? Running his hand over his face, Jackson sighed. I just imagined this feeling different, he admitted, seeing him again. Maybe things will feel better in the morning, after you've both had a decent night's sleep. For Jackson's sake, I hoped I was right. 60. Jackson. April 18th. While Elle and the kids unpacked their things, Ross and I sat at the counter in a strangely awkward silence as the past and present settled between us. Or maybe it was a mixture of relief and fatigue. He took a swig of his beer, and I eyed the large, half-folded map with starred locations of northern Alaska next to him. None of the areas were part of his original plan, so I was curious. But then, my plans had skewed off course, too. What were you looking for? I asked, glancing at the map. Ross cleared his throat. Answers, he said, and took another swig. He offered me one, but I held up my hand. I'm good. At first, Ross shrugged like it was my loss. Then his eyes flashed with comprehension. You stayed dry. I wasn't sure if it was awe or surprise in his voice, but there was a difference between the two. Awe meant he commended me. Surprise meant he didn't think I was capable. He would have been right. No, I said, I didn't, but I need to be now. It's been a really long winter. I stared at a piece of scrap paper sitting on the countertop. The King Corporation. It sounded familiar, but I brushed it aside, more curious about the note written on it. Addresses throughout Fairbanks and the Tanana River. What are those places? Each of them but the last were hastily scribbled out. Ross's gray-blue eyes glazed over as he stared at it. All the places I went to check to find her. Did you? He nodded. I found her. It just took a while. Her mom was dead, but she wasn't there. Where the hell was she? She was parked at a bus station. It took me a few weeks to figure that out. He took a swig of his beer. I don't want to talk about depressing shit tonight, Jackson. He waved toward the cabins outside. Where'd you get all those kids, anyway? You and Elle? I waited for him to finish his sentence, but he looked at me, expectant. Me and Elle what? Popped out four kids in the past four months? I chuckled. No. He punched me in the shoulder and took another drink. Smart ass. I met them in Anchorage the day after you left. We were heading in the same direction, and... And now it's more than that, he finished for me. I shook my head and rubbed my eyes. Yes, it was more than that, and as simple as that, too. Are you sure you and your lady don't want to shack up in the house? Don't say it like that, I told him. Okay, fine. Would you and Elle like to have a room in the house? He said like a robot. The kids will be fine out there, if that's what you're worried about. It's not like that with her, I told him, and it was true. Whatever L and I were, it wasn't what he imagined. No shit? He asked, eyes like frisbees. What's wrong with you? Are you broken or something? No, I said, trying not to laugh. Don't be an asshole. Jackson, it's okay. My sister is dead. You're alive and a shot to my feet infuriated even if his words were true. Don't say it like that, I warned him. Ross rose to his feet just as quickly. Why? Because it hurts? Fuck yeah, man. All of this fucking sucks, but it is what it is. Hannah ain't coming back. Kelsey is not coming back. He heaved out a breath. <sighs> the sooner you come to terms with that, the better. Oh, like you have, I bit out glaring at the bottle in his shaking hand. When was the last time you were sober? Because you look like shit, brother. I've tried coping that way. It doesn't work. Trust me. I shook my head. Don't be a dick. Every hard line on Ross's face softened. 
and he sat back down, glugging what was left in his bottle. Ross wasn't ever much of a drinker. A few beers at a barbecue, maybe, but he never went for the hard stuff. He was also a compulsive neat freak, a soldier through and through, though by the looks of him, you'd never know it. I thought you said there are showers here. I leveled my eyes on him. Take one. As your friend and housemate, it's not a request. We weren't getting anywhere tonight. Not like this. I slid the stool in with my boot. I'm going to bed. I stared at the old guy, passed out on the couch in the game room. You good for anything, or did you bring dead weight? Ross glowered. He's not dead weight. Despite what he looks like, he's a brilliant old fart. He was an engineer in another life. Good. Now, go to bed, would you? We have a lot to talk about tomorrow. I turned for the door. Sweet dreams, princess, he grumbled. You too, buttercup. I flipped him off for the hell of it. See you in the AM. The instant I shut the door behind me, I felt better. I couldn't say if it was that niggling feeling that dissipated or just my concern for Ross. The cold air shook me awake as I walked toward the cabins. Peering into the darkness, I tried to remember the last time I looked at a watch. Daylight was all that mattered anymore. Time felt obsolete. With a final glance toward the house, I quietly opened the door into the narrow cottage. Candlelight flickered over the walls, casting familiar shadows. They'd pushed a queen bed against the wall to leave more room on the floor for two twin mattresses and a folding cot where Alex lay, already passed out. Bo was lying in his bed, eyes heavy as he blinked at me, and Thea and Sophie were on the other. And, like music to my ears, the water was running in the bathroom. Sophie looked up at me from combing Thea's hair. The boys brought in the mattresses from the next cabin, so no one would have to sleep on the floor. I noticed. I stepped inside. It was like Christmas had come early. Comfy beds and plumbing. You and Al get the bed, she said with a quirked brow. I'm fine on the mattress. You kids can have the bed. Al said the bed was fine. Yeah, well, Elle's having a euphoric shower right now. She wouldn't care about much of anything else, I'd imagine. Sophie laughed. True. I took off my coat and draped it on the edge of the bed. Are you okay? I'd been worried about her since her meet and greet with Ross. She nodded without bothering to look at me. Parts of his memory are blurry. He feels really lost. I didn't need her to fill in the rest. She didn't need to think about it any more than she already had before bed. No lights, huh? I asked, taking in the darkened room. Sophie shrugged. It feels weird sitting in the bright lights, she mused. It made sense after all this time, and I wasn't complaining. Bo's eyelids flitted open. Did your friends arrive? I asked him. His chin dipped slightly. Do you think they'll mind keeping an eye on things tonight? They will, he murmured, his lips barely moving. Thanks, bud. I pulled his sleeping bag up over his shoulders. A week ago, I might have slept with my gun, knowing eight wolves were outside the house. Tonight, I didn't feel like I needed it at all. I stopped at the vertical windows, peering out into the crystal clear night. It wasn't that I didn't trust Ross, but I wasn't sure I knew him anymore. He'd gone AWOL for months, and the unknown of where he'd gone and what he'd done worried me. The bathroom door opened, and Elle stepped out. Her silhouette flickered in the window's reflection. You're back, she said, quietly so not to wake the boys. I made the mistake of peering over my shoulder to answer, and my tongue lodged in my throat. Of course I'd noticed Elle was attractive. You had to be a corpse not to. But until now, she'd just been Elle. Well, mostly. The maternal and responsible one. She'd been the person who kept our lives running like a well-oiled machine most of the time. But standing there, with her hair long and dark over her shoulders, and the wet tips soaking into her strappy pink tank top, she was more than that. Her shirt clung to every curve of her chest, and I cleared my throat. Is everything okay? She wrapped her hair in a towel and glanced at me. Did you get a chance to talk to Ross? I shook my head. Yeah, he's, uh, he's fine. I told him to get some sleep. 
I plopped into a cushioned chair beside a corner desk and pulled off my boots. Good. She smiled with relief, and I forced myself to look away. Your bag's there, Sophie said with a grin. I didn't have to look at her. I could hear it in her voice. Thanks, I muttered and threw a dirty sock at her. I pulled my shirt over my head as Elle rifled through her back. I needed sleep. A lot of it. I was hoping there might be warm water left for me, I said, glancing at her. Of course. Let me get my things out of the shower. Elle disappeared into the candlelit bathroom, and I grabbed my back. You're acting like a gooper, Sophie said. I could feel the burn in my cheeks. I thought you were going to bed, I deadpanned, which only earned me a pleased smile. As prompted, Sophie and Thea crawled under their respective sleeping bags, both of them yawning. It's all yours, Elle whispered and stood at the edge of the queen bed, folding up her dirty clothes to put into our dirty bag. I walked past her, into the steamy bathroom. It was warm and muggy like a sauna. While the heat felt like a small miracle, I wasn't sure how Elle of all people could stand it. Here's a clean towel, she said. The bathroom was probably five by eight, but felt more like four by four as she leaned in and set it on the counter. I pulled out my razor, and Elle paused, appraising me in the mirror. Grooming, huh? I figured I could at least make my goatee look less like a beard. Elle chuckled softly and turned to leave. Enjoy your shower. I plan to, I told her as the door clicked shut behind her. I stared at my reflection, somewhat horrified. I wasn't sure of the last time I'd actually looked in anything other than a rearview mirror. My hair was shaggy and nearly to my shoulders, which is why it was always pulled back. My mustache was long enough to tickle my lip, and any remnants of a goatee were long gone. Yes, grooming and a hot shower were in order before my head hit the pillow. Sleep couldn't come fast enough, and yet I took my time in the bathroom, soaking under the water as I scrubbed the dirt from every muscle. I'd almost forgotten what it felt like to be really, truly clean. I let the water roll over me until it cooled, then climbed out to dress. The air was brisk but the tile was warm beneath my feet from the steamy room, and I towel-dried my hair, then brushed my teeth. Dressed and clean, I blew out the three-wick candle, halfway burned, and opened the bathroom door. A candle on the headboard was all that lit the room. Elle was curled up under the covers, facing the wall with only a sheet covering her. I smiled. She didn't have to pretend to be cold anymore. I padded around the bed, setting my dirty clothes and toiletries on top of my bag to deal with tomorrow. And with great anticipation, I pulled up the comforter and crawled in beneath it. All I could feel was Elle's warmth. It emanated off of her like she was made of the sun. And as much as I tried to ignore it, my instinct was to pull her close. It had been a while since I laid on a mattress or slept in an actual bed with a woman. My wife. The months she'd been gone felt more like eons, and yet, like it was only yesterday, too. I wondered if it would ever get easier imagining my life without her, or if I ever wanted it to. To my surprise, another question popped into my mind, too. What if I miss my second and last chance to truly live? Good night, Elle whispered. I stared at her back, at the damp hair that splayed against her pillow. Night, Elle. I blew out the candle and rolled to my other side, then tried and failed to fall asleep. 61. Sophie. April 19th. Adele. Journey. I was even guilty of listening to a little Bieber and One Direction from time to time, especially when my boyfriend Jess and I were fighting. I missed my stereo and social media, watching other people's ridiculous problems so I didn't have to think about my own. Now the world was small, even if it was bigger than before, more vast and unpredictable. Or maybe it had always been that way. Only now I lived in it and could actually feel it. There was a peace in the woods here, different from Jade's house. The lodge felt like a fresh canvas of white views and jagged peaks. A promise of something new, 
and sort of exciting, even if more housemates came with it. I peered up at the wraparound deck where Ross and Bert had been chatting over their morning coffee. I needed to get my power under control and figure out what exactly I'd found in Ross's head. He wasn't a bad guy, just very broken and even more lost. His mind was different, and I wasn't sure if it was part of his PTSD or because of something else. Even though I wanted to know, mostly, I didn't. I stopped at the crest of the hill and stared out at the pines and willows that jetted up toward the sky like fingertips trying to reach the sun. If I held my breath, I could almost hear the Yukon River flowing beyond them. If it hadn't been for my dream, I would have been able to enjoy it. I heard the crunch of Alex's steady footsteps. Is everything okay? I wanted to ask him the same question. He was the one who had been none too subtly avoiding me again. Yeah, I'm fine. Come on, he said. Tell me. I just woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Bad mattress? I shook my head. Bad dream. Intriguing. I glared at him. There were intruders and my legs were broken, I told him. It was a recurring dream I had growing up, worrying my legs wouldn't work properly. My mom drilling into me when I didn't keep up with my leg exercises, even when the doctor said I was fine, didn't help either. There had never been psychopathic villains in my dreams before, though. I couldn't stand or reach my gun in time, and they shot me. Not having a power that would help me save my life if I needed it was even more depressing. Geez, Soph, that's rough. What's your greatest fear, Alex? His eyebrow twitched and he tilted his head, like I'd asked him to commit a crime or something. Why, he asked warily. I mean, don't you already know? I shook my head, not because I didn't already have an idea, but because I wanted him to tell me something about himself. I don't know everything about you, Alex. I already told you that. He widened his stance and crossed his arms over his chest. I don't know, he said, tapping his chin. Theatrics, dramatics, jokes. It was always something with him. I try not to think about what scares me. That part was true. He shoved everything into a vault, pretending it wasn't there until the vault was overflowing. Mine is being weak, I admitted. Why, because of those stupid leg braces I saw in photos at your house in Whiteley? A lot of kids have those. It's not only that. It was a lot of things. My power, too. He threw up his arms. Why does that make you feel weak? Well, for starters, I hesitated shooting that guy in Slana. Oh, and my power is pretty useless. It's not like feeling someone's emotions sucks the life out of them. And that would be shitty if it did. I don't want to have to suffer in order to use my ability. Oh, wait, I already do, I uttered. Don't be like that, Soph. You'll get a handle on it. And once we're settled, we can start target practice again to make you feel more comfortable shooting. And I bet Ross knows some good moves, being in the army. Or Jackson. He was going to teach you self-defense at some point, right? I nodded. True. Okay. Look, he stepped in front of me. His eyes searched mine as he formulated a plan. I promise to help you once we get settled, okay? We can learn shit together. You already know how to fight, I told him. His openness immediately faltered, and I hated my mouth in that moment. More memories I had that he wanted to keep in the vault. No, I don't know how to fight. He exhaled and shook his head. He hated that part of him, the street kid who did what he had to, the kid who saw and did dark things to stay alive. He didn't understand how strong he was, but of course, I couldn't tell him how much I saw and how I felt about it. Well, you can't fight and I can't fight, so I guess we're even. 
I said more bubbly to break the stillness. You're right. We'll train together. The next guy who breaks in won't be so lucky. Good, he said. But for the first time, I wasn't sure what Alex was thinking when he looked at me. It looked like uncertainty and affection. But which kind of affection? Sisterly or something more? I wasn't certain of either. We'll work every day until you feel safe, with or without Jackson and Elle or anyone else's help for that matter. Somehow, even when I knew Alex was uncertain how to act around me, he could still be so genuine. Everything he ever told me, seriously told me, felt like a promise. His words always nestled their way into the cold spots in my bones and warmed me from the inside out. He stared at my biceps through my jacket. But we do have our work cut out for us, he teased. Hey, Alex, Jackson called from the deck. We both glanced back at him. Shit, I was supposed to get you and L. Alex looked at me. Jackson wants us to circle up so we can iron things out. Jackson stared down at us, frowning. It had been permanently etched in his brow since he'd woke up. Where's Elle? I'll get her, I offered. She's at the river taking photos. He glanced toward the water. Thanks. We'll meet up in the living room. I waved in answer, then headed down the trail toward the water. I'd come a long way from a 14-story building, and I tried to imagine what life would look like a few years from now. Would I be a badass? I sure as hell hoped so. Would Alex still be around? Or will he have completely pushed me away by then? God, I hoped not. I sighed and followed the muddy trail down to the water. Willows and scratchy, defrosting branches lined the path, and I tried to imagine how beautiful everything would be in full bloom during the spring. Elle, Jackson wants to meet. I heard a rustle in the bushes and followed the bend in the path a bit farther as I rounded a boulder. I gasped when I saw a mass of black and froze. My heart thudded and I was about to scream. Then everything went black. 62, Jackson, April 19th. I paced the window, waiting for Elle and Sophie to come up the trail. I'd had a bad feeling since I woke up and now wasn't the time to worry about taking pictures. Where the hell are they? I glared at Alex. It's been almost an hour. Alex set the maps in his lap on the coffee table and walked over to the window. You know as much as me. Sophie said she would get out. He scanned the tree line, like I hadn't done it a hundred times already. I'd finally gotten drunken Bird off the couch long enough to get some coffee in him. Ross was up and showered. Hell, the kids were easier to wrangle than the rest of the lot. Apprehension mounting, I headed out the back door onto the deck. Elle! Sophie! I hurried down the steps and stopped on the crest of the hill. Let's wrap it up! But a sickening feeling settled inside of me when they didn't answer. Elle! Resting my hand on my Glock, I marched through the yard, past the fire pit, and down the path. Elle! I shouted, but it was fear lacing my voice, not anger. The sickening feeling coiled, alive in my chest as I ran the length of the trail. My heart raced as I thought of everything that could have happened. Bears, a lunatic, that they'd fallen in the Yukon and gotten swept away. I stopped at the end of the path, at the muddy bank of the water. I looked upstream and then down. The water drifted, but not strong enough yet to carry them away. Sophie! My boot slipped in the mud, and I caught myself on the trunk of a pine tree, staring down at boot prints on the bank different sizes overlapping each other, and I held my breath and stared. No, whatever this was, it wasn't happening. Muscles wound so tight it hurt to breathe. I crouched down with my gun clutched in one hand as I felt the mud with the other. Some prints had grip outsoles, which could be any tactical shoe, but they were too big to be Sophie and Elle's, and they were fresh, wet, and glistening in the sunlight. Fuck! I kicked brush and twigs out of the way, scouring the water's edge for more shoe prints, but there were none that I could find. There was nothing but a slight breeze and rippling water. 
I analyzed the branches, looking for some that were broken that would give me some sign. There was nothing. Fuck! I trampled through the trees, running my fingers through my hair. I needed to get a grip. I needed to calm down and think. What is it? Alex ran to a stop at the mouth of the trail. Elle's gone. I breathed, grabbing my hand. Elle and Sophie are gone. I hit my fist against a hapless tree trunk. Someone was here. We hadn't been in Whitehorse 12 hours, and my worst fears had already come true. Ross and Bert ran up behind Alex, and I spun around. The shoe prints were military grade, just like the shoes he was wearing. Grabbing Ross by his collar, I lifted him to his feet. Where are they? I roared. Fuck, Jackson, I don't know. His eyes were wide with surprise, his chest heaving, but not as much as mine was, with fear and pure rage. You've been acting weird since we got here. I know you know something. Tell me, or I swear. Jackson! Alex shouted. Calm down. We don't know it was him. He's been with us this whole time. Ross glanced at Alex, then back at me. Listen to the kid, Jackson. You're out of your damn mind if you think I was behind this. I let go of him, and Ross stumbled to the ground, trying to catch his balance. Jesus, Jackson. How did I go from your bro to being your number one suspect? You're the only one who knows we're here, I growled. He laughed, humorless and fuming. Are you shitting me, man? You drove a fucking caravan through an empty city last night. Everyone knows you're here. I took a step toward him. There are survivors, then? People who would hurt El and Sophie the first chance they got. I don't know, Jackson. I didn't exactly walk into town with an old drunk and knock on doors looking for psychopaths who were interested in post-apocalyptic Girl Scout cookies. I frowned. Look, Jackson, I know this looks bad and is the last thing you want to hear right now, but we know what sort of people are out there. Anyone could have taken them. My mind began to swirl, and I was in the hospital all over again, surrounded with the cold sweat of fear and desperation. Alex grabbed my arm, his eyes wild with the same desperation I felt. We have to find them. I nodded. Yes, we did. And Elle wasn't like Hannah. She wasn't helpless. Elle was strong, and she was fierce, and she would protect Sophie and herself. We just had to find them. I ran past Alex and Ross toward the house. Where are you going? Ross called and I heard the clomp of footsteps running up behind me. I needed Bo. I'm getting more help. 63. L. April 19th. My mind flicked on, like a switch turning on the light in a dark room, and I opened my eyes. I blinked as my vision adjusted to the darkness, sprinkled with filtered light from outside the room. I was confined, and the cement floor beneath me was cold as ice. I hadn't been cold in so long, it seeped its way into my body, riddling my bones. The sharp scent of metal and stale air filled my nostrils. A man sat on a chair outside the door, bathed in a halo of light that shone from the skylight above him. His face was cast in shadows, and my thoughts flashed to an unwanted, Familiar form standing beside my bed. A breath caught in my throat, and I tried to move back, to crawl as far away as I could, but my hands were tied behind me. I moved barely an inch before I slammed into a cold wall instead. Dr. John wasn't standing there, though. It was a trick of the mind, because he was dead. Wasn't he? Who are you? I ground out. My voice was a hollow sound that echoed in the sterile room surrounding me. An open door was all that separated me from him. Morning, sunshine, he said with easy amusement. My eyes opened wider, and I pursed my lips. It was a unique voice, a familiar voice I tried to place. Not Dr. John's, but it belonged to someone I knew. I searched the foggy depths of my mind for a memory. Then, the man from the river flashed to mind. I'd been crouched down, taking a picture of morning dew in a spider web, when I turned around and a man in a hood stood behind me, 
and just as suddenly, everything had gone black. My blood boiled, but not with the anger and rage and the fear I knew I could use to my advantage. But I couldn't feel the fire at all, and panic wound its way through my veins in its place. What do you want? I bit out, trying desperately to grasp hold of my vehemence rather than my fear. There was no telling what power he had or what he was capable of. Whatever it is, I just want to talk. And you had to kidnap me to do that? You couldn't simply ask? I spat, not buying a single word. Truly, no need to get angsty. There was an intrigued lilt to his words that worried me. Talk about what, I seethed, because this isn't a great way to make friends. He tossed his head back and chuckled. Good point. The man stood up, still covered in shadow, as he walked closer to my cell. His footsteps echoed against the concrete. You're right, though. I'm being rude. I'm very sorry about all this. Sorry for what? Abducting me? He laughed again. I guess that is what it looks like, doesn't it? He paced back and forth like a warden might do, but his steps were less rigid, even if his fatigues were standard issue. He clasped his hands behind his back and rocked on his feet a little. There was no doubt in my mind that he was crazy. These days, he said, contemplative, it's not exactly smart to assume good intentions, am I right? I'm not one of the bad guys, though, I promise. I tried to wiggle my wrists free of my bindings, what felt like cuffs and rope combined. Funny, that's what all the bad guys say. He shrugged. I have a couple questions, and then I'll let you go. It's that simple. Or... I might decide to lock you in here forever. I haven't decided yet. You mean, you'll let me go if you like my answers, I clarified. He wagged his finger at me as he stepped into the light. You're smart, and you've got some fire in you. He was a middle-aged man with crazy blonde hair and a beak-like nose. He had beady eyes, and a permanent smile parting his lips, exposing the gap between his straight white teeth. I like it. He nodded appreciatively. It means you're not easily swayed. I couldn't listen to his psychobabble much longer. The room felt like it was closing in on me, like this might be the last place I'd ever see. And if that was the case, I wouldn't go down without a fight. Jackson! I screamed. Help, Jackson, I'm in here! I waited for the fire in my blood to surge and swirl, but it never came. Jackson! It's okay. Scream. Go ahead. Get it out. He began to pace, like he expected it, and tears burned the backs of my eyes. Scream until your heart's content. No one can hear you. Bo, I'm in here! I tugged against my binding, squeezing my eyes shut. Bo! Maybe no person could hear me, but if the wolves could hear me, maybe Bo would too. I was probably underground in a bunker. I hit my fists on the floor, my chains clanking, and I shouted from the top of my lungs. The man turned on his heel to leave. When you're ready, let me know, and we can talk. I'll pop in and see your friend in the cell down the hall while you get the shouting and the screaming out of your system. He could only take one step before I screamed, wait! My heart lurched to a screeching halt. I could barely form the words. What, who, please don't hurt them. Uh, I didn't get a name before we snatched her, he mused, tapping his scruffy chin with his crooked index finger. She's younger about five foot six or so, with reddish blonde hair. Sophie, I breathed. Please, don't hurt her, she's just a kid. I won't hurt her unless I have to, he said so nonchalantly, I wanted to rip his head off. Fine, ask me then, whatever you want, 
Ask me and I'll tell you. I wanted him to forget Sophie was in the other room. I needed his attention on me while I figured out a plan. If I could lure him closer, maybe the fire would return. So, he said, pulling his chair from the shadow so he could sit closer to the doorway. I want to know why he sent you. His army fatigues were old and tattered. While I understood the words, I didn't understand the question. I blinked. What? The psychopath chuckled again, laughing at everything that didn't go exactly his way. I contemplated whether he'd been crazy before or if it was because of the outbreak. Either way, this kind of crazy was unpredictable, which meant there was a chance of getting out alive and a chance this cell might become my cement tomb. Look, I said, and spoke slowly and as carefully as I could. No one sent me. I was passing through Whitehorse with Sophie, and we'd stayed at an abandoned house by the river. That's all. Are you related? He asked, catching me off guard. You two don't really look related. Uh, no, we're not related. We're just family, I said, blinking back tears. Did any of your relatives survive? I hedged, wondering if this was a tangent I could take advantage of. Not that I'm aware of, he said easily. But then, he said more thoughtfully, crossing his arms over his chest. I've never really had any family, not for many years at least. I've been what most people would call a strange bird all my life. Very introverted, a little crazy, but all the best people are, am I right? He pointed at me, as if he expected me to laugh with him too. I tried to smile, to act like he didn't petrify me, but I couldn't manage it. Sophie's just a teenager. Please, let her go. He stared down at his hands as he made a show of thinking about it. But she's not just an ordinary teenager, is she? He peered up then, looking right into my eyes, past the shadows covering half my face, past whatever threat he saw in me. It wasn't really a question. He already knew way too much. My chest heaved and my chin trembled. Don't worry. I'm not like those kooks you've seen out there. I'm not after kids. I'm on the lookout for military folk, yellow bands and black bands. I hear they're out in force these days, and I, quite frankly, want to kill every last one of them. So he said, his easiness solidifying to something more terrifying. Are you here on his behalf, or do I need to kill you? Whose behalf? I whispered, knowing I would never get out of here if he thought I was part of some delusion. I don't know what bands you're talking about. I don't know who he is. The angles in his face sharpened. Whatever amusement he'd had was gone. He stood up and began pacing. Then, he turned and walked closer to my door again. I've been telling people for years the government would do this. They would unleash a superkiller that would take out the world. But in all fairness, I was wrong about one thing. The virus didn't take out the world, just 90% of human life. My breath caught in my throat. You're the voice from the radio. Oh, good! A grin engulfed his face, exposing the gap in his teeth again. You've heard the show. The name's Woody. I don't have much of an audience these days. He shrugged. But what are you gonna do? He lifted a shoulder, not expecting an answer, and leaned against the doorframe. I might have been wrong about the specifics, but I think I still earned that point, in my opinion at least. This was the government? I've known something was coming for years, Woody said, talking over me. Yet somehow, people are surprised. He chuckled to himself and shook his head. I tried to tell them. Doesn't it suck always being right? The more Woody paced, the more desperate I was to find the fire inside that had been gaining strength for months. Where was it when I needed it? 
Why wouldn't it come? I should probably tell you that your mutated capabilities won't affect me, he said. Or anyone in here, for that matter. What? I tried not to dwell on how many people he was referring to. How did you? I might be crazy, but I'm not stupid, he explained. I wasn't going to bring you down here just so you could kill me, silly. Woody grinned, amused by my confusion. But, all jokes aside, I will kill you if you don't tell me what you're doing here. I'm a fair man, but my patience tends to run out when I get bored. Probing to get the truth is fun, he mused, but a bit messy. I don't like to get my hands dirty if I don't have to. He tapped his chin with his index finger again. It's a quirk of mine, I guess. I've always had it. I told you, I shouted, done listening to him talk in circles. I hit my fists on the ground, regretting it instantly. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know about different colored bands or know anything about the government. I don't know anything. I waited for the pain to shoot through my side and chest from my cracked rib, but everything in my body felt funny. Everything felt wrong. The heat was gone. The fire and the hum inside me, all of it was numb. I let my head roll back and swallowed a whimper. What else do you want me to say? I croaked. I don't know anything. I don't know how the virus spread or what it even is. I don't even know what's wrong with me. I thought I was dead and then I woke up and now I'm not the same. Just let me see Sophie, please. Silent tears streamed down my cheeks, a cold sweat making me feel sick to my stomach, like the fever was coming on all over again. What do you think, Stanley? Is she telling the truth? Oh my God, I groaned. He was talking to himself now too. I lifted my head and saw another shadow drawing closer up the hall, footsteps barely echoing. I blinked, waited, held my breath. I imagined an executioner in blood-stained robes coming to take me to a chamber much worse than the one I was in. My eyes blurred as tears breached my lashes, and my throat burned. I only saw the tips of his pointed shoes before an unassuming man peeked his head into the doorway to look at me. Stanley wasn't a monster. He was thin and tall, with combed back hair and black-rimmed glasses. He wore a dark suit and yellow bow tie. I wasn't sure if his presence made me feel worse or better. He whispered something to Woody, but I couldn't make it out. You'll have to speak louder, Stanley. That's my bad ear. She's telling the truth, he murmured, glancing at me. He looked almost sympathetic. Stanley's words were like a warm blanket of hope. I wanted to reach out and hug him for saying such a glorious thing. Even if he was likely crazy, he was also my only hope. Does she know the general? Woody eyed me warily. Stanley shook his head. I, um, I don't think so. Woody sighed and crossed his hands over his chest. Do you know the General L? I gasped. How did he know my name? Tell the truth now. You're doing so well. I glanced between the two men, praying this wasn't a trick. I shook my head. No, I whispered. I don't know the general. Woody's eyes narrowed on me, and I could see the contours of his jaw flexing in the dim light. The seconds felt like minutes as he contemplated. Then suddenly, his brow lifted and he smiled, big and wide, and crazier than before. Well, why didn't you say so from the start? A door shut down the hall, and I realized Stanley was gone again. In that case, Woody said, walking into the doorway, his hands on his hips. Sorry for the inconvenience, Elle. You should have told me you were one of us. Wait, what? 
I stared at him, gaping. His behavior was worse than whiplash. It's all just a precaution. He waved my confusion away. You can't trust the government. You can't trust the general. They have spies everywhere. He was waiting for me to stand. Come on now, let's get you out of these silly bindings. I'll take you to your friend. My adrenaline rushed through me, making me almost dizzy. Whatever I'd woken up to, whatever fear I had for my life, was still hovering, and I wasn't sure I could trust him. He took a step closer, and I took a step back. You broadcast your show from a dungeon? And you're not military, I processed aloud, trying to put the pieces together. He chuckled. Not anymore. And it's not a dungeon. They don't make those anymore. I laughed this time, hysteria bubbling up inside me. I still wasn't convinced that he wasn't going to have another change of heart. Woody motioned for me to turn around, and he pulled a key out from his pocket. It couldn't have been that simple. He was crazy. He wouldn't just let me go. What's the catch? I took a step further back. You kidnap me, threaten me, and now you're just letting me go? No catch, but just remember, he said, reaching for my cuffs again. Your powers won't work here, not until you leave. What about Stanley? I said. His powers worked. Woody lifted a bushy blonde eyebrow and held the key just shy of my lock. Stanley is my friend. I allow his ability to work. I was too overwhelmed to process all that could mean, but my mind raced with the possibility of my overtaking him. I had fingernails. I had sheer desperation and willpower. Woody's smile faltered a little as he put the key in the lock. Don't try anything stupid either. He dipped his chin. Promise? I nodded, if a little hesitant. Promise. Good. Let's get you to your girl. The bindings clanked to the concrete, my hands feeling weightless without the heavy metal holding them down. I rubbed at the raw skin and took two steps back from Woody. He gestured out the cell door, but I didn't move. I'm not gonna bite. No, you were only going to probe me, I told him, skeptical. I pressed my palms to the cold cement wall behind me. Were you really going to probe me? I was unable to resist asking. I hoped he was just exceedingly convincing. Woody hooted, which wasn't entirely unexpected. He enjoyed all of this far too much. Does it matter? I don't need to now, do I? Definitely not. I shook my head and rubbed my arms, shivering. The adrenaline made it impossible to stop shaking. That or the cold I wasn't used to feeling. More than anything, I prayed Sophie was really here, wherever we were, and that Woody was taking me to her. I had no reason to trust him, but I also had little choice. Now, he said, gesturing toward the cell door again. There are a few things you should probably know. Shall we? 64. Sophie. April 19th. I stared down at the sterile white table, wondering where all the bodies in the prison had gone. The place didn't smell. In fact, it was strangely clean, like there'd been upkeep over all the months since the world stopped. And the electricity still worked here, just like at the lodge. I picked at the syrup-saturated fruit cup Phil had given me, then stared up at him. He stood guard beside me, tactical gear on, though it didn't look military, and he had a gun in his belt. He was young, like Alex and me, with chubby white cheeks and fluffy brown hair. He had a lot of freckles on his nose, like I did, and he definitely didn't look like a killer, but I knew better than anyone that looks were always deceiving. How old are you? I asked him, staring into his brown eyes. And what the hell are you doing at a place like this? Is Woody your crazy uncle or something? 
Phil's eyes shifted to mine, but he didn't answer. I'd been sitting in the room for so long with silent Phil to keep me company, all the heart-racing fear I'd had diminished more and more by the minute. They hadn't hurt me, and they'd given me water and food. I was antsy and annoyed more than anything, waiting for Elle, praying she was okay. Somehow, I knew she was. This place was strange. Everything felt huge and vacuous without people sitting at the white tables or standing in line at the food counter. I glanced up at the cameras mounted on the ceiling. I wasn't sure if they were from before or if someone was watching me. Maybe I wasn't overly worried because I knew if Woody tried anything with Elle, she'd fry his ass. But I wasn't sure it was that either. Phil didn't seem like a killer, not like the ones I'd seen so far anyway. Woody, on the other hand, was clearly crazy, though whether or not he was the dangerous kind, I hadn't decided yet. He promised I'd be fine if Elle gave him the info he needed about the general. But since we knew nothing, I wasn't sure how he'd react. My stomach turned as I considered just how much they could hurt us if they really wanted to. Because even if Alex and Jackson found us, it wasn't easy getting into a prison. In fact, they might die trying. I speared at a syrup-soaked grape. I'd felt strangely lighter since I'd woken up, too. I actually liked it, even if I didn't know why. Maybe that's why I wasn't worried. What is it you can do? I asked Phil, wondering if he'd engage if I just kept asking question after question. He might get tired of my voice and decide to give in. His eyes shifted to me again, but only for a second before he refocused on the bathroom sign located on the other side of the cafeteria. It doesn't hurt to talk, right? I mean, you guys can't get that many visitors around here. I stabbed at a diced peach, deciding I'd eat that at least. This place isn't exactly inviting, I muttered. And, I said, pointing to the hallway with my plastic fork. Who was the slinky guy walking down the hall earlier? The one with the bow tie? Phil remained silent. I mean, why was he so dressed up? Who does he have to dress nice for? Woody? I choked out a laugh. I had half a mind to reach out and touch Phil, just to see what I could find out. I could get the answers from you myself, you know. It was true. Even if what I could do wasn't exactly petrifying, it was enough to get his thoughts wandering a bit. Phil shifted his weight, finally looking at me. You mean, your ability? My eyebrows rose, nearly touching my hairline. My what? The powers. They're called abilities. Um, okay. I rolled my eyes. Why can't I call it what I want? I'm just saying that's what they're called. The fact that he was willing to argue with me was promising, so I egged him on. Says who? Stanley, he answered tersely. He knows everything about the virus. Everything? Phil nodded. He was with the general until the region rebellion. I didn't know what the hell a region was, but a rebellion sounded terrifying. I didn't realize there were enough of us left for there to be a rebellion, I mused. Wait, who's the general, first of all? It sounded like a crazy tale having to do with Woody's conspiracy radio broadcasts. But a part of me knew that if Elle could turn herself into a Lady Phoenix, and I could find out who Phil's best friend in the third grade was with a single touch, crazy, impossible, and unbelievable, were all relative now. The general created the virus. Forgetting his plans to ignore me, Phil sat down across from me at the table, making the whole thing shift and squeak and my fruit cup slosh around. Woody said Stanley was one of the general's most trusted truth guards, so he knew how to get out of the colony when the timing was right. Frowning, I leaned closer. And of all the places Stanley could have gone, he went to Woody? Phil nodded with too much excitement, and I began to think he really was insane. Rumor has it, he continued. Woody, 
was on the general's watch list of potential threats a decade ago. But the general thought he was too crazy to worry about, so he didn't bother silencing him. As in, murder him? I gulped, but I wasn't sure why I was surprised. He did kill nearly everyone in the world, on purpose, Phil deadpanned. Okay, so maybe Phil wasn't crazy, just naive? What's a truth guard, then? You said Stanley was a truth guard. A truth teller. The general's paranoid, so he surrounds himself with people whose abilities he can use to manipulate and control everyone. Some of his men were mind-controlled. And the others? My eyes were wide, and my mind swirled with far too many questions I feared to ask, yet felt I had to. It was a fascinating and horrifying tale that seemed fictional, but Phil's words were shaking with truth. He was either brainwashed, or he'd seen enough and heard enough to believe a power-hungry fanatic was trying to control the world, or what was left of it anyway. The others follow him willingly. He spat and pursed his lips. They help him because they believe in what he's doing. Or they're too scared not to, I thought aloud. If a lunatic with an arsenal of powers behind him wanted my help, and my only defense was a shotgun since my power couldn't help me, I might do the same. Where's the general now? I breathed, frightened to hear the answer. He has a colony in Colorado. I've heard the radio broadcast. They've been urging survivors to go there since December. But if the general caused the virus, then it can't be good. I shook my head. No, it can't. It was hard to imagine how all of what Phil was saying could have been going on while we'd been trying to survive the winter. I narrowed my eyes and glared at him, staring into his watchful brown eyes. It was probably all a ploy. Why are you telling me all of this? I'm, well... I tilted my head and crossed my arms. You're trying to distract me or put nonsense in my head. How do I know you're not the general? Phil's entire face changed and he stood up. My entire family is dead, he snapped. You think I wanted to watch my sister and mom die? He pointed out the door and let out a breath. At least you have her. His cheeks burned red and he shook his head. I shouldn't even be talking to you. Phil took his stance at the end of the table again and resumed his glare at the bathroom sign. I'm sorry, I whispered. I'd clearly hit a nerve. But you did kidnap us. So... His eyes shifted to me again, lingered. Then the double doors to the cafeteria creaked open as L and crazy-haired Woody walked in. Brimming with relief, I ran to L. apparently more worried Woody wouldn't keep his word than I thought. Soph, L breathed, cringing as I wrapped my arms around her. Her body was so cold through her long sleeves and pants. But she was okay, and Woody had kept his word. Are you all right? Did they hurt you? She glanced from me to Phil and then to Woody. No, they didn't hurt me. I took a step back and assessed her crooked ponytail and her red wrists. Gently, I grabbed her hand, feeling no spark at all when I touched her. The fire's gone she whispered, registering the confusion on my face. I nodded, staring at my hands and hers. I felt and saw nothing. Me too. Yeah, about those abilities, Woody said, sitting down at the cafeteria table. He took my fork and skewered the last two pieces of fruit into his mouth. There's a way to block them, but we won't go into that right now. He leaned his elbow on the tabletop and folded his hands in front of him. When you leave, they'll come back. Don't worry your pretty heads. I didn't bother mentioning it was actually a relief not to have mine. It was an incredible lightness I'd never appreciated before and hadn't been able to in months. Fine, now let us go. We answered your questions, Elle told him. We did what you needed. Our people are probably... Look, Woody said in all seriousness, 
I'm happy to let you both go on your merry little way. But I have a proposition for you first. 65, Jackson, April 19th. Three hours, 189 minutes was what it took to get gear, jump in the truck, and follow the wolves until they found Elle and Sophie's scent four miles upriver. We ditched the trucks on the side of the road, hoofing it behind the wolves as they scattered and sniffed, searching for whatever trace they could find that would take us to them. The closer to the city we drew, the more panicked I became. A boat! Alex shouted from ahead, and I ran through the trees toward him. They can't be far then, right? God, I hope not, I said, pivoting to search the mud for more tracks. Guys, they found something! Bo shouted. I nodded for Alex to follow Bo and the wolves as I holstered my gun in my waist strap and conducted a quick search of the boat. Other than an emergency kit strapped to the side, there was nothing that would help us. I glanced up barely able to see Alex's green jacket through the trees as he followed the wolves further and further away. I exchanged a look with Ross, who was still angry with me for accusing him of having a part in it, then jogged after Alex and Bo. I weaved through the willow trees with Ross at my side, grateful to have him there, despite my accusation. I told you, I'm sorry. It was a feeling. I've had it since I got here. I thought, you thought your best friend could do something like that. He bit out. Yeah, I got it. Over here, Bo shouted brusquely as he ran behind the wolves toward the road. There were tracks in the mud as we jogged through the trees. We didn't know where they led or where we would end up. We were losing daylight, so creating a solid plan would have to come later, once we knew what we were up against. Are you sure Thea's okay with Bert? It might have been my tenth time asking. I was losing count. Ross scanned the woods behind us for unwanted followers. She'll be fine. Now, do you want to worry about Bert and Thea or find Elle and Sophie? He ground out. As we broke through the trees at the highway, a rumble in the distance echoed through the still air. Hold up, I shouted, heart fumbling to a halt. Hurry, back into the forest. Everyone darted behind cover, but something urged me to stay at the edge of the road. Jackson! Ross called. Get your ass in here. I couldn't move. Deep down, I needed to stay put as a beat to shit, lifted Chevy Blazer with blackened windows slowed to almost stopping a few dozen yards away. I lifted my gun, hearing everyone behind me shift their own in their hands, followed by the sound of bullets sliding into their chambers. At least whoever was inside wouldn't be unscathed if they tried anything. The passenger door swung open, and two feet hit the ground, and a familiar strawberry blonde jumped out. Sophie! Bo shouted, her face lit up as she saw us, and she jogged over. I wasn't sure I believed what I was seeing, an unscathed Sophie. Then, Elle climbed out the back seat. She looked unscathed, and it made no sense. Apprehensive, I debated lowering my gun until Bo ran over to her, a pack of wolves trotting behind him. L pulled Bo into her arms, squeezing her eyes shut as she kissed the top of his head. It was definitely her, but how? It was too easy. Hell? I breathed. My feet moved of their own accord. Part of my brain told me it was a trap. She wasn't really there, or she was bait, while the other part had me pulling her into my arms before I knew what I was doing. What the hell? I'm okay, she whispered, warm and reel against me. I gripped her tighter. I'd been terrified of what might happen to her, but until that moment, I hadn't realized I thought I might never see her again, at least not alive. If I would have lost her, like I'd lost Hannah, I would never come back from it, especially if she never knew how I felt. I bowled my hands in her hair and lifted her face to mine. I'm okay, she repeated, cheeks red and eyes shimmering. He didn't? I pressed my lips to hers with bruising force, needing to show her, needing her to see what she was to me. An almost imperceptible sigh hummed through her, and I kissed her deeper. Gasping for breath, I rested my forehead to hers, eyes shut as I breathed her in, willing her warmth to consume me. She was more than my partner in all of this. I knew that now. When I opened my eyes, 
She was staring at me. She cupped my hand in hers and kissed the inside of my palm as she looked up at me. <laughs> well, what do you know? I didn't see that one coming. The man standing by the brown blazer chortled. My eyes shot to him. He had unruly blonde hair and an unnervingly wide smile. Then I glanced at the driver who aimed a rifle at me through the window. Don't worry, we come in peace. The man held up his hands in supplication, then pointed to the wolves. Who's the uh, animal whisperer? The kid? He shook his head and smiled with amusement. This just keeps getting better and better. He stared at Bo and the wolves fanned protectively around him, their teeth bared and hackles raised. I took a step forward and lifted my gun to aim directly for the man's head. Victory never felt so righteous as the amusement dulled from his face. Jackson, Elle pleaded, reaching for my arm. Stop, look at me, she demanded. What? I whipped around to glare at her. He took you both. My hands were shaking with rage. I searched for Sophie, relieved to find she was standing beside Alex, and Ross still aimed his rifle at the crazy-haired son of a bitch. I know, but it was a mistake, Elle said. This is Woody, and you need to hear what he has to say. 66. L. April 19th. We sat around the large table in the dining room at the lodge. Jackson eyed me cautiously, still blindsided by the past ten hours. So was I. Sophie, less so, as she sat by Alex, Bert, and Ross staring down the far end of the table at Phil and Woody. I kept asking myself what we'd gotten ourselves into coming to Whitehorse, wondering if it was better to know what they were telling us or to be blissfully ignorant. It wasn't like we didn't have enough to worry about already. But as I continued to absorb the information, as Woody retold it to the rest of them, I knew it was better to be prepared than completely unaware, like we had been in Slana. Three crazed survivors with powers was nothing compared to what else was out there. So, Ross said, taking a swig of his beer. Let me get this straight. He stared at Woody and Phil as they finished their bowls of soup, like they hadn't kidnapped us and just brought our oblivious sense of security crashing down on us. You're telling me that we're all alive because this genetically engineered virus was meant to kill off the weak and we're the strong? Ross leaned onto the kitchen table, hands clamped into fists in front of him, like he was trying to keep his shit together. Genetically speaking, Sophie said with disbelief. Isn't that ironic, she muttered. I knew her childhood was punctuated with doctor appointments and physical therapy, just like my entire adulthood had been one therapist after another, telling me I wasn't crazy or weak, though deep down I questioned it frequently. Yet here we were, part of the few among the living. Woody took a bite from his bread bowl and pointed to Ross. Yes, we are the strong. That's exactly what I'm saying. In fact, we're stronger than ever. That's the general's manifesto for crying out loud. Build a clean, stable, Crime-free civilization where the next evolution of mankind can thrive in peace. After he kills everyone else in the entire world, I clarified. Woody's hands flew up. Hey, I might be crazy, but I'm not insane. And trust me, there's a damn difference. This megalomaniac is the very definition of insanity. He shook his head. I've been telling people for years, he muttered. For the first time, I wondered how different the world might be now if more people had listened, instead of having followed the Pied Piper so blindly. So, why are you here? Jackson asked. What do you want from us in exchange for giving us this information? Woody nodded with a smile. No bullshit, I like you. He took a gulp of his beer and glanced around the table at all of us. Half of us were in shock, the others in disbelief. But all of us were smart enough to know nothing was predictable or safe anymore. The general has outposts everywhere, he said. 
They've been around for years. The virus was a long time coming. He didn't cook it up overnight. And a man like him is never done. My sources tell me he's still on a mission to take over and rebuild what's left to his satisfaction. And we sane survivors need to stick together. He has an entire army of people with abilities just like yours. Woody looked at Bo and Thea, then at Sophie and Alex. But his eyes settled on me. Jackson squeezed my hand under the table. His palm was hot, even against my skin. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just being real, and we need to be prepared. Inhaling deep to chase away the exhaustion and overwhelming uncertainty, I considered what might be next for us and let out a deep breath. What is it you want us to do, Woody? I met his gaze, unblinking. We're not soldiers. We can't fight him. And let's hope you'll never have to, he said, shaking his head. His crazy hair jostled. All I'm saying is keep your eyes open and your ear to the ground. Tell me if you see something. There are rumors his yellow bands have been in these parts. And I just ask that you share what you know with me, just like I'll share what I know with you. Jackson tilted his head, studying Woody, though I wasn't certain he was much closer to figuring anything out. It was weird. All of it was catastrophically Horribly impossible, and yet it was real. Just like the end of civilization, just like the end of anything normal. All of it was gone. Do you have a personal vendetta against this guy or something? Jackson finally asked. You should be shitting your pants if this man is as horrible as you say he is. Not plotting with a band of five misfit soldiers in your prison. With strong abilities he added. We're not helpless, and we gotta keep each other safe. And you knew we were here? The caravan was hard to miss, Phil grumbled, and Ross shot Jackson a satisfied look. And, Jackson continued, you kidnapped Elle and Sophie specifically. Why, because they are women? He laughed, full and throaty, and leaned back in his chair. Not at all. In fact, Elle's the strongest of all of you, he said, pointing to me. Trust me on that. I glanced at Jackson. Was I? Like I said, I heard a rumor a yellow band was here last week, one that fits Elle's description, he said. And I most definitely wasn't going to take any chances. I needed to get you away from everyone, figure you out. I'm a little nutty sometimes, but not stupid. I couldn't exactly interrogate you at the water's edge now, could I? If you were here on the general's behalf, I needed to get you alone. And Sophie here was just the bargaining chip I needed. With a straight face and no nonsense, Woody looked Jackson in the eye and said, I'm not looking for a fight with you guys or with General Harrodson, because I'm not suicidal but I wasn't born crazy, and that son of a bitch ain't ever getting his hands on me again. I can guarantee you that. It never hurts to be prepared, paranoid, whatever you want to call it. I was as ready as I could be for all of this, wasn't I? What about you? Ross asked Phil. Woody's got his reasons, but what's your story? Why are you following the crazy man blindly? Phil tilted his head, glaring at Ross defensively but his face softened when he looked at Sophie, and he heaved out a breath. I was in Whitehorse on vacation with my family when everything happened. Woody found me, fed me, took me in. Where do you call home? I asked softly. He was just a teenager. I hated to think of Alex or Sophie alone in this world. Florida. My eyes widened, imagining how lost and scared he must have felt. At least the rest of us were used to Alaska and were familiar with how harsh she could be. He, on the other hand. I eyed his empty bowl. Phil, would you like more soup? I can heat some up for you. Phil shook his head. No, thank you. That was damn good, though, Woody said, slurping what was left in his bowl. He looked between Sophie and me. Both of us deferred to Alex, 
still glaring at Woody with his arms crossed in the chair across the table. Woody lifted his torn roll in gratitude. It's delicious. Thanks. I started it this morning so it would be ready for lunch, he drawled. We never got that far. Thanks to you, went unsaid. With a chuckle, Woody tapped his index finger on the dark wood tabletop. Should I stop in around the same time next week for more? I love a good home-cooked meal. None of us bachelors cook all that much. What they say about Twinkies is true, you know. And MREs, I've learned to like them. The rest of us sat quietly as Woody sighed, full and content, and he rubbed his belly like he hadn't just dropped a life-threatening bomb on everyone. So, what are we supposed to do now? I needed big picture problems answered before I could handle any more small talk. You're holed up in a prison to await a war that might never come. We just want to be left alone and live our lives. Then you should do that, he said. I encourage it even. You stay off the grid and out of town, out here in the backcountry where no one knows where you are, and you stay here. But, Jackson said, we could all feel a warning coming. But that doesn't mean trouble won't find you, and you gotta be ready for that. That's all I'm saying. We build a fortress then. Bert spoke for the first time. The hard-set lines around his mouth were etched with more than a dusting of age. His expression was grim, just like his tone, and his eyes crinkled with decisiveness. He had been quiet since we'd returned, thoughtful or shocked. I wasn't sure which. Ross nodded. Something easy to protect. Spring and summer. It's the best time to get it done. What, like a castle with a drawbridge or something? Sophie asked. The thought of anything more than a simple home in the middle of the woods seemed impossible as my mind grew too full and heavy with things out of our control. Jackson untangled his fingers from mine and excused himself from the table. Without bothering to grab a jacket, he opened the sliding door and stepped out onto the deck. Part of me thought I should leave him alone with his thoughts, but that's not how I wanted to be with him anymore. After everything we'd been through, we were more than partners in this. We were in this together until the end. All of us were. Jackson was no longer alone, and he hadn't been for a long time. I scooted out of my chair and followed after him. Quietly, I slid the glass door closed, shutting the commotion inside behind me. The air was cold and refreshing now that the heat ran in my veins again, a slow, increasing burn since Woody, Sophie, Phil, and I had left the prison. We can't put Jade and Dell at risk, Jackson said, his voice a rumble in the still night. We can't go back, at least not to stay. I know, I whispered and stood beside him, shoulder to shoulder. Woody said Phil can sense abilities, so chances are the general will have someone who can too. Even if he's not out looking for survivors, we can't risk it. I rested my head on his bicep, winding my arms around his. All of us were science experiments, he said, disgusted. His chest lifted with a heavy sigh. Hopefully, they'll just leave us alone up here and forget about us. It was wishful thinking. We'd learned long ago that nothing was simple or came easily anymore. It didn't mean we couldn't hope, though. Jackson took my hand in his. The light from the house poured over him, and he turned to face me. Why don't we carve a place out here somewhere that's hidden and just ours? No one will care. Nothing's changed. Not really. There's a psychopath in Colorado. Well, we're more likely to die from one out here than ever meet the general. I nodded, because Jackson was right if the last four months were anything to go by. We live a life we want for as long as we can. We keep to ourselves. No one will find us. His hazel eyes searched mine, frantic. It was an urgency I'd only seen the instant I stepped out of the blazer. I thought you and Sophie were dead, he breathed. And Woody isn't even the craziest son of a bitch out here. I squeezed his fingers in mine. I know. 
Ross and Bert can set up their fortress if they want. And we can help each other, sure. But I don't want to be a hamster in a cage like the one we found in that pet store. I want us to live full lives, as much as we can. And if any of those Colorado fuckers come close, Alex can grab your hand and the two of you can fry the shit out of them. I laughed. Not because it was funny, but because it might actually be possible. And we were willing to do whatever it took to live a life away from all the craziness. It was what we'd all come to want. And for now, we could still have it. Okay, I said, knowing there was nothing better we could hope for. Jackson's cold hand cupped my face, his thumb brushing a rogue tear from my cheek. He waited for me to change my mind or protest, but I wouldn't. Let's do it, I breathed. I rose to my tiptoes and wrapped my arms around his neck. It was quite probable we wouldn't be able to avoid the general or people like him in the uncertain world we now lived in. But like the rest of the survivors, we had a whole new life to build and new discoveries to make about ourselves and those around us. I was more than okay with selfishly wanting my life with Jackson to begin, to see where our story would take us. His eyes glistened, searching my face and fire danced beneath the surface of my skin. Without another moment's hesitation, I pressed my lips to his, letting it consume us both. The End Thank you for listening. This has been The Darkest Winter. Written by Lindsay Pogue. Narrated by Sarah Ruth Thomas and Luis Bermudez. Produced by Stephen Carlock. For more Savage North Chronicles, visit lindsaypogue.com. Well, you reached the end of The Darkest Winter. I hope you enjoyed Elle and Jackson's adventure. And it doesn't stop there. There are six other books in this series, and Elle and Jackson are in all of them. And so is the rest of the crew. So I hope you are excited to get to know them better. Now, I suggest moving on to The Longest Night. It is shorter, but it packs a big punch, and it really focuses on how Alex and Sophie met before you dive into Midnight Sun. Okay? Be sure to look at the reading order below. That will help you navigate. There should be links to all of the audiobooks, as long as they're up at this point. And, yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you on the other side. Thank you for listening.